Chapter Twenty Five of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five Alien Stars Arise. In the summer of nineteen twenty one, I had signed a contract with the Kaizo Group, which had arranged a series of lectures in Japan by four speakers Albert Einstein was to explain relativity. Bertrand Russell, the consequences of the Peace of Versailles. H. G. Wells, his version of International Accord. And I was to discuss population control, delivering in March and April eight to ten lectures of five hours each. The five-hour clause I innocently believed to be merely a mistake on the part of the translator, but I had faith in the common sense of human nature and expected the error to be taken care of when I arrived. January and February were months of feverish activity. I spoke in city after city, Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and elsewhere, rushing back to New York to town hall hearings and farewell luncheons and dinners. The prolongation of the town hall episode had been entirely unforeseen. If bookings had not already been made requiring my departure in February, I should have postponed the trip. But I had promised, and lecture dates were binding obligations. Stuart was at Petty Institute, where my brother Bob had gone, captain of his football team, preparing for college, having a full and rich time. Grant was there also, but he was barely thirteen. I could not bear to put the broad Pacific between us. The headmaster warned me that he was only beginning to adjust himself to the school and his studies, and would be set back at least a year if I took him with me. I agreed to reconsider— but I am afraid I had made up my mind beforehand. With scant ceremony and scarcely enough clean shirts, I bundled him up and away, leaving the turbulence of New York behind. Since Grant was to travel on my passport, I had to have it renewed, and had telegraphed Washington for it to be sent to the West Coast, where the detail of a visa could also be attended to. At San Francisco, it was waiting. With the little book and Grant in tow, I presented myself to the Japanese consul. Instead of stamping it as the usual mere formality, he examined it carefully and then, apologizing profusely, regretted very much that the Japanese imperial government could not give me a visa. Here was a state of things. I asked him whether he could find out the precise reasons. Was it that I as a person could not go there, or was my subject taboo? The next day, after a cable to Tokyo and much polite bowing, he notified me it was both. In varying degrees of amusement and indignation, the papers published the fact that the Japanese were turning the tables on the United States. By our Exclusion Act, we had implied they were undesirable citizens, and now it was an American who was undesirable to them. The steamship company would not sell me tickets on the Tayo Maru without the visa. Two days previous to her sailing, a Japanese who had been in the United States for the Washington Conference proffered a letter of introduction. He deplored the action of his government, and he was desirous of being helpful. The Taiyo Maru is going on to Shanghai. Why don't you get a Chinese visa? I always chose to go forward and there was always a chance that a way might open. A hundred and fifty Japanese who had been at the conference, delegates, professors, doctors, members of the diplomatic corps, secretaries, were returning by this same vessel. 
Once on board, I could meet them simply and informally, and I was sure I could convince them I was not dangerous. The Chinese consul granted a visa without question. Our tickets were delivered. We sailed on the Tayo Maru. I had never before been on a Japanese liner. The segregation between whites and orientals horrified me. Here were the aristocrats of a people by nature intelligent, well-bred, well-clothed, inclined to be friendly, taking Grant under their wing, and teaching us both, amid much laughter, to eat with chopsticks. They had made valiant efforts to adapt themselves to Occidentalism. They had altered their dress and fashion of eating, substituting coats, collars, shoes, for loose kimonos and soft felt slippers, forks and knives for chopsticks. They sat on chairs instead of kneeling comfortably on the floor. Yet my compatriots kept themselves aloof. Never did I see the two groups together in conversation. They joined only in sports. At night, members of the crew wrestled in the moonlight, and I gazed down at their deck, marveling at the grips, the holds, the stoutness of legs, the strength of backs and arms, the quickness of action, the primitive guttural calls of the umpires. Others of the crew stamped their feet, and for good luck, threw pinches of salt towards their respective champions. Two days out, the Japanese asked me to address them. I willingly complied, and the dining room was closed off for the purpose. Admiral Baron Cato, who was later to be Prime Minister and headed the delegation, talked to me afterwards. He had the culture, courtesy, restraint, and suavity of a true gentleman, rather than the mien of the warlord his title seemed to imply. Equally genial was Masanao Hanahara, then Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and destined to be Ambassador to the United States. He knew American ways and manners, or mannerisms, if you wish to name them so. He was understanding, and perhaps one of the most fluent of the Japanese I met in the ease of his English. He told me his people were not likely to accept the idea of birth control as a social philosophy, though they were bound to accept the economic aspects, and all the young would be interested as individuals. Not until later did I learn how happily my contact with these two gentlemen had resulted. They had separately cabled their government, asking that I be allowed to lecture in Japan. At Honolulu, I had one short afternoon into which to crowd so much. With lays hung about my neck, I was whisked off for lunch to a magical house at Waikiki, then to a big meeting. What surprised and pleased me most was the complete absence of race prejudice. I looked out over faces, mostly American, but with a liberal sprinkling of Japanese and Chinese in their native costumes, and Hawaiians in bright Mother Hubbards. Honolulu was the only place I had found where class for class internationalism did exist. Two Japanese correspondents followed my zigzag trail, notebooks in hand, pencils working furiously. They even inserted questions as I was swept towards the boat, where breathless and almost in a daze we were garlanded once more. They had a scoop and were going to cable their favorable impressions to their papers in Japan. Their efforts had definitely produced a favorable reaction on board ship. Individuals and delegations of Japanese came into my stateroom at any time, morning, afternoon, or evening, to be informed. Although they did not knock, this was not considered an invasion of privacy, provided they bowed profoundly on their way in. On entering and on leaving, they bowed and bowed, again and again. 
They seem to know more about my affairs and my children than I did myself, mentioning things I had completely forgotten, even reminding me of my unspoken thoughts of long ago. Past experience had taught me that when a despotic and arbitrary screen was interposed between birth control and the people, the desire for knowledge was immeasurably enhanced. This was particularly true in Japan, where the recent renaissance had quickened the public mind. At the announcement I could not land, officialdom was subjected to frank criticism. A little round-faced boy called me each morning, murmuring something in a voice so soft and melodious it almost lulled me back to sleep. With the coffee, which tended to wake me, he announced, Madam Singer, go in maybe? Yes, Japanese government let her go in. In ten minutes he would return with the reversal of this news. He was aware of the contents of the radiograms, which kept the aerials crackling even before they had been delivered to me. One read, Thousands disciples welcome you. Another, Possible land Yokohama, impossible discourse. From the ship's daily, I learned first that I might lecture, but not publicly. And then, a day later, after continuous derision on the part of the press, all right, I might talk publicly if I wished, but under no condition on birth control. The last word I received was that I could land, but speak only in private. From the Ishimoto's came the message, Anticipate your staying with us. March 10th was so dripping and foggy that when we reached Tokyo Bay, I could not see Japan. The arrival of the Taiyo Maru, bearing such an array of distinguished passengers as the conference delegates, was bound to call forth unusual activity. A veritable flotilla met the ship police and health officers launches mail tenders and press dispatch carriers two officials came on board to interrogate me and the three of us retired to my cabin where our bags had been hopefully packed i showed my passport told the purpose of my visit explained how i happened to know the ishimoto's and mr yamanoto of the kaizo group inspector and interpreter alike smiled amiably as they plied their questions ending with the polite query who is paying your expenses the implication was that i might be a secret agent sent by the united states government to deplete the population of japan and to prepare the way for an american invasion this was particularly amusing, since I was one of the persons thoroughly disapproved of by my government. At the end of the lengthy catechism, it was agreed that the ban would be removed if I, for my part, agreed not to lecture publicly on birth control, and provided the American consul, General Skidmore, formally requested permission for me to land. I had sent him a wireless message from the Taiyo Maru saying I would like to visit the country, if not as a lecturer, at least as a private citizen, and asking him to use his influence. Though I had had no reply, I sent off a telegram to him immediately, and Grant and I sat down on the luggage to await developments. The two officials had no sooner taken their departure than the little cabin was filled to bursting with the gentlemen of the press. We started and blinked with each rapid-fire flashlight explosion. The room was literally smoking with the acrid powder, and not an inch of standing room remained. Seventy were all trying to get in at once. Whatever I said had to be relayed and translated to the unsuccessful ones who brimmed over into the corridor. Meanwhile, we had docked at Yokohama, and when the reporters were finally disposed of, my friends, who had been patiently enduring the rain, greeted me. Mr. Yamanoto, Mr. Wilson of the British Embassy, 
Baroness Ishimoto, and the missionary who lived next door. After welcoming me, they left, the last named, carrying with him my briefcase, laden with my most private papers and pamphlets, which I did not wish seized at the customs. Now came the tapping of clogs along the passage, and in the doorway were framed slight, doll-like figures, pale white faces, crimson lips, black glossy hair, beautifully coiffured, butterfly-looking obese. The trials of the day vanished before their bobbing little bows. Here was a Japanese fairy tale come true. In precise English, the leader introduced the others. This one represented the silk manufacturers, that one the weavers. Each of the twenty-five was appearing for some laboring organization. She explained they had been there all day, but it was nothing. They were so proud to be the first to welcome the herald of freedom for women. The industrial revolution which had put them to work was still so young that they were in virtual slavery. Yet, she said, they were so accustomed to subservience that it would be a long time until they learned to rebel against their wrongs. Suffrage was slow. Japanese women found it difficult to see the advantages. They could not be stirred by offers of economic independence. It was a higher ideal to have husbands take care of their wives than have them battle for themselves. She was certain no inspiration was to be found in that quarter. Then, with eyes sparkling, she added, but when the message of birth control came to us from Honolulu, like the lightning, we understood its meaning, and now we are all awakened. We were served with tea, and I continued to await a reply from Mr. Skidmore, but none ever came. Finally, at 7.30, due to the British Mr. Wilson's intercession, the imperial government at last opened its gates to me without the sponsorship of my own government i still had to go through customs papers and books including forty copies of family limitation were confiscated thereafter i usually left spaces in my diaries instead of writing out names because i never knew who was going to see them the customs men further minutely examined my clothes, accessories, even necklaces and ornaments, holding them up, laughing at them, calling each other to come and look, in order to inform themselves as much on the composition and design as to determine whether they were dutiable. The data they gleaned thus from incoming travelers they stored away like squirrels and cheaply manufactured replicas shortly appeared on Woolworth counters, stamped in purple ink, made in Japan. When I emerged, tired and damp, more crowds pressed around seeking autographs. Everywhere in Japan, people wanted your signature. One man, who spoke some English, said he represented the rickshaw men's union and apologized for the trouble to which I had been put. Sometime Japanese government he little autocratic. For that matter, everybody apologized for the government. After the torrents of rain, logs blazing in fireplaces warmed us in the Ishimoto's charming house at Tokyo. Grant and I were both in a large room, almost bare of furnishings, exquisite in its simplicity. The fragile walls of painted silk gave an impression of airiness. Next to us was the huge bathroom, the floor and lower walls of burnished shining copper. In the center, raised on legs, stood a great wooden tub with a top that closed down and a hole for your neck. Five or six basins were ranged around the room, and beside each, brush and soap. You were supposed to scrub and scrub, and then rinse by throwing pans of water over you. Finally, you entered the steaming tub, 
to relax. It was not etiquette to leave any trace of soap in the bath or any evidence of its use, because everybody in the family soaked in that water before the night was over, guests, hosts, and servants in order. I sank gratefully on one of the mattresses borrowed for our comfort and laid on the floor. The rest of the household slept on mats with wooden blocks in place of pillows, a custom which allowed the ladies to keep their coiffures intact for a week at a time. Through the frail partitions we could hear the servants laughing and chatting until late into the night, men and women together, carrying on their bathing as though it were a function of eating. Our days were tremendously busy, beginning early with the ringing of the antiquated telephone on the wall. People came silently in rickshaws and departed after conversing with the baron and baroness. Old Japan had extended aesthetics into the realm of ordinary existence, and undoubtedly had produced a thing of beauty. The gestures of ceremony might have meant little, but they made delightful the arranging of any affair whatever. The Japanese always greeted each other with a bow from the waistline, hands gliding down to the knees. The difference between one and another was so subtle that a foreigner could hardly distinguish it, but it was there all the same. A particular mark of respect was the triple bow, graduated according to the social rank, an inclination, a slight pause, a deeper inclination, again a pause, and then down further until the back was nearly horizontal. Grant, who was very affectionate, had been accustomed to kiss me when we met, whether it were in a restaurant, hotel, on the street, or anywhere else for that matter. But he had to forego the salute in Japan when we observed that kissing was a shock to Japanese sensibilities, and indeed was considered immoral. Instead, he took over Japanese manners and became marvelously courteous. Practically every time he spoke to me, he made the three bows, and unconsciously I soon found myself returning them with equal formality. Politeness in behavior, impersonal and ritualistic, was most noticeable in those relationships where we naturally expected habitual and conventional reserve to be thrown aside. When the Baroness Ishimoto's mother and sister were coming for lunch, she donned a special kimono, set out special vases and screens, greeted them with the prescribed bows, wordings, and gestures. Even I noticed the civilities accorded the two were not the same. The effect was that the mother occupied the place of honor as though she were receiving. Men came also to the Ishimoto's to plan for the various meetings and entertainments. A member of the House of Lords telephoned to say he was a disciple. The press sought interviews. Early in my career, I had realized the importance of giving clear, concise, and true concepts of birth control to those who wished to quote me. This simple policy served my purpose particularly well in the Orient, where technical phrases in English were hopelessly confusing. Under any circumstances, our language was peculiarly difficult for the Japanese and their phraseology was sometimes convulsively funny. One letter from a dismissed government employee to the head of his department was making the rounds of Occidentals in the East. Kind sir, on opening this epistle, you will behold the work of the dejobbed person, and a very bewifed and much childrenized gentleman, who was violently dejobbed in a twinkling, by your good self. For heaven's sake, sir, consider this catastrophe as falling on your own head, 
and remind yourself on walking home at the moon's end to savage wife and sixteen voracious children and your pocket filled with non-existent pennies and pity my horrible state when being dejobbed and proceeding with a heart and intestines filled with misery in this den of doom myself did greedily contemplate culpable homicide but him who protected daniel poet safe through the lion's den will protect his servant in this home of evil as to reason given by yourself esquire for my dejobment the incrimination was laziness no sir it were impossible that myself, who has pitched sixteen infant children into this vale of tears, can have a lazy atom in his mortal frame, and a sudden departure of eleven pounds has left me on the verge of the abyss of destitution and despair. I hope this vision of horror will enrich your dreams this night, and good angel will meet and pulverize your heart of nether millstone so that you will awaken with such alacrity as may be compatible with your personal safety and will hasten to rejobulate your servant. So mote it be, amen. Yours despairfully, Akano Sabusu. And on the bottom of the letter, the district officer had noted, Gentle reader, do not sob. Akano Sabusu has been rejobbed. I myself had a letter from a gentleman who wrote, How am I unavoidably in need to execute your ism and hope to know your effective method? Had it been allowed, I should have given forth practical information. Since it was not, I believed if I could make plain to the authorities that I was not going to break this rule in my lectures, they could find no fault with them. Accordingly, the morning of our second day in Tokyo, an appointment was made with the police governor. In spite of the early hour, the hard little official, his close cropped hair revealing all the bumps and developments, served us tea. The Japanese always handed you tea as we pass cigarettes, in embarrassment for relaxation or just to tie up loose moments disregarding the vital subject completely we discussed current topics through an interpreter though all the people were intensely serious they were remarkably fond of plays on words merrily i was told my name had created much confusion owing to its similarity to sangai san which meant destructive to production birth control was thus delicately introduced. For the first time I heard about the dangerous thought law, which had been sponsored in Parliament by a group called the Thought Controllers, who aimed to exclude from the country all ideas not conforming to the ancient Japanese tradition. The police governor assumed he knew exactly what I had planned to talk about, and I could not move him from the conviction that I wanted to present a dangerous thought. I was not, however, going to let the matter drop. I went higher up to the Home Affairs Office. A courteous gentleman informed me the minister sent his regards and hoped to have the pleasure of seeing me some other time. There was no tea. I was politely bowed out. My next stop was at the Kaizo office, where the entire staff was called into consultation. They were bristly and burly enough to be taken for Russians. Only their kimonos identified them as Japanese. One and all decided we should go in person to the imperial diet. There, on presentation of our cards, couriers started running around to find the chief. In a few moments, the door of the room into which we had been ushered was opened, and in came the very same man with whom I had conversed at the home office that morning. Profoundly embarrassed, I explained this was the way of impatient Americans, who were bent on hurrying things along. He was very kind, 
and said he had been on the point of giving me permission to speak publicly, provided I did not mention birth control. When I sketched an outline of a possible population lecture, we laughed and agreed the empire of Japan was not, as a result, going to fall. Almost from the time of landing, I had been deeply conscious that I was in one of the most thickly populated countries of the world. The Ishimoto's automobile honked, honked at every turn of the wheels to squeeze through rickshaws, pedestrians, and children in the narrow, unpaved streets. In any traffic danger, the first concern was always for the baby. I never saw one slapped, struck, scolded, or punished. I never heard one cry. They all seemed happy and smiling, though I must admit a few of them needed to have their little noses wiped. I could not believe any country could contain so many babies. Fathers carried them in their arms. Mothers carried them in a sort of shawl. Children carried babies. Even babies carried smaller babies. I saw a land of one-story houses, but of two-story children. Boys with babies on their backs were playing baseball, running to bases, the heads of the babies wobbling so that you thought their necks were surely going to be broken. The momentum that had come from the high birth rate was felt in every walk of life. Peers, business, and professional men were all having large families. One told me he wanted twenty children. When I asked him how many he had already, he replied, two. And he was offended when I suggested that perhaps his wife, instead of himself, had had those. The density of population in tillable areas of Japan averaged 2,000 human beings to the square mile, and it was increasing at the rate of almost a million a year. Although they built terraced rice paddies on their hillsides with tremendous labor, they could not feed themselves. Furthermore, lacking ore, petroleum, and an adequate supply of coal, they could not develop their industries to a point where they could exchange their products for enough food. The government should itself have been disseminating contraceptive information, but the army faction was not friendly to it, and claimed Japan could never be respected in the eyes of the world until she possessed a force sufficiently powerful to make might right. It was even then too late for birth control to offset the inevitability of her overflowing her borders. The population pressure was bound to cause an explosion in spite of the safety valve of Korea. How long this could be delayed was a matter of pure conjecture. End of chapter 25「Chapter Twenty Six of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six: The East is Blossoming. After I found out where I stood with the government, the silent friends who had come and gone so frequently from the Ishimoto home produced plans for various meetings. In each one, the address was to a particular class which did not mingle with others, commercial, educational, medical, parliamentary. The Kaitso group were intensely disappointed that I could not deliver the lectures I had prepared and for which they had invited me to Japan. As a compromise, we agreed that I should have to focus my war and population talk around Germany and the Allies. It was going to be difficult because I was not satisfied with the European facts and figures I had. My first meeting was at the Tokyo YMCA. Shortly before one o'clock, I was escorted with great ceremony into a room behind the auditorium pungent with smoke from a charcoal stove. Then I was presented to a gathering of about five hundred, 
prosperous-looking men, well-dressed women, students, a number of foreigners, a Buddhist priest or two, and a liberal sprinkling of the Metropolitan Police to make certain my audience thought no dangerous thoughts as a result of my speech. Most of the auditors apparently understood some English, because while I was speaking they leaned forward attentively, laughing in the proper places, but when I paused for the translation they relaxed, rustled papers, and whispered to each other. I had discovered that the five-hour clause in my contract was no mistake and no joke. Standing from one until six was a frightful strain. The lecture with interpretations took three hours, although I could have delivered it in one, and questions took two more. Many of these were on subjects entirely alien to my own. What do you think of the missionaries? What do you think of Christianity? Are you yourself a Christian? This last was naively posed, and thoroughly aware of the significance of what it meant truly to be a Christian, I replied, I'm afraid I'm not a very good one. My questioner put out his chest and said confidently, I am. I seemed to recall my adolescence when I had exacted the last ounce of righteousness from every breathing hour. Many of the Japanese converts had this spirit. They were trying to change their ancestral ideas of morality, and instead adopt wholesale the Christian code without having had time to assimilate it. The most painful experience I had in Japan was in addressing the Tokyo Medical Association. The volunteer interpreter was a young doctor who had been on a three weeks tour of America, and his command of English was correspondingly slight. From the attitude of the audience, I could tell whenever he was not conveying my meaning as I had intended it, though I did not always know what specifically was wrong. The baroness, unable to bear his mistranslation of prevention of conception as abortion, which she knew would distress me intensely, finally rose and attempted to correct the erroneous impression he was giving. But the meeting was over before she could make it clear. Nothing had been said about remuneration. I expected none. But the next day, an army of ten rickshaws appeared. The officers of the society, laden with packages and bundles, presented themselves. One by one, they offered boxes in which I found an elaborate kimono, an embroidered table cover, a purse, a fan, a cloison jar, and in conclusion, the president offered me the smallest package of all, wrapped in tissue, and tied with a paper tape on which were the characters wishing me health, happiness, and longevity. Opening it, I found crisp new bills in payment. This delicate gesture was typically Japanese. At other meetings, we usually sat on clean, fresh mats. The room might be chilly, but a little charcoal burner was beside you, and occasionally you warmed your hands over it. I liked the service and the food which the maids silently brought all at once on a tray, covered over and steaming hot. After sake, in diminutive porcelain cups, the group was ready to converse, and it was cozy and interesting. Often we did not get away until midnight, because although the discussion was carried on in English, each remark was translated for the benefit of those who did not understand. The baroness always went with me, and it was a revelation to them to have one of their own countrywomen present. I had heard much talk of the elder statesmen, but nobody at the Peers Club, where I gave an afternoon address, seemed to be even elderly. They were curious to know why women were divorced, whether they wanted more than one husband, 
whether they really could ever care for more than one man, the nature of their love for children, how long it could continue. They were like Europeans in the frankness with which they regarded the relationship of the sexes. Yet they were not satisfied with the accepted Japanese tradition. On the one hand, geisha girls who played and coquetted and amused them, and on the other, wives whose place as yet was definitely in the home. They asked, Is it not true that the American woman can be all things to her husband, his companion, mother of his children, mistress, business manager, and friend? I agreed with them that this was the ideal, but had to confess that by no means every American wife fitted into this picture. Many of the Japanese had themselves forgotten that in the heroic and epic days women had enjoyed freedom and equality with men. Only with the rise of the powerful military lords in the 8th century had this most rigid, most persistent, and most immovable discrimination arisen. The Ona Daigaku, the feudal moral code, counseled, a woman shall get up early in the morning and go to bed late in the evening. She must never take a nap in the daytime. She shall be industrious at sewing, weaving, spinning, and embroidery. She shall not take much tea or wine. She shall not visit places of amusement, such as theaters or musicals. She must never get angry. She must bear everything and always be careful and timid. The resultant upper-class Japanese lady, exquisite and decorative, was a living work of art, particularly created by the imagination of numberless generations of men. My original conception of all Japanese women had been fashioned out of romantic fallacies partly by the three little maids from school who simpered through the Mikado, and to no small extent by the gaudy theatricalism of Madame Butterfly, the unrestrained exoticism of Pierre Loti, and Lafcadio Hearn had strengthened my illusions, as had also the color prints that had aroused so much enthusiasm towards the end of the century but I soon found the cherry blossom fairyland was being destroyed by the advent of machinery. In Yokohama and Kobe, you heard factory whistles and saw tall smokestacks, new shipyards, and great steel cranes. The Industrial Revolution, accomplished in our Western countries gradually, had invaded the island empire with an impact and a shock the repercussions of which were still evident. It had not brought freedom to the women whose low status was admirably suited to the purpose of manufacturing with its ever-increasing demand for cheap and unskilled labor. Practically half the female population, some 13 millions, were engaged in gainful occupation, though few were economically independent. In the mill districts, mothers scolded their small daughters by threatening, I'll sell you to the weavers. These kaiko, or bought ones, served as apprentices generally from three to five years. Modern Japanese industrialism had been able to take advantage of an ancient oriental habit of thought which placed slight value on the girl child. I spent half a day as the guest of the Kanegafuchi plant, the largest cotton mill in the empire, and the ideal industrial institution which was to be a model for others, comparing favorably with one of our best. But Kanegafuchi was the exception. On the average, employees in other mills worked a 12-hour shift, day and night, amid the deafening roar of relentless power engines. Dust and fine particles of fabric fell like minute snowflakes upon them. Their growth was stunted, 
their resistance to infection and malignant disease broken down. In a silk spinning mill at Nagoya, conditions were only slightly better. I found over 700 girls, some no more than 10 years of age, swiftly twirling off the slender threads from the cocoons and catching them on the spindles. They were pathetic, gentle, homeless little things, imprisoned in rooms with all windows closed to keep them moist and hot. A quarter of their seven dollars a month wages had to go for board. Only by the graciousness and charity, in a sense, of the upper classes were the household servants saved from institutions. When the baroness, for example, had married, some of them, cooks, maids, and nurses, had stayed with her parents. Some had gone on to another sister. Some had come to her and been set to training the new ones. With her, they had a home for life. This system accounted in part, at least, for the fact that there were no beggars or mendicants in Japan. Essentially conservative, essentially the product of a strange and scarcely understood past, the Japanese woman, in my opinion, did not possess in her typical psychology any strong leanings towards rebellion. This was true even among the many women writers on papers and magazines. Those who interviewed me were intelligent, but I was constantly amazed at their ancient and domesticated outlook. I did not believe the woman of Japan would discard her beautiful costume or sacrifice her aesthetic sense upon the altar of Occidental progress and materialism. The kimono was her chrysalis. Outwardly, it was often of some thick, serviceable goods, dull brown or black, shot through with threads of purple or blue. Yet underneath were silks of the brightest and most flaming hues, formalized for each particular occasion. Only a fleeting glimpse was caught of these as she walked. They were symbolic of her present position in society. From the lowest serving maid to the finest aristocrat, certain indelible traits immediately impressed themselves. First of all was the low, soft, fluttering voice, like art and music combined. They were too modestly shy to talk out loud. You could scarcely hear them in a small room. Perhaps one reason men did not take their opinions seriously was because they did not speak up. I heard on every side of the new woman, but I never saw her. Only those who had turned Christian showed any signs of thinking independently. To be a Christian seemed to imply being a rebel or a radical of some kind. They told me it with great secret pride. This was the single place where I had found men rather than women responding to the potentialities of birth control. The former wanted to learn and thereby make of themselves something better. They were more and more in touch with the ideas of the Western world and were broadening themselves through travel. I was confident a shifting environment was going to extend the masculine point of view and if birth control could be proved of benefit to them, they would practice it. At that time, I did not agree that East and West could never meet. Japan was undoubtedly a man's country. Wherever we went, Grant was Exhibit A. He was tall, dark, rather gawky youth, with adolescent manners, but always cheerful. In private houses, butlers and maids paid him much attention, and in hotels, as soon as we entered the dining room, everybody, because he was a man-child, rushed to anticipate his wishes, to see that he was made comfortable. I straggled on behind. At our first appearance in one of these, the little girls who were being trained as waitresses and whose duty it was to bow the guests in and out were obviously confused. 
When we were seated at the table, the proprietor apologized. You must excuse them, because they are so young, and they have their minds too much on this young gentleman. The Yoshiwara, to which some missionaries escorted me, was certainly an integral part of this man's world. First we visited the unlicensed quarter, winding in our rickshaws among alley-like streets lined with small houses. The dark eyes of the girls peered out through slits in the screen walls. Working men were standing in the muddy roadways, chattering, scrutinizing the prices which were posted in front like restaurant menus, so much per hour, so much per night. A door opened to admit a visitor. The light in the lower story vanished, and soon another twinkled upstairs. Or a light went out above and reappeared below. The door opened again, and a figure emerged. Hundreds of lights behind paper windows seemed to flicker on and off constantly, low to high, high to low. The sordidness, the innumerable shining eyes, made me shiver involuntarily. After we crossed a bridge to the licensed quarter, the scene changed immediately. The wide thoroughfare, with a row of trees down the center, festooned with electric globes like a midway, was clean and inviting. The amply built houses had an air of spaciousness and luxury. Their lanterns sent out a soft, alluring gleam, and carefully cultivated gardens produced a profusion of flowers in the courtyards. This part of Yoshiwara appeared a delightful place. Its attraction for the girls was obvious. They would rather seek a livelihood in this fashion than in the dismal factories. Nor was it odd that they should find more romance here with many men than drudging for one all their days as the incompetents they became after marriage under the domination of their mothers-in-law. Through portals as broad as driveways, the patrons, much better dressed than those in the unlicensed quarter, strolled up to view the photographs of the inmates posted like those in the lobby of a Broadway theater. In some frames was only the announcement, blank, just arrived, straight from, blank. No time for picture. The clients did a great deal of window shopping. Newcomers from the country might have eight or nine visitors an evening, an older one, but two or three. Many of the girls came from good families frequently to lift their fathers or brothers out of debt. They sent their earnings back, and as soon as they had accumulated a sufficiency, often went home, married, and became reputable members of society. But in spite of the Yoshiwara's artificial glamour, the crowd of men swarming like insects, automatically reacting to the stimulus of instinct, was unutterably depressing. We walked home at midnight through the sleeping city, mysterious and quiet, not like a city at all, no jumping signs or illumination, but more like a nice low-ceilinged room trimmed with old brown-stained oak and only here and there a glow. Nothing else in my travels could compare with that month in Tokyo. The language was strange and unfamiliar. The bells in the shafts of the rickshaws, ringing for pedestrians to get out of the way, added a bizarre note. The queer, clicking sound of the wooden geta was different, although somewhat reminiscent of the clop-clop of the Lancashire wooden shoes, which also were taken off at the door and exchanged for slippers. All the smells and the sights were quite new. Even the signs on the shops were unreadable. In Europe, you could usually guess from some root word what kind of merchandise was for sale within, but not so in Japan. One day I stopped, totally puzzled, to inquire the whereabouts of a store the address of which had been written down for me. I showed my slip of paper, 
but nobody there could help me. I went on. Fully three minutes later, the pattering of hurried steps behind me caused me to turn. Here was one of the clerks. He had gone to the trouble of looking up the address I had asked for, and had come to act as guide to make sure I arrived. Throughout Japan, the custom of greeting you and seeing you off was touching, and gave you a charming remembrance of a world where friendships were worth time and consideration. When a Tokyo doctor heard I was leaving Yokohama, eighteen miles away, at eight o'clock in the morning, he presented himself at seven to bring me a box of choice silk handkerchiefs. He must have risen at five to do so. From the window of the train for Kyoto, the faces of the old men trudging along the road looked curiously like the drawings of them. Everywhere were small village houses, and since I could see through from front to rear, I wondered where the peasants and their numerous offspring ate and slept. The former capital was fascinating. The shopkeepers appeared to esteem their visitors more highly than the goods they had to sell. Though Kyoto Blue, and more especially Kyoto Red, were like no other colors anywhere. If ever you see the latter, buy it if you can. Cherish it among your treasures. Save it for your children, because it is the most beautiful of all reds. It was now April, the festival of spring and of the geishas, the jealously guarded and chaperoned entertainers, singers, players. Everybody was anticipating the flowering of the cherry trees and with the rest of Kyoto I went to see the enormous spreading willow cherry, then in dazzling white blossom. It was several hundred years old. Its limbs, which grew out and drooped towards the ground, were propped up with care, and around it was a superbly groomed landscape garden. The proprietors of hotels near such trees erected unpretentious tea houses, temporary in character, where hundreds of people kept vigil. You could not help having respect for a people whose love of a tree brought them from miles away and who waited day and night throughout the duration of its brief blooming. They paid deference to it as they did to a great artist who they knew could live just so long. The Japanese design their gardens with the mood of the individual in mind. Some were filled with music, water, birds, activity, and there you could go to be cheered when gloomy and despondent. As soon as I entered the Golden Temple grounds, its influence fell upon me. Everything was planned for thought and concentration. No color, no noise, no rushing of water. No singing birds distracted the attention. Only at certain hours could you even walk about, because movement was disturbing to meditation. Japanese hospitality reached its finest flower in Kyoto, and the supreme day of entertainment was offered by a generous and considerate doctor. On inviting me to luncheon, he said he would call with his car at ten in the morning. This seemed a bit early, but it appeared he wanted me first to visit the Museum of Art. Here was no wandering through miles of rooms so that the eye was wearied and no lasting impression was gathered. Instead, I was shown only the one most prized specimen of paintings, porcelains, and rare screens. Afterwards, I was ushered into the library to see a collection of precious manuscripts, then back through the city for a few especially renowned views, and finally at noon to the doctor's home. His wife and two daughters greeted me, and I was introduced to the guests. Little short-legged trays were put before our floor cushions, and we all picked up our chopsticks. I envied Grant his dexterity. After the trays had been removed, we conversed until the businessmen had to return to their offices. 
but a fresh group of guests took their places, and with them appeared a painter. An easel was set up, and each of us in turn made a single brush line on the rice paper, some straight, some curved, some vertical, some horizontal, criss-crossing each other in every direction. Then the artist took his brush, and amid exclamations of wonder and appreciation, with a few expert strokes converted the melange into a flower pattern, a lake, or a mountain. An hour or so of this pleasure, and the easel was swished away, the painter vanished with his colors, and a sculptor was substituted. We were now supplied with dabs of clay, which we began to mold, the sculptor going from one to another to give assistance. If you were clever, as several of the Japanese were, works of art resulted. I created a plain jug with handle and lip, was taught how to draw a design on it, and how to paint it. Next day it was delivered to me, baked and glazed. Later, we were escorted to the garden where we congregated beneath an open tea house perched high on a rock. There the younger daughter tended a tiny fire and brewed a ceremonial tea. No simple brew, but leaves of a special sort, beaten until the beverage was bright green. When we had enjoyed this delight, we strolled about, admiring the brooklets, the dwarf pines, the shrubs the iris in bloom. We returned to the house to find, as though in a play, that the scenery had all been changed. Different screens were up, fresh flowers in the vases, the women of the household in more elaborate costumes, and new visitors waiting. Grant and I alone seemed to remain static. Now, on the immaculate matted floor, appeared little charcoal stoves. The evening meal was served by the mother and daughters as a marked honor to their guests. This time I was brought a spoon and fork. Apparently, I had not been very deft at lunch in handling my chopsticks. After dinner came yet more people and yet more conversation. I had been talking steadily since early morning, the topic being selected according to the type of gathering. In the evening, it was population and more serious. Sometimes I forgot myself and spun out involved English phrases, then realizing they had missed fire, had to go back and choose key words more easily comprehended. This continued until midnight or later. At last, we had to excuse ourselves and ask to be taken home, because we were leaving for Kobe the next morning. The doctor and his wife, accompanied by some of their friends, were at our hotel betimes, all with boxes and bone voyages. This reversal of the Occidental custom of bestowing presents on one's host or hostess was an enchanting way of conducting the amenities of life. They wanted no return for their hospitality. I had arrived in Japan with one small trunk and departed with five, laden with gifts. End of chapter 26「Chapter twenty seven of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty seven Ancients of the Earth. New and different places, strange countries, peoples, and faces have always appealed to me. I did not have to be in London for the Fifth International Conference until July. When I had secured my Chinese visa, it had occurred to me that it might be much better to go on around the world than retrace my steps. On a misty day, the sun not bright enough to clear the sky completely, we sailed from Kobe through the glorious inland sea, threaded its innumerable islets like the thousand islands of the St. Lawrence, only more delicate 
The boat was small and out of date. A few of the English had chairs, but Grant and I wandered between crates of ducks, chickens, and livestock, and hundreds of Japanese squatting stolidly on the deck. When we emerged into the Yellow Sea, it became very foggy, and Grant was sick to his toes. I put on a brave face and ate, though with long teeth, as the old phrase goes. We landed at Fusan one evening. Koreans stood about in their white robes, which fell to their ankles, pale figures outlined against the night in the subdued light of their mysterious paper lanterns. The next morning, as I glanced out over the countryside on the way to Seoul, it appeared an oriental desert, odd but seemingly familiar. I felt at home within its gates, white-robed coolies smoking long, thin pipes with minute bowls drove oxen worked in the fields. They had North American Indian faces, uncut ragged hair, reddish skins, and curious wooden structures strapped to their backs to carry burdens of any kind, soil, coal, rocks. The streets of Seoul were broad, dimly lit. The tall Korean men were unique, a combination of priest, patriarch, and grandee, so formal and elegant with their pointed beards a trifle larger than Van Dyke's. They were utterly indifferent to other people, managing to preserve a proud and aloof air in spite of their idiotic, silly-looking hats, dinky-crowned and wide-brimmed, from which hung strings of amber beads, valuable family heirlooms. I wondered again at the universal white costumes. Everywhere on the banks of rivers, women were eternally pounding laundry. You could almost feel the threads parting company with the terrific beating, washing with stones and ironing with sticks. The Korean was held in contempt by the Japanese, who declared his government had built schools, roads, railroads, brought cleanliness. It was true that the houses of the Koreans were not so well kept, their habits not so sanitary, but they were a separate race, and they accepted scouring and scrubbing and sweeping only under pressure. Hatred and rebellion had been the result of denying them their language and customs. They claimed they were taxed out of existence to pay for such luxuries, and nourished antagonism and stubborn resistance against anything Japanese. They maintained further that they had no personal liberty, even being required to have passports to move about in their own country. Koreans also resented the speeding up of production in the silk factories through the exploitation of little girls. I saw them there, shoulders bent, crouched up over their work, hair braided down their backs. They were almost like babies. Their job was to put their tender, delicate fingers into boiling water to pull out the silk cocoons. The hands of older people were not sensitive enough. But the Japanese said they did not feel the pain. Even though I had a large luncheon meeting, attended by foreign missionaries and officials, Korea was but a stepping stone to China. The celestial kingdom had an indefinable odor of its own, peculiar and inimitable, which waxed and waned, varying with each city and with each district of a city. It might be a compound of sauces, onions, garlic, incense, opium, and charcoal. But who has ever succeeded in putting an odor into words? It marched upon you, at first faintly and indistinctly, like a distant army, and then closed in relentlessly, 
associating itself with memories, making you gasp in protest or pleasure. At Peking, I wanted to change into fresh clothes all the time. I was haunted by dust, dust in my body, in my ears, up my nose, down my throat, between my teeth. Some of the streets were paved, but the dust was suffocating. After every sightseeing sortie, I bathed and bathed and bathed in a desperate effort to rid myself of the diabolical dust. We were seven days viewing palaces, native quarters, nightlife, sing-song girls, hospitals, factories, silk mills. We heard the mechanical chanting and beating of drums by Buddhist priests, mostly young boys dressed in soiled yellow robes, gazed with amazement at the funeral processions, great floats, fantastic gods, food, flowers, possessions, visited old Chinese gardens and museums. I shopped for jade and lapis lazuli and was well cheated. Beggars, many of them crippled and on crutches, were hobbling along in the gutters or sitting on corners, gaunt and filthy. Children were turning handsprings, doing anything to attract your attention. They edged beside you, and you had the feeling they had been born with palms upward. You could not set foot out of doors without being besieged by rickshaw boys clothed only in scant cotton trousers and jackets, always short at ankles and wrists. The moment you stepped in, they picked up the shafts of their little vehicles and began the dog-trot journey. I could not become accustomed to the eager running of these half-naked creatures, so weak, so underfed so much less able than the rest of us. It had been bad enough in Japan, but there you felt the runners were sturdy. In China, they usually were suffering from varicose veins, heart disease, and forever hunger. Often, as the wind blew some of the rags and tatters aside, I saw pockmarks and wondered how close we were to the manifold diseases of the Orient. I was going about a good deal, and it worried me to be pulled around by a human being so emaciated. One morning our regular boy was missing. Another replaced him, cheery and smiling. Three days later, the first returned. He had been sick, he said. He had had smallpox. The scabs had not yet peeled off. I spoke to the doorman at the hotel who managed the rickshaws. This boy is not well enough to work. Oh, yes, he's used to it. He feels a little bad, but he's all right. Nevertheless, I sent him home to rest up. Nothing save famine and pestilence and plague seemed to give the Chinese any breathing spell. It was said the average rickshaw coolie lasted but four or five years. The remainder of his life he merely subsisted. I was submerged in a strange despondency and questioned the oldest civilization in the world, which still, after so many thousand years, permitted this barbarism. Grant rode a donkey when we went to the Ming tombs and the guide did also. I was carried in a chair for miles and miles through an arid, dusty plain. Two coolies held the lengthy bamboo poles on their shoulders, and a third jogged alongside, waiting to take his turn. I felt so sorry for them, I wanted to get out and walk. I wished I could carry myself. All the way, these poor, starved creatures made animal noises. Ah, ah, nasal, interminable, varying the tone but slightly. Even their words sounded like grunts to me. China was not yet past the storytelling age, as you saw in the theater, where someone recited the news from the stage. 
for a copper anybody could hear what was going on in the world. The ancient classical forms of the Chinese language were intelligible to scholars alone, and Dr. Hu Shi had been instrumental in devising a literary vernacular which the people could use. This philosopher, who at three years old had been familiar with 800 characters, now in 1922, while only in his late twenties, was already reputed to be the initiator of the Chinese Renaissance. He asked whether I would speak to the students of the Peking National University, and though he was to act as chairman, volunteered also to interpret, which I esteemed an almost unheard of honor. His outlook, coinciding with mine, recognized what birth control might mean for civilization. Dr. Tsai Yun Pei, the chancellor of the university and a leader of the anti-Christian movement, had gathered into his fold the most brilliant students of young China, all of them bubbling over with interest at Western ideas, which were sweeping the globe. A great turmoil was going on in their lives, and a revolt against rigid Chinese tradition. Due to the translation difficulties I had encountered in Japan, I had decided I could not afford to speak in China unless I went over the subject first with my interpreter and knew he understood the spirit as well as the words. Therefore, I showed Dr. Hu Shi my lecture material in advance. He suggested, These students will want to know everything about contraception as it is practiced. But I've never given that except at medical meetings. China is different from the West. Here, you may discuss contraception as an educational fact, as well as a social measure. You will be listened to respectfully, laughed at if you do not, and will surely be asked for definite information. I think you should prepare yourself for this. It was not simple to digress from principles and theories and go into methods that needed diagrams and technical knowledge to secure understanding, and I felt diffident about following his advice. But these young people responsive and alert, received my first practical lecture with earnest attention. Dr. Hu Shi translated accurately and quickly, interjecting amusing stories and improving, I imagine, upon my own words. Afterwards, he and I were escorted across the campus to the home of Dr. Tsai. I have always been interested in foreign foods, I like to try them out, and have brought home dozens of Hawaiian, Chinese, Indian, Japanese recipes which can be made at home. This dinner was an Arabian night's experience. It began at seven and lasted until one in the morning. Bird's nest and quail egg soup, fried garupa, duck's tongues and snow fungus, roast pheasant, rice and congee, lotus nuts and pastry, shark's fins, and various kinds of wine. There must have been well over thirty guests invited for the evening, among them an American woman, Mrs. Grover Clark, whose husband was on the faculty of the university. Some of the students had been to her between the lecture and dinner time, and given her the transcribed notes which they had taken down in shorthand. Would she correct them? They wanted to get the information published. When they came to the Chancellor's home to call for them so that they could deliver them to the press, I could see at a glance that this was not at all what I desired to leave behind me. My spoken words never sound adequate or complete in print. Therefore, I sent a boy to the hotel for a copy of the old standby, Family Limitation. The students set to work at once to translate it. Mrs. Clark offered to pay the expenses, 
and the next afternoon five thousand copies were ready for circulation. This little incident was significant of young China. An idea to them was useless if only in the head. Their motto was to put it into concrete reality. Symptomatic also of New China was the abandonment of bound feet, although women of advanced years still were to be seen leaning on each other for support as they tottered by. Amas were carrying nurslings about when they themselves seemed scarcely able to stand up. However, I was glad to see only a few of the small children had these lily feet. Fathers realized their daughters could not earn a living if thus deformed. At the Peking Union Medical College, combining the modern equipment of the Occident with the artistry and traditions of the Orient, no girl was accepted for training unless her feet were normal. One day, Dr. Hu Shi asked me to lunch in an old Manchu restaurant where his friends were accustomed to gather and ponder. Many were business or professional men, but all, with their little beards and intellectual faces, had the appearance of professors. It was an unusual combination of Wall Street and University. In our private dining room were seven English-speaking Chinese with families of from four to nine children. Each said the later ones had not been wanted. Nevertheless, they had come. The conversation took a scientific turn. Since man had through breeding brought about such changes in the animal and vegetable kingdoms, why could he not produce a class of human beings unable to procreate? Was there any reason why the particular biological factors that made the mule sterile could not be applied further? They discussed the interesting possibility of creating a neuter gender, such as the workers in a beehive or ant hill. The implications of this colloquy formed a fascinating climax to our sojourn in Peking. Our train was the last one south for several days. Soldiers cluttered the landscape, not alert or even military-looking, but men or boys put into uniform and told how to act. The Tuchins were all trying to unite China, each in his own way. We read in the papers about the war clouds hanging over the country, but nobody seemed to be excited. We were not worried. Being foreigners, we were assured meant protection. The valley of the Yangtze Kiang was green and luxuriant. Every inch of ground was being utilized. Even space which should have been employed for roads was given over to food production and thousands of people were born, lived, and died in boats on the river. Some water buffalo waded in the mud of the rice fields. Some horses worked the water treadmills. But human labor predominated. Overpopulation and destitution went hand in hand. In this land, which Marco Polo once described as a pleasant haven of silk, spices, and fine manners, all the hypothetical Malthusian bogies had come true. Foreigners at the international and French settlements of Shanghai enjoyed much the same life as at home. Their hotels were the same, they met the same sort of people, dressed in the same clothes, ate the same meals. In fact, it was difficult to get Chinese food unless you knew exactly where to go. They came in droves, herded together, most of them bored to death. You could see they had appropriated the best of everything, the houses with gardens and walls, the clean rickshaws, the well-fed boys, the prosperity. The Chinese, in their own country, lived on what was left, which was practically nothing. They huddled wistfully on the fringes, horrible, abject, dirty. 
it amazed me to see that Americans, French, and English could be so near and yet close their eyes to the wretched degrading conditions of devastating squalor in the native quarters. Once, while a missionary was guiding me through the Chinese city, we noted a crowd, children included, gathered in curiosity around a leper woman. She was on the ground, sighing and breathing heavily. Nobody offered to help her. Maybe she's dying, said my companion. Just then, the woman gave a fearful groan and took a baby from under her rags. She knew what to do, manipulated her thighs and abdomen, got the afterbirth, bit the cord with her teeth, put the baby aside, turned over, and rested. No trace of emotion showed on the faces of the watchers. In their respective countries, Europeans would have made an effort to improve such conditions, but here they seem to have lost many of their former standards and qualities of character and conscience. It was said that China, psychologically speaking, swallowed up the morals of those who came to reside there. One young American secretary related to me the joys of living in this section of the Orient. She said her salary was far smaller than any she would have received in the United States, but her comfort, on the other hand, far exceeded what she could have had in Boston at double her present wages. Among them, she mentioned her rickshaw boy, who cost her only five dollars a month, out of which he had to support himself and his enormous family. During the three years he had been working for her, she had never raised his pay, nor did she ever expect to. He dared make no request, because in China it was almost impossible to get a job by oneself. When a servant was dismissed, he faced practical starvation. I really formed a bad impression of people who wanted to live in China because of the cheapness of its luxuries. The Grand Hotel was elegantly appointed, but the boys who served in the rooms did not seem friendly in their hearts towards any foreigners. Hostility was percolating throughout the country. Deep in the Chinese mind lay the memory of many invasions, of the Boxer Rebellion, and the intrusion of businessmen, and particularly missionaries. In Shanghai, the American missionaries dominated Chinese education, such as it was. I was surprised to find families of eight or ten children the rule, rather than the exception among them. Their salaries were raised with each new infant, and that may have been the reason. Nevertheless, there were many who wanted birth control information. When they learned of my presence, they called on the telephone, sent cards, came to see me. But apparently apprehensive of criticism, they took me, if possible, into a secluded room, or, if we had to meet in a public place, backed me into a corner and stood in front to conceal the fact they were talking with me. They acted as though they were turning up their coat collars so that they should not be recognized. The only method of family limitation known to the poor Chinese was infanticide of baby girls by suffocation or drowning. The missionaries were cooperating with the government, which had enacted a law forbidding the practice. They went from home to home to see whether any woman were pregnant. If one were obviously so, her name was jotted down in a notebook for a call soon after birth was due. At the same time, both father and mother were informed of the severe penalty they would incur unless the baby itself or a doctor's certificate of death from natural causes were produced. After two years' work, 95% of pregnant mothers showed either their babies or good reasons for not doing so. But the Chinese had so low a margin of subsistence 
that if the law forbade them to dispose of one child, another was starved out. Sometimes two little girls had to be sold to keep one boy alive. In dire necessity, even he might have to be parted with to some sonless man who wanted to ensure ancestor worship. Because the elder girls could begin to help in the fields or become servants in some rich landowner's household, usually it was the three- and four-year-olds who were turned over to brothels. There they stayed until mature enough to be set to working out their indenture. If they ever tried unsuccessfully to find freedom, the proprietors might beat them unmercifully, sometimes even breaking their legs so that they could not walk, much less ever run away again. When infanticide was stopped, the corresponding increase in sing-song girls making their living by prostitution was almost immediately evident. It was estimated Shanghai had a hundred thousand. Many were Eurasians, the results of unions with white men who were in Shanghai on small salaries as representatives of foreign business firms. I glimpsed some of the Chinese women who had been bought as housekeepers and mistresses as well, saying goodbye at the train to their American or English masters summoned home. Desiring to see the worst of the city, I went to the prostitute quarter in company with Mr. Blackstone, a missionary from the Door of Hope, a house of refuge for escaping girls. In Shanghai, as in Tokyo, we found in the Japanese section soft low lights and an undercurrent of music in the air. The inmates were fully grown, gay and hearty. The interiors were immaculate and restrained in their decoration. The streets were swarming with sailors who apparently preferred this district to the depressingly dark and gloomy Chinese one nearby. Here and there, the Chinese prostitutes could be seen through the open doorways, heavily rouged, gowned in vivid colors, limbed like posters against the meanness of the background, their frail, slight bodies at the service of anyone who came. Each took her turn upon a stool outside, using her few words of English to attract the sailor trade. I thought I would never recover from the shock of seeing American men spending their evenings at such places with what were obviously children. In one house, we found half a dozen girls, looking much younger than their theoretical fifteen, seated on hard benches around a room not more than six feet by nine, a little one holding high a lamp so that we should not trip and fall, escorted us to her cubicle, which had only a bed for furniture. A chair was brought in for me. Mr. Blackstone began to talk to her in her own dialect. Why had she come? Too much baby home, no chow. She said she was sixteen, and had been there since she was twelve. Why, she can't be a day over ten, I expostulated. The child was visibly frightened, aghast at her own loquacity. We might be from the government. When we had at last gained her confidence, however, she responded eagerly to this unusual sympathetic contact, talking freely about herself, the long time it took to pay herself out, the precariousness and physical fatigue of her calling. Some days she had no visitors, but when a ship was in, maybe as many as ten or twelve a night. She seemed as old as the ages in her knowledgeableness. No want baby, she told us. Yet her poor little frame had the immaturity of fruit picked green and left to shrivel. We gave her money and left in spite of her urgent and kind invitation to stay. All sing-song girls were not necessarily prostitutes. Most hotels hired them to entertain guests. Only their lips were made up. 
their faces remaining pale. They wore flowers in their hair, and although not so soft-voiced as the geisha, had greater independence. Certainly their weird, shrill songs, accompanied by the tinkle of a lute, were not attractive to Western ears. Echoes of my visit to Japan had permeated throughout the colony of Japanese, who aimed to give me an extra cordial welcome, trying their best to make up for what they thought had been an unpleasant experience in their country. I had not realized the power of ancient feudalism over the Japanese woman until I met her away from home, where she blossomed into an intelligent, outspoken human being. I noticed she expressed herself much more frankly in the presence of men. But underneath the conversation, I often sensed a propaganda which had resulted in deep prejudice. From the horrible stories you heard of the savagery of the Chinese, you received the impression all were cannibals. Since my plans to include China in my itinerary had been made so late, I had few letters of introduction there. Consequently, to my regret, I did not see many Chinese women. I had not expected to do much speaking and had had very little press in Peking. Dr. Hu Shi, however, had arranged for me to meet about 15 newspaper men and women in Shanghai. We sipped our tea, nibbled our cakes, and then they began to ask questions taking down the answers with the utmost care. They wanted to set forth the pros and cons of birth control in their own vernacular, but unfortunately could not reach the illiterate masses. They asked me to speak at the Family Reformation Association, an organization which was under missionary auspices. The rules were no smoking, no drinking, no gambling. Its membership, therefore, remained small. The young woman who interpreted paragraph by paragraph had just returned from America, but did not prove the expert her traveling had indicated. The chairman said I was to give both theory and practice, but when I came to the latter, my translator's courage took flight entirely. She whispered, I'll get a doctor to say that. I gave up and switched to something simpler. My audience, however, knew without her assistance what I had been trying to convey and was much diverted by her predicament. Of all lands, China needed knowledge on how to control her numbers. The incessant fertility of her millions spread like a plague well-wishing foreigners who had gone there with their own moral codes to save her babies from infanticide, her people from pestilence, had actually increased her problem. To contribute to famine funds and the support of missions was like trying to sweep back the sea with a broom. China represented the final act in an international tragedy of overpopulation, seeming to prove that the eminence of a country could not be measured by numbers any more than by industrial expansion, large standing armies, or invincible navies. If its sons and daughters left for the generations to come a record of immortal poetry, art, and philosophy, then it was a great nation and had attained the only immortality worth striving for. But China, once the fountainhead of wisdom, had been brought to the dust by superabundant breeding. This was my conclusion when at last we were back again in the modern age on the American ship Silver State, bound for Hong Kong. We had comfort, hot water, baths, heard the softness of the little chimes as the steward went through the corridors announcing meals. It was almost with a sense of awe that I asked for any service. After being some time in the Orient, you were a bit embarrassed by having an American wait on you. Soon, however, the plumbers, the carpenters, the painters who kept the vessel trim, 
the sailors who swabbed down the decks at night, gave me a feeling that in the western countries we had gone far towards dignifying manual labor. End of chapter 27「Chapter Twenty Eight of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight: The World is Much the Same Everywhere. A favorite sales promotion method of astrologers is to send partial readings to people whose names appear in the papers, in the hope of piquing their curiosity to the point of demanding fuller details regarding their future lives and conduct. From time to time I used to receive these and paid no attention, but just before I had sailed from California, a friend of birth control had sent me one based upon arrests and prison. This forecast told me I would have a great deal of difficulty in starting, and that on a certain day in May the same signs would prevail over my house as at the town hall meeting, that I should, therefore, be prepared for police interference. While packing in Shanghai, I was looking through my briefcase and happened to note that the date was one on which the Silver State would still be at sea. She was not due at Hong Kong until the next day. I laughed to myself and said, here's where I prove it wrong. As it turned out, however, the ship was ahead of her schedule and arrived in Hong Kong twelve hours early. We were steaming up the long reach towards the Kowloon Piers, when, to my utter surprise, the immigration officer, who had come on board, handed me a notice instructing me to visit the chief of police. Is this a special invitation for me, or is everybody included? Only for you, madame, was the smiling response. The harbor was crowded with junks and fishing boats. Children in sampans were holding out nets for whatever might come overside, fishing up each bit of refuse from the water. Adjoining ships were being coaled by women coolies, hundreds of them, their faces strained and bodies stringy, as though made up entirely of tendons. They carried their two baskets on bamboo poles across their shoulders and clambered like ants in their bare feet over the barges, not singing as the men coolies of the north, but making much walla walla, jabbering and shouting. After settling Grant in a hotel, I took a chair from around the corner, because police headquarters was part way up the peak, and rickshaws could not negotiate the steep ascent. The chief was not there. I inquired whether anything were wrong with my passport. Since my British visa was perfectly correct, they said there must be some mistake. They had no information about any summons. I left my card. The next day, the chief called at my hotel, but we missed each other because I was out with Grant ordering his first pair of long trousers. When I returned, I found a calling card and another request to come to headquarters that afternoon. Again I obeyed, and again I found no chief and no message for me. I left another card, and the officials whom I had seen before laughingly reiterated they still knew of no complaints. Well, I'm going tomorrow morning. If the chief wants anything, he'll have to come to the hotel. He never did. Once more we were off, this time on a British liner. The sea was smooth, the air cool. It was the ideal ocean voyage I had always longed for. I was relaxed and enervated, but it was good to be so. I had nothing to do all day but sit in the glorious breezes on deck and watch the romping children, 
about fifty of whom were on board. Many had been born in the Orient and were accompanying Pater, who was going home on leave. One little boy might come tearing by, pursued by another, both followed by anxious Chinese amas, thin, dark, slick-haired, wearing glossy black trousers and coats buttoned down the side. They seemed in constant distress over the antics of their energetic charges. When we dropped anchor at Singapore, agitation and excitement were again manifest among the inspectors at the sight of my passport. I was politely asked to stand by while they consulted, and then was ushered off the ship to an upstairs office where I was questioned by a pleasant young Englishman as to my intentions in going to India. But I'm not planning to stop in India. Lectures by you are announced in Bombay and Calcutta. This is the first I've heard of it, I assured him. But if I were to go, would there be any objection? That would depend on the subject of your lectures. I'm interested in only one subject. He pressed a button. Miraculously, almost like a scene from a mystery play, and as though everything had been rehearsed in advance, an attendant entered and placed on the desk a large, closely typewritten paper. Am I on the blacklist? Not exactly, but you said you were interested in only one subject. Then what about this? He actually read me from that document details of a small reception I had given five years before in my own apartment in New York for Agnes Smedley after her release on bail. For a moment, I was speechless with amazement. Then I ejaculated, Why shouldn't I be interested when she was arrested for a cause that is my own? Besides, you must remember the charges were later dismissed. Then what about serving on the Committee for the Deb's Defense and for the Political Prisoner's Defense? He mentioned other gatherings I had attended during that parlor meeting era, such as when Mary Knobloch had had Jim Larkin talk on Irish Home Rule or Lajpat Rai the Indian sociologist, express anti-British tendencies. Wherever my name had appeared on the stationery of any committee, he had it on his record. My public life was there spread out, showing how careful was British espionage. I brought forth from my arsenal some of my most trusty arguments, and the official ultimately agreed that if the vast millions of India wanted birth control, he was all for my going there and would visa my passport. However, since I did not propose to include it in my trip, the discussion was purely academic. Although Singapore, when we reached it, seemed to combine so many nationalities that it was like Europe, America, and the Orient all mixed together, Malays, whose land it once had been, appeared to be in the minority, and their dialect little used. I could not escape that fatal horoscope, because when their language was described to me as easy and simple, the example given was mata. By itself it meant I. But mata mata in addition to being the plural, also meant policemen, who were the eyes of the government, and mata mata glap meant secret eyes, hence detectives. How Europeans made themselves understood in Singapore was a wonder to me. The Chinese rickshaw boys apparently comprehended no tongue, nor knew where any place was. You stepped into a rickshaw, and pointed to where you thought your hotel was, praying your finger was extended in the right direction. If you did not point, he ran in any direction of the compass. Even so, 
at the first corner he was inclined to turn into a more shady street. After a while, since he seemed to be arriving nowhere, you spoke to him sharply, and he pulled up to a traffic officer who told him where to go. Still pointing and saying, Hotel! loudly, you eventually were delivered in front of the door by a much-pleased coolie, grinning from ear to ear at his own cleverness. The poor fellows were so cheerful and willing that you could not help smiling, too. The weather continued balmy to Penang, to Ceylon, to Aden. I had been dreading the heat of the Red Sea, but the passage was surprisingly cool. The facing wind was really enjoyable. At Cairo, where we made a longer pause, Grant came down with dysentery, and his temperature shot to a 104 degrees. A Czechoslovakian doctor spent three nights with him, but could not reduce the fever. Each morning when I rose early to act as nurse, I stumbled over about six natives, our own guide Ali among them, kneeling on prayer rugs in front of his door. All the fortune-tellers had said a death was pending in Shepherd's Hotel, and were assuming he would be the victim. The fourth day, after the doctor had gone to his office, I ordered a dishpan full of ice and sponged Grant off with the frosty water. Two hours later, his temperature was normal, and he began to show signs of recovering. I never divulged that cold bath to the doctor. Ali was a handsome, dark-faced Arab, with large, luminous eyes and fine-cut features, which made American ones seem crude and weak. In comparison, wearing his long black robe to the ground and topped by a red fez, he used to come to his duties bearing great armfuls of flowers from his mother. We held lengthy conversations. Have you been married? I asked. Yes, five times. Weren't any of them happy? He began enumerating. The first one had been young and inexperienced. She had not been properly brought up, and did not know her position as his wife. Although she had cost him a hundred dollars, he had dispatched her to her parents, because she was too independent. Number two had not been clean, and had been too old for his mother to train. He had made amicable arrangements with her father for her return and had lost no money on this transaction. Number three had been sickly, and a great expense. She also had gone back. Number four had not loved him. It had been shortly evident her heart was with another man, and the agreement had been broken by mutual consent. Number five, the latest, he had sent home, because she would not wait on his mother. Why should she? Madam, my mother carried me in her belly for nine months. Should I have a wife who would not work for her after that? He was now casting about for his sixth. Ali haunted our footsteps, and in order to collect his five percent commission on all our purchases, noted every place we went. Merchants made a social affair of their customers' calls. You went to a perfume shop in the bazaar. The proprietor said, yes, sat down, and handed you a gold-tipped aromatic cigarette. He lighted it for you, took out a pile of letters from a bag, and opened them for your inspection. They were testimonials that a certain gentleman had sent similar cigarettes to Hartford, Connecticut, or Pelham, New York. Of course, you bought some. Then a cup of Persian tea was brought you, and you wanted some of that. At last you recalled that you had come for a tar of roses. By this time he had sensed your aura and knew what you could pay. He was willing humbly to mention the price. Our tour had been a wonderful experience for Grant. 
he had studied the Baedekers, planned our trips when we were coming to a new city or country, looked into their histories, and although he was only thirteen, shown a highly awake and intelligent attitude towards everything we had seen. He had had all sorts of wares hurled at him, ostrich feathers, fans, baskets, sapphires, scarabs. He was satiated with strange sights and lore, Buddha's temple of the tooth at candy, caravans of bullocks, the English club at tiny Port Swettenham in Malaya, the enormous porters of Egypt who picked up trunks as though they were handbags, women veiled and women unveiled, mosques, the Coptic church where Joseph and Mary were supposed to have hidden Jesus from Herod, the date trees along the road to Memphis, the underground temple of the bull, the remains of an old proud world at Alexandria, where Cleopatra had once held court, the primitive fairy raft, on which we had crossed the Nile to see the place where Moses had been found in the bulrushes, the wonderful ride, weird and lovely, across the Sahara to view the pyramids and sphinx. On his way to Switzerland, he had traveled by gondola along the canals of Venice, had been trailed through the art galleries of Milan. After a few weeks at Montreux, Grant was fully recovered, but he was now homesick for the first time since we had left new york eight months before all he wanted was to see tilden play in the tennis matches at wimbledon and then go home because i did not think he should miss the reception which h g was giving i had him fly across the channel to london and afterwards appreciating his longing to be among his own age and kind, I shipped him off on the maiden voyage of the Majestic to a camp in the Poconos. By the time he was back at Petty, he was up with his class, his mind vastly enriched, and able to approach his studies in a more mature manner. I have never regretted taking him with me. I myself remained in London, for the Fifth International Neo-Malthusian and Birth Control Conference to be held July 11th through the 14th. The inclusion of the words birth control was a definite concession on the part of the Neo-Malthusians to the new trend of thought. It was a delight to be amid conditions where tolerance reigned and the atmosphere was unblighted by legal restrictions. The scientific candor of the discussion was reported in the newspapers with sincerity and sobriety. John Maynard Keynes, who had become famous almost overnight as the result of his book, The Consequences of the Peace, presided at one of the afternoon meetings. Later, I had lunch with him. He was tall and well-built, with clear, cold blue eyes a fine shapely head, brow and face, a brilliant bearing and brilliant intellect. I was impressed by the fact he did not smile, because he gave each question of yours so much consideration he seemed constantly perplexed. But when he once started to talk, you knew he had already put aside the thing as having been solved and gone on in advance. You were probably more puzzled at his next question than he at yours. In the two years that elapsed before I saw Keynes again, he had married Lydia Lopakova of the Russian ballet. He had become an entirely different person. His serious mien and countenance had been changed to a buoyant, joyous happiness. His knowledge of the problems of money, population, and economics were of a nature far above the grasp of an ordinary intelligence. Yet, in his conversation with his wife, he always implied she knew the subject as thoroughly as he, and answered her queries as though their minds were together. He was the only Englishman, perhaps the only man, I ever knew to do this. 
Unlike Lydia Lopakova, most women had a strenuous battle trying to prove themselves equal to men. This marriage conflict was inseparable from modern life. I could sense it frequently when coming in contact with a married couple. On her part, the years of rebellion, and on his of trying to put her down as a weakling. Sentiment has extolled the young love which promises to last through eternity. But love is a growth mingled with a succession of experiences. It is as foolish to promise to love forever as to promise to live forever. To every woman there comes the apprehension that marriage may not fulfill her highest expectations and dreams. If in the heart of a girl entering this covenant for the first time there are doubts, even in the slightest degree, they are doubled and trebled in their intensity when she meditates a second marriage. J. Noah H. Slee, whom I had known for some time, was what the papers called a staid pillar of finance. He was South African-born, but had made his fortune in the United States. In customs and exteriors, we were as far apart as the Poles. He was a conservative in politics and a churchman, whereas I voted for Norman Thomas, and instead of attending Orthodox services, preferred to go to the opera. An old-fashioned type of man, J. N. yearned to protect any type of woman who would cling. Complications, therefore, confronted us. I had been free for nearly ten years, and, for as long, had been waging a campaign to free other women. I was startled by the thought of joining my life to that of one who objected to his wife's coming home alone in a taxi at night, or assumed she could not buy her own railroad tickets or check her baggage. Nevertheless, despite his foibles, he was generous in wanting me to continue my unfinished work and was undeterred by my warning that he would always have to be kissing me goodbye in depots or waving farewell as the gangplank went up. I had to consider also that I had two boys to be educated and that children were much more to a woman than to a man. Yet I knew he would be kind and understanding with them. Furthermore, he had faith both in individuals and in humanity. His naive appearance of hardness was actually not borne out, in fact. He kept his promises and hated debts. We attached the same importance to the spirit of integrity. Hundreds of people who scarcely knew me were delighted when the news of our marriage eventually became public. Within one week, letters began to arrive from all over the United States and Canada. One man wrote he had helped me get up a meeting at San Francisco, and now needed a printing press. Would I mail him the trifling sum of three thousand dollars? Another brought to mind I had had dinner at his home when lecturing in his city, and now that he had painted enough pictures to hold an exhibit, would I finance it? Dozens of ministers, old men, old ladies, writers, sculptors wanted me to set them up in business, musical concert work, bookshops, recalling the time they had taken me in cars to meetings or that I had slept in their beds. Parents requested me to send their children to schools, to Europe, to sanatoriums, heaven knows what. I never knew people could need so much. I longed with all the desire in me to make out a check for every lack and wave a magic wand and say, so be it. But all I could do was write back that I had no more wealth than before. My husband's was his own, and I still required as many contributions to birth control as ever. I had not wanted the worry or trouble of handling money, nor do I want it today. 
The things I valued then I value now, not for what they cost, but for what they are. To me, dollars and cents are only messengers to do my bidding, and nothing more. To use them properly and get results is my responsibility. When I asked J.N., why do you lock things up? He replied, I always do, don't you? Never. I haven't anything worth locking up. That is the way I still feel. It seemed so final when again I started a home, but there had been a gathering loneliness in my life, not seeing the children except on holidays, never having time to spend with old friends or to make new ones, and with such rich opportunities constantly offering themselves. I knew very well, however, what sort of house I wanted, a simple one, something like Shelley's in Sussex. In 1923, with stones gathered from the fields, we built a house near Fishkill, New York, cradled in the Dutchess County Hills, beside a little lake. On it we tried out swans, but they did not work. Although they looked picturesque, they were too messy. So we changed to ducks and stocked the water with bass. I planned a blue garden, which grew up and down and threw itself about the house and altered with the seasons. Pepper, a cocker spaniel puppy of two months, came the first year and bounced and leaped around us as we walked through the woods or rode horseback over the hills. Willow Lake was only sixty miles from New York. I could make out the menus for a week ahead, leave directions for the gardening, be in my office fairly early, and back again for dinner at night. Later, for working purposes, we built a studio among the treetops on the edge of a cliff from which I could look far off across the majestic valley of the Hudson. Domesticity, which I had once so scorned, had its charms after all. End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29 While the Doctors Consult. After coming back from around the world, I found nothing had been done about the Tenth Street Clinic, which I had expected to be in operation. No members of the Academy of Medicine had come forth to back Dr. de Vilbis, and I had paid the rent for the last twelve months while vainly waiting. Now I gave it up and decided to start afresh. The more I had studied, the more clearly I had recognized that it was not possible to advise a standard contraceptive for all women any more than it was possible to prescribe one set of eyeglasses for all conditions of sight. Only upon examination and careful checkup could you determine the most suitable method. No detailed statistics had ever been kept, except at Brownsville, and those case histories had never been returned to me by the police. I wanted to collect at least a thousand such records for a scientific survey before any opposition could interfere with the plan. Many women were still coming to me personally for information at 104 Fifth Avenue. The best thing to do was have a woman doctor right there to take care of them, a quiet way to begin. It was hard to locate one foot loose and free. I could have no shying or running off at the first indication of trouble. In making inquiries, I heard of Dr. Dorothy Bakker, who held a New York City license, though she was at present in the Public Health Service of Georgia. This single, cordial, and enthusiastic young woman knew practically nothing about birth control technique, but was willing to learn. Difficulty 
was that she wanted five thousand dollars a year. At first, this appeared an almost unsurmountable obstacle. Here was just the person I had been looking for, but it seemed beyond my power to raise so large a sum. I was loaded with the financial weight of the review and the league. That organization had been admitted as a membership corporation and hence could not secure a license to conduct a clinic, which in New York was synonymous with a dispensary. No clinic, therefore, could be included in its budget. It would remain a department of the League by courtesy only, being actually my private undertaking. Where could I find someone to donate such an enormous amount? Then I remembered Clinton Chance, a young manufacturer of Birmingham, who had prospered exceedingly both before and during the war. He and his wife, Janet, had become good friends of mine during my 1920 visit to England. Having felt the need of a more sound and fundamental outlet for his riches than that provided by charity, he had come to see that birth control information was far better for his employees than a dole at the birth of every new baby. He was not in any sense a professional philanthropist, but only wanted to help them be self-sufficient. Clinton had once offered me money to set the birth control movement going in England, but I had refused then because England had enough co-workers who were handling the situation well, and furthermore, my place was in the United States. He had then said to me, I won't give you a contribution for regular current expenses, but if ever you see the necessity for some new project which will advance the general good, call on me. Now I cabled Clinton at length, explaining my need. He promptly answered, Yes, go ahead, and soon arrived an anonymous thousand pounds to cover Dr. Bacher's salary for the first year. I made out a contract for two. She was to come in January 1923, and we were to shoulder the risks and responsibilities together. Even to choose a name for the venture was not easy. I had been steadily advertising the term clinic to America for so long that it had become familiar, and moreover, to poor people it meant that little or no payment was required. But the use of the word itself was legally impossible, and I was not certain that the same might not be true of center or bureau. I wanted it at least to imply the things that clinic meant as I had publicized it, and also to include the idea of research. Finally, one of the doors of the two rooms adjoining the League offices, readily accessible to me, and to the woman who came for advice, was lettered clinical research. It was still a clinic in my mind, though frankly an experiment, because I was not even sure women would accept the methods we had to offer them. We started immediately keeping the records. Dr. Boker wrote down the history of the case on a large card, numbering it to correspond with a smaller one containing the patient's name and address. Each applicant she suspected of a bad heart, tuberculosis, kidney trouble, or any ailment which made pregnancy dangerous, she informed regarding contraception and advised medical care at once. In our first annual report, which attracted much attention, all our cases were analyzed. We said, here is the proof, 900 women with definite statistics concerning their ages, physical and mental conditions, and economic status. As time went on, I became less and less pleased with Dr. Bacher's system. She had no follow-up on patients, and I wished the clinic to be like a business in the thoroughness of its routine. 
I refused to approve methods as a hundred percent reliable until there had been not merely one, but three checks on each woman who had been to the clinic. To begin with, she was to return two or three days after her initial visit. She usually did that. But if she did not come back inside three months, then a social worker in our own employ should be sent to call on her. Finally, she was to be examined once a year. Dr. Bakker did not see, eye to eye with me, that this was the only way to put the work on a sound scientific basis of facts, and we agreed to part company in December of the second year. Dr. Hannah M. Stone, a fine young woman from the Lying In Hospital, volunteered to take Dr. Bakker's place without salary. Her gaze was clear and straight, her hair was black, her mouth gentle and sweet. She had a sympathetic response to mothers in distress and a broad attitude towards life's many problems. When the lying-in hospital later found she had connected herself with our clinic, it gave her a choice between remaining with us and resigning from the staff. She resigned. Her courageous stand indicated staunch friendship and the disinterested selflessness essential for the successful operation of the clinic. These qualities have kept her with us all this time, one of the most beloved and loyal workers that one could ever hope for. The clinic could serve New York, but its practical value outside was restricted, and I was always seeking some way of remedying this. We took the preliminary step in Illinois, where no laws existed against clinics. I had arranged a conference in Chicago at the Drake Hotel, October 1923, the first of a regional series. Mrs. Benjamin Carpenter and Dr. Rachel Yaros, who had been with Jane Adams at Hull House, had to obtain a court decision before Dr. Herman Bundesen, Commissioner of Health, would issue a license for the second clinic in the United States. Meanwhile, between 1921 and 1926, I received over a million letters from mothers requesting information. From 1923 on, a staff of three to seven was constantly busy just opening and answering them. Despite the limitations of the writers and their lack of education, they revealed themselves strangely conscious of the responsibilities of the maternal function. Childbearing is hazardous, even when carried out with the advantages of modern hygiene and parental care. The upper middle classes are likely to assume all confinements are surrounded by the same attention given the births of their own babies. They do not comprehend it is still possible in these United States for a woman to milk six cows at five o'clock in the morning and bring a baby into the world at nine. The terrific hardships of the farm mother are not in the least degree lessened by maternity. If she and her infant survive, it is only to face these hardships anew and with additional complications. In the midst of an era of science and fabulous wealth reaching out for enlightenment to advance our civilization, with millionaires tossing their fortunes into libraries and hospitals and laboratories to discover the secrets and causes of life, here at the doorstep of everyone was this tragic, scarcely recognized condition. It was an easy and even a pleasant task to reduce human problems to numerical figures in black and white on charts and graphs, but infinitely more difficult to suggest concrete solutions. The reasoning of learned theologians and indefatigable statisticians seemed academic and anemically intellectual if brought face to face with the actuality of suffering. When they confronted me with arguments, 
this dim, far-off chorus of pain began to resound anew in my ears. Sensitive women of our clerical staff were constantly breaking down in health under the nervous depression caused by the fact that we had so little knowledge to give. One who went to Chicago to help rehabilitate soldiers wrote me, I'm feeling much better. These men, who have lost a leg or arm come in, apparently disqualified forever, but something is being done about them, and it is happy work, not forlorn like yours. To prove that the story could be told by the mothers themselves, ten thousand letters, with the assistance of Mary Boyd, were selected, and these again cut to five hundred. Eventually, this historical record appeared in book form as Motherhood in Bondage. Whenever I am discouraged, I go to those letters as to a wellspring which sends me on reheartened. They make me realize with increasing intensity that whoever kindles a spark of hope in the breast of another cannot shirk the duty of keeping it alive. Woman and the New Race, which sold at first for two dollars, had a distribution of 250,000 copies, and it made my heart ache to know that poor women who could ill afford it were buying the book and not finding there what they sought. To the best of my ability, I try to supply general information, but the only way of extending genuine aid was to persuade doctors to give it professionally. By a happy chance, I met Dr. James F. Cooper, tall, blonde, distinguished, a fine combination of missionary and physician, who left no stone unturned when a patient came to him, but devoted his whole attention to her. Everything in her life was important to him. He was recently back from Fu Chao, China, and was establishing himself in Boston as a gynecologist. Since he was thoroughly convinced of the vital necessity for birth control, and could talk technically to his profession and interpret to the layman as well, my husband pledged his salary and expenses for two years, and I induced him to associate himself with us as medical director to go forth and try to convince the doctors throughout the country that contraceptive advice would save a large proportion of their women patients. In January 1925, Dr. Cooper started on a tour, which covered nearly all the states in the Union. In the course of the two years, he delivered more than 700 lectures. Occasionally, he was suspected of ulterior motives, of attempting to advertise the products he recommended, but this did not sway him from his persistence where he found laxity on the part of medical organizations, he spoke to lay associations, which applied pressure on their own physicians, demanding information. As a result of this trip, doctors really began to awake to the problem of contraception. And when it was ended, we had the names of some 20,000 from Maine to California who had consented to instruct patients referred to them. At this point began the huge and difficult process of decentralization, so that the New York office need no longer be a clearinghouse. Each request which lay outside the pale of the Cooper influence required voluminous correspondence. One letter, enclosing a stamped return address envelope, was mailed to the woman, asking her to furnish us the name of her doctor. We then wrote him to inquire whether he would give her information, and offer to send supplies if she could not afford them. If he said yes, we notified her to that effect. If he said no, we gave some other doctor in her vicinity an opportunity to cooperate. We were immediately confronted with the situation that even willing doctors had little to recommend. 
Literally thousands of women reported that such ineffective methods had been tendered them that they refused to pay. We ourselves did not have a great deal, and this put us in a weak position. The acceptance of the theory was ahead of the means of practicing it. The jelly I had found in Friedrichshaven had turned out to be too expensive because it was made with a chinosol and Irish moss base, and the price of the former was prohibitive in preparing it for poor women. Dr. Stone and Dr. Cooper, therefore, devised a formula for a jelly with a lactic acid and glycerin base, which was within our means. Most of their cases, however, were sufficiently grave for them not to feel justified in using it alone experimentally. Consequently, they took the precaution of having a double safeguard by combining the chemical contraceptive with the mechanical, jelly with pessary, which proved 98% efficacious. At this time, we could not import diaphragms directly. Although I had given various friends going to Germany and England the mission of bringing them in, this could not be done in sufficient quantity. Furthermore, since bootlegging supplies could not continue indefinitely, I had to find out how they could legally be made here. Two young men came to help in whatever way was most necessary. Herbert Simons, who had been in advertising, began to investigate the possibility that some recognized rubber company should make our supplies. When one and all were fearful, he and Guy Moyston, who did some publicity for us, concluded they would form the Holland Rantos Company, selling only to physicians or on prescription. They spent their own time and thousands of dollars personally on research, in the end perfecting a quality of rubber that could stand the variations of climate in the United States hot houses and cold winters, Florida dampness and western dryness. Meanwhile, Julius Schmid, an old established manufacturer, had been importing from his own concern in Germany a few diaphragms, but only on a modest scale because he did not want to run afoul of the Comstock law. As soon as he saw a potential market in the medical profession, he fetched from the fatherland several families who had been making molds there, gave them places to live in, and set up a little center, expanding gradually until eventually he sold more contraceptive supplies than any firm in the world. But this was all in the future. Soon after, we had developed an organization in which economists, biologists, and other scientists could be articulate, they came into the movement. Dr. S. Adolphus Knopf, a tuberculosis specialist, who had been one of the first to greet me when I came out of jail, never missed an opportunity to contribute articles to medical journals and to write letters. Professor Edward Allsworth Ross's books continued to popularize the sociological and economic aspects. Professor E. M. East of the Bussey Institute of Harvard University published a study of population titled Mankind at the Crossroads, which obtained wide circulation. His one-time pupil, Dr. Raymond Pearl of Johns Hopkins, was carrying on the same work showing exactly how much food a certain number of acres could produce at what cost. Universities generally began to show an interest. Students wrote, asking for scientific and historical data upon which to base their theses. Young people in colleges partly because their ideas were not yet biased, offered a fallow field for my personal campaign of education through lecturing. I particularly enjoyed their quickness and alertness and their interludes of comic relief. 
Nowhere has this combination been more apparent than in a recent visit to Colgate University. Four boys met me at the station, and somehow or other we all squeezed into an automobile which shortly deposited me at the home of one of the professors for tea and to meet the faculty. This is house party night, he told me. The girls are here, and most of the boys won't get to bed until daylight. We'll have to rout them out to hear you at chapel tomorrow. He added that during his twelve years in the university, no woman had spoken on that platform. Have they prejudices against women speakers? Oh, no, no. There's just no subject a woman can deal with better than a man. Well, I thought, if the boys will all have been out to parties, and I'm the first woman speaker, here is a challenge. No sociology or dull population figures for them from me. The next morning, determined to make them take notice, I ransacked my bag for my smartest dress, adjusted my lipstick, and carefully set my hat at an angle. Nevertheless, I was a bit ill at ease. My anxiety was not allayed when Norman Himes, professor of sociology, said, now, Mrs. Sanger, we probably shan't be able to hear you in this hall. The acoustics are very bad. They can hardly hear me, and I have a big voice. This was even less encouraging. I felt I was likely to be the last as well as the first woman at Colgate. However, I replied bravely, I can speak up, and we can have some wave if they can't hear me. Anyhow, there probably won't be many. Why can't they be moved up front? Yes, that's what we'd better do. We went in to find the chapel jammed. Some of the students were standing in the door, others against the walls. Professor Himes introduced me at the top of his lungs. Louder, louder, the boys waved their hands. The more he tried to make himself heard, the more restless they became. When I stood, however, they had to listen if they were to hear me. There was no waving, no calling. They roared with laughter and clapped at everything I said. This seemed fine, but I suspected that I could not have really made so profound an impression as to deserve so much applause. Someone afterwards commented to Professor Himes, we've never seen the boys so appreciative. Oh, he remarked, they thought if they could keep Mrs. Sanger talking long enough, they wouldn't have to go on to their examinations. From the time I started lecturing in 1916, I have appeared in many places, halls, churches, women's clubs, homes, theaters. I have had many types of audiences, cotton workers, churchmen, liberals, socialists, scientists, clubmen, and fashionable, philanthropically-minded women. Once in Detroit, Mrs. William McGraw, Sr. had organized a public meeting and luncheon at the Statler Hotel. When I arrived, I encountered a situation which might well have embarrassed a less dowdy hostess. She had invited a dozen of the most prominent women in the city to sit at the speaker's table. Mrs. A. had asked, Will Mrs. B. sit there also? Mrs. B. had inquired, Will Mrs. C. be next to me? Each wanted social support. Mrs. McGraw had blandly refused to tell them. Consequently, not one had accepted. Although five hundred came, only two places were set at the great banquet table on the platform. Mrs. McGraw and I ate in solitary splendor with nothing but the floral decorations for company. All the world over, in Penang and Skagway, in El Paso and Helsingsfors, 
I have found women's psychology and the matter of childbearing essentially the same, no matter what the class, religion, or economic status. Always to me, any aroused group was a good group, and therefore I accepted an invitation to talk to the women's branch of the Ku Klux Klan at Silver Lake, New Jersey, one of the weirdest experiences I had in lecturing. My letter of instruction told me what train to take, to walk from the station two blocks straight ahead, then two to the left. I would see a sedan parked in the front of a restaurant. If I wished, I could have ten minutes for a cup of coffee or bite to eat, because no supper would be served later. I obeyed orders implicitly, walked the blocks, saw the car, found the restaurant, went in and ordered some cocoa, stayed my allotted ten minutes, then approached the car hesitatingly and spoke to the driver. I received no reply. She might have been totally deaf as far as I was concerned. Mustering up my courage, I climbed in and settled back. Without a turn of the head, a smile, or a word to let me know I was right, she stepped on the self-starter. For fifteen minutes we wound around the streets. It must have been toward six in the afternoon. We took this lonely lane, and that through the woods, and an hour later pulled up in a vacant space near a body of water beside a large, unpainted, varnished building. My driver got out, talked with several other women, then said to me severely, Wait here. We will come for you. She disappeared. More cars buzzed up the dusty road into the parking place. Occasionally, men dropped wives who walked hurriedly and silently within. This went on mystically until night closed down and I was alone in the dark. A few gleams came through chinks in the window curtains. Even though it was May, I grew chillier and chillier. After three hours, I was summoned at last and entered a bright corridor filled with wraps. As someone came out of the hall, I saw through the door dim figures parading with banners and illuminated crosses. I waited another twenty minutes. It was warmer, and I did not mind so much. Eventually the lights were switched on, the audience seated itself, and I was escorted to the platform, was introduced, and began to speak. Never before had I looked into a sea of faces like these. I was sure that if I uttered one word, such as abortion, outside the usual vocabulary of these women, they would go off into hysteria. And so, my address that night had to be in the most elementary terms, as though I were trying to make children understand. In the end, through simple illustrations, I believed I had accomplished my purpose. A dozen invitations to speak to similar groups were proffered. The conversation went on and on, and when we were finally through, it was too late to return to New York. Under a curfew law, everything in Silver Lake shut at nine o'clock. I could not even send a telegram to let my family know whether I had been thrown in the river or was being held incommunicado. It was nearly one before I reached Trenton, and I spent the night in a hotel. In Brattleboro, Vermont, my audience was made up of another slice of America, honest, strong, capable housewives who made their pies and doughnuts and preserves before they came. When I had finished, there was not a murmur of commendation from the three hundred. The minister of the church, where the meeting was held, had asked me to stand beside him to say, how do you do, when they came out. They just went by, eyes straight ahead. On the telephone afterwards, however, each was asking what the other thought. The cases I had cited were typical of their own community, 
Was she referring to this one or that one, they queried. I returned two days later to lunch with a doctor and four or five social workers, and was surprised to hear the women want to start a clinic. But there wasn't any enthusiasm when I suggested it the other morning. The people around here don't express much openly. They were moved to quietness. But just the same, they are starting a clinic in Brattleboro. End of chapter 29「30 of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30. Now is the time for converse. Side by side with the clinic and education, another project had been stirring for some time in my mind. Internationalism was in the air, and I wanted that outlook brought into the movement in the United States. To this end, I made plans for the 6th International Malthusian and Birth Control Conference to be held in New York in March 1925. In the summer of 1924, I called a conference committee meeting of the League. That is, in addition to the regular board members, other supporters were invited to attend. As soon as the matter was brought up, they expostulated, You still have to ask for money to run the review. How can you pay the fares of the delegates and furnish them with hospitality? Do you know how much it will cost? Since I wished to have the conference important enough to make its mark, I replied promptly, Not less than $25,000. Have you thought of how you are going to finance it? Certainly I have. I was certain that the interest of many of our contributors extended beyond the magazine, and that they would see we now had a broader field of activity. They had given before and would give again. I knew money would come in. Any five of the outside women present could have underwritten the conference, but they objected that funds were needed for other work. One by one, they left in a hurry. The inevitable appointments were waiting for them. Their advice to the board was no conference, and the wealthy members of the board concurred. Nevertheless, I went ahead with the details of securing backers. Even the letterhead on our stationery was significant. You could tell such a lot about an organization, quality, standards, tone, from the names, often more informative than the body of the letter. My intention was to make people stand in public for what they believed in private, and at least our list of sponsors was impressive enough, a brilliant and distinguished array. The success of any conference was determined in great measure by the caliber of the men who took part in it. Results depended first upon the concept animating it, and second, as had been proved before, on the presence of an eminent figure to ornament the assemblage. I decided to see whether I could induce Lord Dawson to be our main speaker, and hoping that personal persuasion might be more efficacious than written, sailed for England in September. Havelock came up from Margate to greet me, as usual far removed from the hurly-burly of the world, aloof from the conflict of ideas which meant so much to me. Yet to talk with him again was to return to the Millet with renewed inspiration. I managed to crowd in a motor trip to Oxford, lunch at the Mitre, a walk through Brasenose and King's, and a drive back through Buckinghamshire, where the beaches were changing to bronze and russet. I felt a regretful pang that so little of my life could be lived in England. 
Unfortunately for my purposes, Lord Dawson was away shooting in the north. With some temerity, I dwelt upon the possibility of Lord Buckmaster, the former Stanley Owen, Chancellor of the Exchequer in the Asquith Coalition of 1915, who had become one of the most finished orators in the House of Lords. He had just returned from Scotland and telephoned me to suggest we exchange views. He was about to present a resolution that, under the auspices of the Ministry of Health, restrictions on birth control instruction be removed for married women who attended welfare centers. He was gathering practical information from people who had had practical experience and wanted to know how methods in the United States differed from those in England, and particularly verification of their harmlessness. When he came to my hotel one afternoon, I did not take time to mention the conference, because H.G., knowing the value of proper introductions, had arranged one of his most brilliant dinners for that very evening, or rather, he had proposed it, and Jane had arranged it. For H.G. to entertain in behalf of a cause set the seal of approval on it. Jane had invited literary luminaries and their wives, George Bernard Shaw, Arnold Bennett, Sir Arbuthnot Lane, Professor E. W. McBride of the Eugenics Education Society, Walter Salter of the League of Nations, and Lord Buckmaster. It had been my experience that personages gave little of themselves on formal occasions. So many people expected these lions to roar bravely, forgetting that they preferred to save their sparkling sallies for the pages of their books. Moreover, when the English came together for an evening, they liked to have it light and amusing. I had received much from the books of Shaw, who had advanced civilization by breaking down barriers of all sorts, now almost nothing from him personally, although he was very diverting, with funny quips upon life and America and birth control. I had by design been seated next to Lord Buckmaster, and after the meal had been in progress for perhaps half an hour, H.G. leaned over and whispered to me, Have you got him? I haven't started yet. You're no true American. You ought to work faster. You're missing out. Whereupon he focused his own attention on Lord Buckmaster, who, in answer to his direct query, regretted that the date conflicted with the opening of Parliament. Before I could realize it, the time came when I was due to sail from Southampton. Lord Dawson had just returned and could see me at three that afternoon. Promptly on the hour, his secretary ushered me into his library at Wimpole Street. A fire was burning cheerfully in the grate. A gentleman, traditionally tall and handsome, was sitting leisurely on the sofa, as though my boat train did not leave Waterloo Station at 4.30, and endless days remained in which to talk about the interesting subject of birth control. He was a grand seigneur, such as you rarely encountered in your travels, having a mind that could understand and meet any discussion with knowledge, facts, and comprehension. The approach, the surroundings, his courtesy, charm of manner, and poise proved him a great English aristocrat. He asked me about the attitude of the medical profession in the United States, desirous of knowing who had identified themselves with it. I recited my past efforts to enlist the support of the leading physicians. The minutes sped relentlessly away. I had to leave and barely caught my train. Having admired him so long from afar, I was glad to have had this brief contact, even though he was unable to attend the conference. 
I was back in New York by the end of October, and soon came a letter from Shaw cheering me with his point of view. Birth control should be advocated for its own sake, on the general ground that the difference between voluntary, irrational, uncontrolled activity is the difference between an amoeba and a man. And if we really believe that the more highly evolved creature is the better, we may as well act accordingly. As the amoeba does not understand birth control, it cannot abuse it, and therefore its state may be the more gracious. But it is also true that as the amoeba cannot write, it cannot commit forgery. Yet we teach everybody to write unhesitatingly, knowing that if we refuse to teach anything that could be abused, we should never teach anything at all. Interminable correspondence began immediately with adherents, and in many distant lands, possible delegates. I sent out telegrams to the former, and as fast as money arrived, dispatched it to the latter for their passage over, though I did not yet have enough to get them home again. Languages and interpreters then had to be arranged for. In Europe, that was difficult enough, but here... It was more than perplexing. Worst of all was the eternal barrier of our laws. Topics that could be freely discussed in London were forbidden in the United States, and we could not afford to have the dignity of the occasion marred by another town hall episode. I had to tell delegates what their papers were to be about, and when it was necessary to cut out a reference to contraceptives, had to apologize and explain why. I quickly found that visitors from 17 countries could produce more problems than statistics and theories proved. A committee set to meet Dr. G. O. Lapogue, a French eugenist, after vainly searching through the cabins on the boat, went back to the pier whence all had fled save one inconspicuous desolate man sitting on top of his luggage, reading, waiting patiently for someone to come for him, so unimportant looking that no one would have suspected him of being a renowned scientist. The next morning, the Hotel McAlpin, where the convention was to be held, called me up to report that Dr. Lepogue had been severely burned, and an interpreter was needed. Dr. Drysdale hurried off to find the poor little man of seventy in excruciating pain, but carrying on a dissertation, highly amusing, about the hazards of America's much-advertised plumbing. Without understanding how to regulate the shower, he had stood under it and turned on the hot water. The skin fairly peeled off his chest. Nevertheless, bandaged and oiled, he undauntedly attended all the sessions. The opening night, we had a pioneer's dinner, over which Haywood Brown presided. The Danish Fru Thit Jensen, blonde, vivacious, was to relate the troubles she had had in a rousing interest in her own country. She made her address in English courageously enough but it was evident at once that someone slightly familiar with American slang had helped her out. She was describing a doctor's meeting in Denmark, and the first words we heard were, When I gave my greetings to those boneheads as I am to you, we all burst into laughter, because they seemed to apply to the guests present. Her face remained sphinx-like, in its determined immobility. She halted for us to subside, then continued. Almost immediately the dignified gathering went off again into a fresh peal. You no sooner recovered from one shrieking convulsion than she made another remark equally ludicrous. After each outbreak, she paused resignedly before going on with her carefully prepared speech. The hilarity finally got out of hand, so whether the end was funny or not, nobody knew or cared. 
at every meeting, Dr. Ferdinand Goldstein of Berlin, who was hard of hearing, sat in the front row. The mention of any phase of population, on which he was an expert, brought him promptly to his feet. Standing directly in front of the speaker, he cupped his ear in order not to miss a single word. The one discordant note occurred on the last day when the committee declined to embody in its program any endorsement of abortion. He not only left the conference, but went back to Germany without saying goodbye to anyone. The Austrian delegates were Johann Furch and his wife Betty. This Viennese printer had become interested in birth control through setting up material on his linotype. He had informed himself of methods and in a short time had several clinics started in Vienna. One morning, when I found them at breakfast in the dining room, great tears were rolling down Mrs. Furch's face. I asked her what the trouble was, and she said she was weeping because the pot of coffee on the table, a simple bit of food, cost 35 cents, and she realized what this amount of money would buy at home. For the price of one meal in New York, their starving relatives could live for a whole day in luxury. Neither of them felt entitled to indulge in such extravagance. Dr. Aletta Jacobs walked along with me after one of the sessions. She said the fact that she refused to see me in 1915 had been on her mind ever since, and she desired to clear up the matter now. She had always been against lay people taking part in the movement, and for that reason had opposed the Rutgers method of training practical nurses and allowing them to go out in the field after only two months' instruction. She had put me in the same category as those in her own country who had wanted to establish clinics as a commercial venture. That afternoon she visited our clinic and went over methods with Dr. Cooper and Dr. Stone. Here, she said, with kindling eyes, was the system she had envisioned in the Netherlands, but had never been able to make come true. The eugenists were given their opportunity to speak at the conference. Eugenics, which had started long before my time, had once been defined as including free love and prevention of conception. Moses Harmon of Chicago, one of its chief early adherents, had run a magazine and gone to jail for it under the Comstock regime. Recently, it had cropped up again in the form of selective breeding, and biologists and geneticists, such as Clarence C. Little, president of the University of Maine, and C. B. Davenport, director of the Cold Spring Harbor Station for Experimental Evolution, had popularized their findings under this heading. Protoplasm was the substance then supposed to carry on hereditary traits. Genes and chromosomes were a later discovery. Professor Davenport used to lift his eyes reverently, and with his hands upraised as though in supplication, quiver emotionally as he breathed, Protoplasm. We want more protoplasm. I accepted one branch of this philosophy, but eugenics without birth control seemed to me a house built upon sands. I could not stand against the furious winds of economic pressure which had buffeted into partial or total helplessness a tremendous proportion of the human race. The eugenists wanted to shift the birth control emphasis from less children for the poor to more children for the rich. We went back of that and sought first to stop the multiplication of the unfit. This appeared the most important and greatest step towards race betterment. A special round table for the eugenists was held at which we took the opportunity to challenge their theories. I said, Dr. Little, let's begin with you. How many children have you? Three. 
How many more are you going to have? None. I can't afford them. Professor East, how many have you? And how many more are you going to have? And so the question circled. Not one planned to have another child, though Dr. Little has had two since by a second wife. There you are, I said, a super-intelligent group, the very type for whom you advocate more children, yet you yourselves won't practice what you preach. If I were to put the same question to a group of poor women who already have families, every one of them would also answer, No, I don't want any more. No arguments can make people want children if they think they have enough. When the conference was over, a final meeting was held at my apartment to form a permanent international association of which Dr. Little was made president. Handling everything had been something of an undertaking, but after all the delegates had been sent off, we still had money in the bank. My faith had been justified that if you started something worthwhile, means for its realization would be forthcoming. End of chapter 30「Great Heights Are Hazardous » Professor East, though you may try, you fail to rouse my fears, for I don't dream that even I – will live a hundred years. But do not think I view with mirth five billion folk assorted, five billion tightly packed on earth who cannot be supported. End quote. South African Review At the conclusion of the New York Conference, I thought that I was never going to have anything to do with organizing another but hardly more than a few months had gone by before my mind was dwelling on one to be centered around overpopulation as a cause of war. From the statements of Keynes and the specialists of the League of Nations, and from the status of the countries of Europe, it was inferred that international peace could in no way be made secure until measures had been put into effect to deal with explosive populations. Between 1800 and 1900, the inhabitants of the world doubled in spite of bloody wars, thus proving they were only temporary checks. For every hundred thousand babies who died between dawn and dawn, Professor East estimated that one hundred and fifty thousand were born. These fifty thousand survivors contributed to the globe in twenty years a horde almost equal to India's three hundred and seventy-five million. In the United States, numerically speaking, Overpopulation was not of apparent importance. We still had unoccupied lands. But evidence that we were beginning to consider the quality of our citizens as well as the quantity was shown in our immigration laws. In 1907, we had barred aliens with mental, physical, communicable, or loathsome diseases, and also illiterate paupers, prostitutes, criminals, and the feeble-minded. Had these precautions been taken earlier, our institutions would not now be crowded with moronic mothers, daughters, and granddaughters, three generations at a time, all of whom have to be supported by taxpayers who shut their eyes to this condition, admittedly detrimental to the bloodstream of the race. Then, our sudden closing of the doors in 1924, by placing the world on a quota, threw Europe's surplus population back on herself. 
Italy had to face this problem, as Germany had had to do in 1914. At the Institute of Politics in Williamstown, Massachusetts, in the summer of 1925, Count Antonio Cipico, fascist senator, virtually demanded that, to make room for her explosive expansion, Italy be allowed to export her half-million annual increase to foreign lands. Professor East answered him, asking Italy first to put her house in order, and setting forth with clarity the inexorable results of spawning children on the world with haphazard recklessness. But she had no intention of doing so. Shortly afterwards, Mussolini outlined his plan. If Italy is to amount to anything, it must enter into the second half of this century with at least 60 million. Japan and Germany, as well as Italy, were already called danger spots in 1925. Japan's goal was a hundred million. Gearing was soon to say, the territory in which the Germans live is too small for our 66 million inhabitants and will be too small for the 90 million which we want to become. The three military countries were pleading with their women to bear more children, offering as inducements medals, money, lands. They claimed the right of expansion because they were too crowded at home and were at the same time increasing their peoples in order to promote successful wars. Populations can fall into a semi-starved state of inertia, such as that of India or China, unless they are aggressive. They have a choice of three courses, to lower the standards of living to the bare subsistence level, to control the birth rate, or to reach out for colonies, as Great Britain has done. While we had been holding our conference in London in 1922, I had met at one of Major Putnam's luncheons the very reverend gloomy Dean Inge, except that he was not gloomy at all. He was full of mischief. In his late fifties, tall, thin as an exclamation point, quite deaf, he reminded me of a Dickens character. He had commented in his usual pungent style on the real meaning of the right to expand. It is a pleasant prospect if every nation with a high birth rate has a right to exterminate its neighbors. The supposed duty of multiplication and the alleged right to expand are among the chief causes of modern war. And I repeat that if they justify war, it must be a war of extermination, since mere conquest does nothing to solve the problem. I was still of the opinion in 1925 that the League of Nations should include birth control in its program and proclaim that increase in numbers was not to be regarded as a justifiable reason for national expansion, but that each nation should limit its inhabitants to its resources as a fundamental principle of international peace. On the other hand, it was all very well to say, cut down your numbers, but how could this be done if scientific and medical development lagged so far behind that few knew how to do it? Building up huge populations by following the way of nature was fairly simple, but it was by no means simple to reduce them again voluntarily. No long-range program was possible until economists, sociologists, and biologists alike should garner and contribute facts to the solution. Therefore, the occasion was now ripe for the attention of the scientific world to be focused on the population question. I planned to bring them together at Geneva, the logical meeting place. Dr. Little, 
who had accepted the presidency for the next International Birth Control Conference, had gone to the University of Michigan as its president. He had no time for organizing, raising money, getting speakers. If this lengthy job of organizing the World Population Conference were to be done, I should have to do it. So great was the competition between the League of Nations and other groups desiring to hold conventions at Geneva during its sessions that you had to book an auditorium and rooms for delegates practically twelve months ahead. Consequently, towards the end of 1926, I went to Geneva to make arrangements for an expected 300 guests. I had previously become acquainted with several Genovese. William Rappard, then a professor at the university there, consented to go on our committee and advise me on social details with which only a native would be familiar. More vital to me was the labor office of the League, where it was not a matter of politics, but of industrial problems thrashed out by people chosen for their special knowledge. Here I met Albert Thomas, a strange-looking person, short, stocky, with black beard sprouting over his face, very talkative, amazing in his energy, traveling over Europe by night, arriving in Geneva in the morning, conducting his business affairs, making speeches. But with all this activity, he managed to spare hours enough to help me immeasurably when I consulted him on subjects, persons, locations, and dates. The Salle Centrale was engaged for three days, August 30th to September 2nd of the next year, 1927. Back I went to London to enlist an English committee. Clinton Chance became my husband's assistant in supervising finances and also provided London headquarters in his offices, supplying stenographers and secretaries. Edith Howe Martin joined us, and I secured the invaluable aid of Julian Huxley, brother of Aldous, a brilliant, young, enthusiastic scientist, alive and having a mind that not only took things in, but gave them out. The conference owed much to his fair and just opinions, and the fine supporters he rounded up. Together we went over names and names and names, trying to choose a chairman of sufficient distinction around whom European scientists would rally. Professor A. M. Carr Saunders at first accepted, but a month and a half later informed me his other obligations were so heavy he would have to limit his participation to membership on the council. After weeks of uncertainty, interviews, and rejections, we selected Sir Bernard Mallet, K.C.B., once of the Foreign Office, Treasury, Board of Inland Revenue, later Registrar General of Births, Deaths, and Marriages, and President of the Royal Statistical Society. Although very English, he was not too conservative. He knew well Sir Eric Drummond, then head of the League of Nations, and also had many friends on the continent, particularly in Italy. He was typical of an individual who had climbed far, who knew where he was going and the road by which he should travel. Bored at being now in retirement, he accepted our offer willingly, because although no salary was attached, it would give him a position and an interest and keep him socially in touch with noteworthy figures. Lady Mallet's previous experience as lady-in-waiting to Queen Victoria made her an expert hostess, and this, too, we needed. Once I had to make an expedition all the way to Edinburgh to seek out Dr. F. A. E. Crewe, a shining light 
among the younger biologists, who was making hens crow and roosters lay eggs. He readily agreed to come to the conference, and during the two days I visited him, helped me build up my program. I also wanted a paper read by André Siegfried, author of America Comes of Age, written after journeying some six weeks through the United States. When he invited me to tea at his home in Paris, I found him in appearance more like a mixture of American and English than French. But you could feel from his attitude and deduce from his conversation that he really envied, despised, hated Americans. By invading France with our wealth and vulgarity, we had utterly spoiled it for his compatriots. Appreciating good food, which we never had at home, we squandered enormously four or five times what they did. The same was true of wine. We were drinking their best, paying high for it without being able to tell the difference when we were given cheap vintages. Consequently, the Parisians were being shut out of Paris because they could not afford the prices. I don't see how you can blame the Americans for coming over and paying what you French ask, I replied. You might have a complaint, perhaps, if we tried to undersell you or refused to buy, but it seems to me you are profiting considerably by this outrageous intrusion of the American dollar. Although we did not get on very well, and although he would not read a paper, he consented to attend. Some of the preliminaries having been set, my husband took a villa at Cap d'Ay, between Nice and Monte Carlo, and near enough to Geneva, Paris, and London for trips whenever necessary. From my room the sunrise was incredibly vivid, reds and yellows, mixed with the glorious blue of the Mediterranean. But it was not warm. H. G., who had a villa at Grasse, said the Riviera reputation for summer heat in wintertide was a fraud. We used to drive up to see him. The flowers for the perfume manufactories grew thick on the hillsides, so thick that the air for miles around was fragrant. Occasionally we picnicked in the tiny village on top of the mountain of Ez, a favorite haunt of artists. Once the old castle had belonged to robber barons, who could see for miles the approach of a ship. Now the elder Mrs. O. P. Belmont had a palatial residence there. The Riviera was always a mecca for English people wanting to escape their own cold and fog and damp, and our eight guest rooms were full most of the time. It was quite novel for me to manage a household in French. We had the traditional bad luck of Americans. The maid stole from the guests, and the hot water boiler only held ten gallons. Not a person could have a good bath until a modern one was installed. My first cook was an expert in her field, but I soon found she was running over in her bills, even allowing for the customary perquisite of a sow for each franc she spent with the butcher and the greengrocer. Eggs and butter were on the list every day, but never how many eggs nor how much butter. I laid the responsibility on my own bad French before I discovered it was her understanding of Americans. Then and there, I told her she had to leave the following day immediately after breakfast. She received this ultimatum with tears and wailing. Somewhat uneasy, I rose early at seven, only to find she had gone late the preceding night, taking with her every scrap of food in the pantry and storeroom except the salt. On one of my frequent flittings to London, I went to a hairdresser's shop, unfamiliar to me, but carrying the insignia of reliability, by appointment to Her Majesty, 
I was to return to Cap Dye in a few days and wished to appear with a wave in my hair, which I wore mid-Victorian, very sweet and simple. After washing it, the coiffeur put an iron on a little gas arrangement in the window nearby and left the room while it was drying, floating out in the wind. Meanwhile, I meditated on the subject of hair. The story of Samson seemed to have been more than an allegorical tale. I could tell from the way mine acted on being brushed in the morning how I myself was going to be. If it were strong and electric, then I was full of vitality. When slumped over my forehead so that it had to be tied down, then I dragged about spiritlessly. It was also interesting to analyze why a woman should wear her hair in a certain style. I knew some who, at the age of sixty, curled theirs in baby ringlets. Doubtless, something within them wanted never to grow up. Women who had gone into the underground movement in Russia took the shears to theirs so that nothing should divert the attention to feminine appeal. I was not enough of a feminist to sacrifice mine, but I had once come to the conclusion that the triumph of life would be to push it straight back from my forehead and tie it in a knot behind, because that was how people thought I looked. But I could not do it. No matter what was said about your feet or your figure, you could at least show your hair, in front of hats, down your back, everywhere. And so I had clung tenaciously to my long locks. At this point in my musings, I smelled something burning and turned around to find half my hair singed off to my ear. I gave one shriek and the whole staff rushed in but it was too late. It all had to be cut short, and I actually wept. As soon as I reached Paris, I had what was left done up like a switch so that I could put it on if I felt too badly. I kept it in a box, all ready in case my husband did not want me without my hair. Eventually, I had to face his disapproval. I appeared for dinner. Nothing was said. Although internally amused, the guests maintained grave faces, waiting for him to notice it. Not until next morning did he do so. My own attitude had changed overnight. Never did I want to return to long hair. During early spring, just when it was beginning to be most beautiful, I could spend little time at Cap Dye. Permanent headquarters were established in April at Geneva, four airy, spacious rooms up two flights. I had expected Edith Howe Martin to be with me, but she came down with scarlet fever in London. It was a complication to do without her until Mrs. Marjorie Martin, who had organized a pool of stenographers, secretaries, and typists at the Labor Bureau, furnished us with a most competent and experienced office staff of 17. At 4.30, our large reception room was transformed into a living room where all the employees and volunteers gathered. Each, in turn, provided cakes, brewed the tea, and washed up afterwards. One evening, at a quarter to seven, some good American stopped in, and seeing everybody smiling and cheerful, though still at work, asked, Will you tell me what magic you women use to create this atmosphere? You've been at it since seven this morning. The answer was, tea at 4.30. I liked being in Geneva, neat and clean and filled with watch shops. I did not even mind the great numbers of people in solemn black clothes. If anyone died in this Calvinist city, the family wore full mourning for one year, and half for the following. In large families, the process became almost perpetual. I was not stimulated by the league sittings. 
There was much reading of papers and a lot of noise, but no breathless excitement during the debates. Instead, the members talked in small groups, looking very bored. The big things, just as in Washington, were done behind the scenes, at dinner tables, and in private conferences. The general meetings were merely sounding boards for public opinion. One of the most interesting features was the way a delegate could make a speech in his own language and others at their desks could plug in earphones and hear it simultaneously in theirs, coming from booths off stage. Delegates to our conference were all asking whether their papers were to be given in their respective tongues. I came to one swift decision, to adopt the bilingual league precedent of French and English. It was simple enough to secure interpreters who were familiar with political terminology because they swarmed at Geneva, but to find those who understood scientific terms in German, Italian, Hungarian, Scandinavian, Portuguese, Greek, Spanish, Japanese, and Chinese was quite another affair. We tried to catch as many as we could passing through Geneva and hold them over during the time we needed their services. In order to facilitate matters, my husband generously financed the morning journal to be delivered on the breakfast tray of every person registered at the conference, and also to members of the League of Nations. It was printed in English and French in parallel columns, containing the papers, the discussions, and any news items that might concern the delegates. Entertainment was an important feature. A series of luncheons was to be held at the restaurant Besson, with a host at each table, and daily the seating was to be rearranged so that each guest might be placed between those who spoke his own language or languages. M. Rapard was to give a reception. M. Faccio invited us on board the Montreux to visit Mademoiselle de Stahl's former home at Coppet. The chief social event was the reception and dinner at Mrs. Stanley McCormick's 15th century Chateau de Prajon at Nyon. She herself could not be there, but sent a representative from America to open it, equip it with servants, and make everything ready. Adequate handling of publicity was essential, and Albin Johnson, correspondent of the New York World, did this for me. He knew who was who, whom to avoid, and what persons would put the proper emphasis on what. He volunteered his services, but some of his assistance had to be paid. We offered expenses to all speakers and certain visitors who might later be influential in their own communities. The outpouring of money was constant, and I was not getting enough by soliciting from wealthy individuals. Consequently, giving up the villa in May, I came back to the United States to secure some from a foundation. End of Chapter 31, Part 1《ハッピーバースデーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバーガーバー who seemed to be the most selflessly devoted, giving time and effort without stint, able to speak and to direct, was Mrs. F. Robertson Jones. She went to meetings in blizzard or rainstorm, by subway or on foot if necessary. No dressmaker, no friend dropping in to lunch kept her from her job. But she differed from me in one respect, She could not run things unless she felt secure, 
she wanted a definite signing on the dotted line for so much annually instead of voluntary contributions of what people felt they could afford when they could afford it this was quite against the spirit on which the movement had always proceeded but i was willing to compromise i did not realize how serious it was going to prove in the future to have ceded this fundamental precept she accepted the temporary presidency and i sailed back reaching geneva in july i was surprised at the rising tide of international solidarity which in this non-industrial city evidenced itself in astonishing fashion the night sacco and vanzetti were to be electrocuted i had been working late at the office and when i came out towards midnight the crowds in the street were so dense i could hardly move as soon as word came in the early morning that the execution had not been stayed they shouted reproaches before the houses of americans smashed the windows of the united states consulate and some in the league building even in front of the hotel de burg where we were stopping they clamored their protests the great dr william welch of johns hopkins was in geneva at this time a cheerful person roly-poly abounding in fun and sly acute remarks to listen to his unimpressive conversation you would never suspect that here was one whose name was known around the world we had lunch together one noon he knew how much i was depending on the conference how much i was hoping that the population aspect of birth control should be started in the right direction and under the right auspices he walked a little way with me, and then, putting his arm across my shoulders, said, Perhaps you think your battles are over, but they aren't. I felt like he was trying to prepare me for something having gone wrong, though I could not imagine what it was. From then on, I was aware of an unpleasant subterranean mystery insidiously disturbing the previous harmony, but nobody talked openly. During my absence in the United States, Sir Bernard had been collecting his European friends. Not only was Italy intent on increasing her population, but the reactionary element of France also had formed a society to combat birth control. We had invited the Italians, Guglielmo Ferraro and Gaetano Salvamini, but Sir Bernard had been induced to accept as a substitute Corrado Gini, who, dark, swarthy, highly egotistical, speaking English painfully, was the perfect mirror of Mussolini's sentiments, and turned out to be a most tiresome speaker and a general nuisance. The delegates, Gini among the first, began to gather late in August. The storm broke the Friday before our scheduled opening, Tuesday, August 31st. Proofs of the official program had just come to me for my approval. Sir Bernard came into my office and looked at them. Well, we'll just cross these off, he said, drawing his pencil through my name and those of my assistants. Why are you doing that? The names of the workers should not be included on scientific programs. These people are different, I objected. In their particular lines, they are as much experts as the scientists. It doesn't matter. That can't go on. Out of the question, it's not done. A long cry of dismay went up from the staff. They considered the action reprehensible and petty. The young woman who was to deliver the program to the printers would not do so. Saturday morning, secretaries and typists, twenty-one altogether, struck in a body, and without them the conference could not proceed successfully. While Dr. Little was trying his powers of persuasion on them, 
I reported the situation to Sir Bernard, saying that in justice to the women who had given so generously of their time and effort, who had raised the money, issued the invitations, paid the delegates' expenses, they should be given proper credit. All the latter had had to do was walk in at the last moment, present their papers, and take part in the social life planned for them. Having registered my sentiments, I spent most of Sunday convincing the members of the staff that the conference was bigger than their own hurt feelings, and making them promise to return. Edith Howe Martin, however, who had joined me some time before, refused to continue because the hard labor of the workers was not to be acknowledged. Though suspecting that the elimination of my name was the crux of the matter, I was still at a loss to know the exact reason back of this tempest until one of the delegates told me the story. Sir Eric Drummond had warned Sir Bernard that these distinguished scientists would be the laughing stock of all Europe if it were known that a woman had brought them together. Hence, in order to influence Italian and French delegates to attend, Sir Bernard had secretly pledged that I was not to be a party to the conference and no discussion of birth control or Malthusianism would be allowed. He had hoped that the whole thing might be muddled through when, when the delegates had come drifting in, had gone from one to another to urge, I ask you to stand by me. Do not let me down. Only our young English friends had held out for the recognition of the woman. I was not surprised at the Europeans. But it was difficult to comprehend the American attitude on this point. Perhaps Professor Pearl and Dr. Little, in agreeing to support Sir Bernard, had not realized the unfairness of the action. Clarence Little was as honest a human being as you could find. But sometimes I thought his personal allegiances obstructed his vision. He used his intelligence to make up arguments on the side of loyalty rather than on the side of principles. At the hour designated, the first meeting opened in the Salle Centrale. Each delegate had a number of extra tickets, and with the German, Belgian, and French contingents came several gentlemen with large silver crosses hanging down outside their coats. In the lobby, a Genovese book concern had been permitted to set up a table for the sale of volumes by delegates. These guests immediately demanded of Sir Bernard that a certain one, of which they disapproved, be banished. Sir Bernard trotted to me and said he wished no trouble. There seemed to be some controversy. Would I have the offending books taken away? I approached the strangers and asked who they were. They vociferated in various languages, shaking the book under my nose, getting red in the face, looking as though apoplexy might smite them. I sent for an interpreter and instructed him to say, The hall will be for rent next Monday. Meantime, I have paid for it and will suffer no dictation from anybody as to what shall be done here. The disturbers did not depart, and the excitement around the bookstand was so considerable that the volumes were sold out and more had to be ordered. During the course of the conference, the Americans, British, and Scandinavians admitted the need for limiting population. The Germans and Czechs concurred, although with less assurance. The Italian and Slav voices were definitely opposed. The French, who practiced it at home, preached against it publicly. The papers of Professors East and Fairchild came perilously near mentioning the forbidden word Malthusianism, but as for birth control, it was edged about like a bomb which might explode any moment. At the close of the three days, a permanent population union was formed, which is still meeting, the only international group dealing with the problem. 
All the brilliant committee now took trains and steamed off for home, leaving me with the bills, the clearing up, and most important of all, the editing of the proceedings. After a rest at a sanatorium at Glion in Switzerland, I set to work, and by the end of November they had gone to press. I wanted to visit India, but had to think of this trip in terms of physical fitness and consequently was obliged to forego it. Instead, I accepted an invitation sent me by Agnes Smedley, on behalf of the Association of German Medical Women to lecture in Germany in December. The Berlin of 1927 was far different from that of 1920. Food was plentiful, if expensive. The Adlon and other restaurants were crowded. A stirring of life and nationalism was everywhere to be sensed. At the appearance of a zeppelin in the skies, Men in the streets took off their hats as though it had been a god. When I spoke in the town hall of Charlottenburg, Berlin, I was reminded of the birth strike German women had been carrying on when I had last been there. German men seemed to have remembered little of this, still thinking they could keep their wives to childbearing, their race function, as it was called but the women had now definitely directed their thoughts from race preservation to self-preservation. As I said to my audience, birth control has always been practiced, beginning with infanticide, which is abhorred, and then by abortion, nearly as bad. Contraception, on the other hand, is harmless. Almost before I had finished, Dr. Alfred Grotjan professor of social hygiene at the University of Berlin, who was seeking to present the picture of Germany's future greatness in terms of numbers, shouted out that every woman ought to have three children before she should be allowed contraceptive information. No sooner had he resumed his seat than several women were demanding recognition. I was told one of them was Dr. Martha Reuben Wolf. She's a communist. What she's saying is all on your side, but it won't do any good because nobody has ever been able to cope with Grotjan. Nevertheless, she answered him figure for figure, fact for fact, each based on her experience, adding that his patriotism was only skin deep. He might as well bury himself now, he would soon be buried by the rising generation and forgotten. Then a huge shape arose, garbed in uniform and bonnet. I thought she must be a deaconess, but she turned out to be president of the Midwives Association. She bellowed in tones even louder than those of Grotjan, putting herself on record against birth control. She could not be stopped. She would not sit down even when the bell was rung. Others answered her. The debate developed into a regular bear garden before the contestants were separated and removed. As a result of the meeting, some twenty women physicians gathered at my hotel two evenings later. Clinics were to be established at Neukolln under Dr. Kurt Bendix, the health administrator of the section. For the first time in history, a government agency was actually sanctioning birth control. I promised $50 a month for three years toward supplies. The doctors agreed to furnish rooms and medical services. They had a more feminist point of view than ours in the United States. Ellen Key's liberal influence had seeped through from Scandinavia. Nevertheless, I was astonished that in the very country where we were purchasing our contraceptives, these outstanding members of their profession knew practically nothing about them. The original clinic was opened the following May, and for five years contraceptive information was given in a dozen places under medical supervision. Then the Nazis came into power, they were closed, and Dr. Bendix committed suicide. 
Towards the middle of the month, I went to Frankfurt am Main, where Dr. Hirth Rees was managing one of the largest of the marriage advice bureaus, of which there were about 1,500 in Germany. Anyone could apply to these for legal information, and, for example, receive enlightenment as to who should have custody of a child if illegitimate, the amount of alimony to be paid by the husband in case of divorce, the nationality of a child if the father were a foreigner, the effect of sterilization, the results of the marriage of cousins, or any problem, including homosexuality and inversion, feeble-mindedness and abortion. In this period of great unemployment, bearing particularly heavily upon families with many children, Dr. Reese had gone to the officers of one of the big health insurance companies and persuaded them that it would be economical for them to underwrite sterilization of women carrying health insurance if this were advised by a doctor. I saw her order 75 of these major operations one evening between 6 o'clock and 8.30 in her own clinic. Professor Grotjan had created almost a slogan by his demand that in order to bolster up the falling birth rate, every wife have three children. But the women had a counter-slogan. They came in saying, I've had my three, I want an operation. I saw also some who had returned from the hospital to report. They appeared happy and proud and pleased with themselves. Their ten days or two weeks in bed had meant food and much needed rest. After Germany, I went vacationing to San Moritz, to play, to skate, to ski, in that glorious high altitude. It was transcendently beautiful. I used to get up in the morning and listen to the sleighs coming up the hills with their tinkling bells and look out at the scintillating snow. Every twig of every tree was encased in ice on which the sun glistened without melting it. The scene was a white etching. St. Moritz was much frequented by nobility and royalty on holiday. Whenever one of them arrived... Like a flock of birds, the hangers-on winged their way thither, settled down in all the hotels so that ordinary folk could scarcely find room. Almost the first person I met was Lady Astor, more British than the British themselves, the southern accent entirely gone. Her blonde hair was turned sand-colored, her blue eyes were always gay, her tanned and rugged features sharp, mouth and jaw firm set, neck clean cut. She was quick-tempered and frank, and ready to take fire easily. Lord Astor, who was devoted to his wife, was much more politically astute, and usually went campaigning with her. He sat directly behind her, and when the heckling began, or a question was posed which might involve her in difficulties, he called out in a stage whisper, Don't be drawn, Nancy, don't be drawn. During one House of Commons debate, Lady Astor had attempted to drive home a point by stating she was the mother of five children and therefore ought to know. Her opponent, taking issue with her, had jumped up, saying his word should carry more weight on the subject because he was the father of seven. Lady Astor then retorted, But I haven't finished yet. The British professed to be horrified at this, so vulgar and American. Once, after Lady Astor had been off skiing all day, I joined her in her room shortly before dinner. She was sitting up in bed, the windows wide open, cold cream smeared over her sunburned face, her glasses on her nose, reading science and health with the Bible nearby. She had not quite ended her day's lesson. Almost wherever I am, the subject of birth control comes up sooner or later, 
and it did on this occasion. Lady Astor seemed to think her religion forbade her believing in it. If they want babies, let them have babies. If they don't want them, let them practice continence. Even accepting that continence is the ultimate ideal, I replied, wouldn't you agree that contraception as an immediate necessity to help millions of women is of equal importance with wearing glasses to read the Bible? As a good Christian scientist, you should not use them. Until you get enough faith to go without, don't you think it might be better to read Mary Baker Eddy through some such means as glasses than not at all? In one second she beamed. You're perfectly right. That's only reasonable. If you present common-sense people with the premise that birth control is common sense, they will always react in a common-sense way. Lady Astor was a practical person, and from that time on she has been a friend of the movement. End of Chapter 31, Part 2 Chapter 32 of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32. Change is hopefully begun. As a cause becomes more and more successful, the ideas of the people engaged in it are bound to change. While still at San Moritz, I had been getting messages and letters about the disturbing situation in the American Birth Control League. I cabled Frances Ackerman to take it in hand, but she replied she was unable to bring about a friendly solution. I found on my return, after eighteen months, that the tone of the movement had altered. The machinery I had built up to be ready for any emergency was marking time. An incident which occurred almost immediately was highly indicative. During my absence, the League had been invited to participate in the parents' exhibition in the Grand Central Palace, and had signed a contract for a certain space. The day before the opening came a letter from Robert E. Simon, who was in charge, stating that William O'Shea, superintendent of public schools, threatened to remove the Board of Education exhibit if ours were there, and he therefore requested our withdrawal. With time so short, I asked an attorney to secure a court injunction to prevent our exclusion. But one member of the board said no step should be taken without the approval of all. A meeting should be called to discuss what course was to be adopted. I tried to reach various directors by telephone, but before I could gather a quorum, it was too late. The check which paid for our space had been sent back and the exhibition had opened. We were left out. Obviously, the old aggressive spirit had been superseded by a doctrinaire program of social activity. The League had settled down. I had always believed that offerings should be voluntarily measured by the individual's desire. In this way, you could appeal whenever a special occasion warranted and receive anywhere from one dollar to two or three hundred. Contributors were giving to something that concerned them vitally, and they did it not because they had signed a pledge for a limited sum, but because they wanted to help forward the movement. I could not share the League's enthusiasm over the fact that our bank account had grown to sizable proportions, thousands of dollars drawing interest, though I admit it must have been a great relief to a board whose previous experience had been to hear wails from the president and treasurer as to our needs for some new project. I knew the apathy which came from a fat bank balance. I knew also the tacit disapproval which would meet every suggestion to touch that precious fund. 
but my policy had been to spend, not to save, when work ought to be done. I discovered that subscribers to the review had not been informed it was time for them to renew their subscriptions, and that, consequently, they had diminished from 13,000 to 2,500. Accordingly, I told the bookkeeper to give 15 or 20 dollars to the clerk to pay for circularizing. She said she could not do it. A bylaw had been made that nobody could direct the outlay of more than five dollars without a resolution passed by the board. There is doubtless a place for organizations that restrict their scope to the status quo. Most charities are like that. They live on securities, install as officers those who keep pace with, but are never in advance of general opinion. Two members of the board, with League of Women Voters training, saw the movement in the light of routine, annual membership dues, and a budget, going through the same ritual year after year, and remaining that way, performing a quiet service in the community. I looked upon it as something temporary, something to sweep through, to be done with and finished. It was merely an instrument for accomplishment. I wanted us to avail ourselves of every psychological event, to push ahead until hospitals and public health agencies took over birth control as part of their regular program, which would end our function. Regretfully, I found the League was to sidestep the greatest and most far-reaching opportunity yet offered it. It was logically equipped to enter the legislative field, but it wanted to progress state by state. I was convinced action in the federal sphere would be quicker and much broader educationally, and that furthermore, success there would provide a precedent for the states. When you build an organization, you try to combine harmonious elements, but you cannot tell what they will turn out to be until a certain interval has elapsed. Some of these women were in the movement for reasons they themselves did not always understand. A few liked the sensation of being important and having personal attention. They were at their best in following an individual, yet I never felt they were doing it for me. The liberals who had started with me had never demanded a reward. What they gave was for the cause. They refused to work for people. They worked with them or not at all. Most movements go through the phase of being brought into the drawing room. Those who disagreed with me believed the emphasis should be on social register membership and argued that my associations had been radical. The answer was yes, because the radicals alone had had the vision and the courage to support me in the early days. The women who were raising objections now had only joined up after it had been safe to do so. Moreover, they were for the most part New Yorkers, not all of whom had even gone into neighboring states. Their attitude tended to be, never you mind the West, let the Empire State make the decisions. The conflict of views which reigned in various matters was based on lives and environments which had been vastly separated. The time of some of the members of the board had to depend on what was left from other duties, husbands, children, servants, charities, church entertainments, shopping. To me, the cause was not a hobby, not a mere filler in a whirl of many engagements, not something that could wait on this or that mood, but a living inspiration. It came first in my waking consciousness and was my last thought as I fell asleep at night. I was always willing to present my facts to experts and abide by their superior knowledge, and I gave every consideration to the suggestions of the board. But I was no paper president, 
experience had given me a judgment which entitled me to a certain amount of freedom of action, and I could not well observe the dictates of people who did not know my subject as well as I did. June 12, 1928, I resigned the presidency of the League. Because the majority of the directors were against this, and because I wanted to make it easier for Mrs. Robertson Jones to take over, I stayed on the board and continued to edit the review. But the divergence of opinions rapidly crystallized in the next few months. This had to be pondered upon and wisely dealt with. The situation was going to mean constant friction, and the League might easily disintegrate into a dying, static thing. In any event, internal discord was abhorrent. I began to ask myself whether I could pass over the review, which for eleven years had been a vital part of my own being. Then came a meeting at which the question of the editorship arose. For the first time, friend opposed friend. Three voted against me. The other nine were for me. But my mind was now made up. I could fight outside enemies, but not those who had been my fellow workers. I would give complete freedom to others in order to obtain a new freedom for myself. Therefore, I surrendered the review to the League as its private property. I have been sorry that this step was necessary, because the magazine changed from being a national and international medium for the expression of ideas and became merely a house organ. However, I trust that some day it will be possible to broaden its scope of usefulness once more. The clinic, which had recently been treated rather like an orphan, still remained intact. No one in the League had ever paid any attention to it, and the doctors on the committee had been too busy with their own practices. I felt it was my responsibility and belonged to me personally. It was an interesting angle on my own psychology. I did not regret the theoretical part of the movement going into other hands, but I would have been traitor to all that had been entrusted to me had I yielded the clinic to women who had shown themselves incapable of the understanding and sympathy required in its operation. One of the most distressing aspects of the impasse was that members of the organization had to forswear one to choose another, and this I hated. Juliet Rubley, Francis Ackerman, and Mrs. Walter Tim came with me unhesitatingly. So, too, did Kate Hepburn, Mrs. Day, and Dr. William H. Garth, the only minister on the board, a forthright man who always spoke his mind. Dr. Cooper was ready either to go with the clinic or keep on with the league in the field, if I thought he could be of most use there. It seemed to me few in the country could fill his place in speaking to the profession, and consequently I advised him to continue with the latter. Anne Kennedy had been loyal, done her job well, served a valuable purpose. She asked whether I would approve her affiliating herself with the Holland Rantos Company. Someone was badly needed in the manufacturing realm who was at one with our policies, who could help to instill pride and quality into the contraceptive business. Although I knew she did not like the commercial atmosphere, and it would be a definite sacrifice for her, it was an excellent choice, and I was sure that any firm she was with would hold fast to ethical standards. Mrs. Delafield called me up, and I went to see her. They've telephoned me three or four times this very day. I've refused to answer until I talked with you. What do you want me to do? I asked her a counter-question. What do you want? You must go as your heart tells you. Well, she replied, 
I realize you will now require only professionals, doctors, nurses, social workers, people who know politics. Perhaps I could be of more use in the work with which I am familiar. Thus, the matter was settled. There are many ways by which the same goal may be reached, and as a rule, diverse ones must be tried out in order to find the best. I still believed we were all aiming towards this, although not seeing eye to eye on procedure. I felt very decidedly that the future of the movement was like that of a growing child. You might guide its first faltering steps, but unless you let it run and fall, it never could develop its own strength. The younger generation might need a little pushing and prodding now and then, but I was confident that eventually they were going to build toward a sound civilization. As things recede in time, they become of less and less importance. One of my absolute theories is that any movement which has been based on freedom, as this had been, is like a live cell. There is a biology of ideas, as there is a biology of cells, and each goes through a process of evolution. The parent cell splits, and the new entities in their turn divide and divide again. Instead of indicating breakdown, it is a sign of health. Endless energy is spent trying to keep together forces which should be distinct. Each cell is fulfilling its mission in this separation, which in point of fact is no separation at all. Cohesion is maintained until in the end the whole is a vast mosaic cleaving together in union and strength. End of chapter 32、33. Of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33 Old Father Antic, The Law. Between Fifth and Sixth Avenues, practically in the shadow of the gray mass of St. Francis Xavier's College, was a shabby brownstone building, number 46 West 15th Street. After two years of gathering statistical histories at 104 Fifth Avenue, we decided in 1925 the time had come to expand and moved to the second home of the Clinical Research Bureau. It was next to an express agency, three steps down from the street, which was generally lined with trucks since the section was thick with lofts, factories, and warehouses. Not particularly attractive, but inexpensive, and we had a happy Irish landlord who helped convert the English basement into offices and reception rooms. The clinic was a neighborly place where mothers could congregate. We tried to keep it home-like so that they would not feel an atmosphere of sickness or disease. The patients were accorded just as much consideration as a business house gave its clients, and not, as in many doctors' anterooms, made to wait indefinitely. They were usually nervous enough anyhow, without having to endure added suspense. Moreover, they had husbands and children to feed and care for, and every hour was precious to them. As they increased, staff increased. Two physicians were always on hand. We shortly included the first floor and finally occupied the three. About a year before we had changed our location, Lord Buckmaster had introduced in the august House of Lords the memorable resolution which we had discussed when I had been last in England. Rarely had such an eloquent voice been lifted for our cause. I would appeal on behalf of the woman upon whose bare backs falls the untempered lash of the primeval curse, declaring that in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, the woman with the pride and glory of their life broken and discrowned, 
and the flower of motherhood turned into nothing but decaying weeds and on behalf of the children who are thrust into this world unwanted unwelcomed uncherished unsustained the children who do not bring trailing behind them clouds of glory but the taint of inherited disease and over whose heads there may hover for ever the haunting horror of inherited madness on behalf of them all i would appeal and as men who believe in the great future of our race i beg of you i earnestly entreat you to support the motion that i seek to move it is said that these women whom we seek to benefit are so indolent so ignorant so foolish that they will not come for the information it is not merely that they do come but the people who make that statement do that which men so often do they overlook the woman's side of the question what to a man may be a mere triviality an act between a sleep and a sleep and forgotten in a moment may bring to the woman the terror of consequences that we cannot measure of months of sickness misery and ill health ending with hours of agony that are not veiled under the cloak of chloroform's most merciful sleep these are the people that we want to help we too were dedicated to help such women and each day brought more to the doors of our clinic than we could provide instruction for from all over the country and of all classes some weeks so many italian women crowded in that we had to employ an interpreter then droves of spanish or of jewish arrived merely judging by the letters that had come to me i was prepared to find many psychological problems presented i often thought of the high cost of small families for women who had more or less restricted their procreative powers through other means than contraception although the size was limited it was frequently accompanied by marital unhappiness and hidden psychic disturbances but the kindness of dr stone aided immeasurably in our informal court of domestic relations one hot july day when i was coming out of the clinic i saw a woman obviously pregnant carrying a year and a half old baby dragging another one only a trifle bigger crying behind her the little girl's shoes were too short and were pinching her toes i squirmed myself remembering my own squeezed feet as a child i caught up with her can't i carry one of the babies this one seems tired which way are you going can you tell me where the jail is the nearest one is on spring street i think no there's a jail somewheres around here didn't you get the address yes but i left it on the table what do you want a jail for my man's there what for leaving me he always does this when i get like this how many children have you nine how often has he left you this is the fourth time now do you want any more children no emphatically did you ever know there was a way to stop having so many she almost dropped the infant took hold of me and said they won't give it to me i'm asking everybody they'll only give it to the rich he wants it he'll even have an operation but nobody will tell us i wrote down our street and number and said you go back to that place where i met you and the doctor there will tell you about it the next day i was called up unofficially by a social worker one of those who used to send us cases on their own initiative she wished to explain to me the husband would be let off if he promised to live with his family and support them otherwise he had to serve a sentence 
His wife had seen him and shown him my note. He had said he would rather go to the island for three years than come out, unless we could not only guarantee his getting the information, but furthermore that it would work. He was fed up with having a new baby every year. We suggested he talk it over with us and bring his wife. She was silent, glum, did not appear to know what it was all about. He was discouraged and doubtful. We gave him the information, and he departed. I'm the one to do this. She won't, glaring at his wife, who tagged on behind him. We hoped for the best. About half a year later, both returned for the checkup, she with her hand on his arm. This vague, dumb, immobile woman was now in spruce jacket and skirt, head up, stepping lightly. You would never have known her for the same person. The two were off to the movies together. Few social workers were understanding enough to smooth the lives of people in such difficulties. One agency was told by a doctor that a certain family on its rolls must not increase. The mother had already borne four babies and had a bad heart. A visiting nurse relayed this to the husband one Sunday morning when he was home from work. If your wife becomes pregnant again, you'll be a murderer. He was frightened. I don't want to kill her. What shall I do? Sleep alone. The husband's disposition began to change. He became gloomy, would not talk to his wife, was ugly in sudden tempers, slapped, shouted at, and even kicked the children, rushed into the house to eat his meals, and then out again, not retreating to his own bed until after she was in hers, which had been made up in the kitchen where it was warm. She was so unhappy over the metamorphosis that she made tentative approaches, whereupon he beat her and ran into the street. The next day she marched to the nurse's settlement to tell them what she thought of them. If all you can do is keep my husband from me, stay away. I'd rather be dead than live like this. The case was taken to a physician who sensibly warned you can't separate people by such barriers. That's not the answer. Then she was sent to us. After she had been instructed, the tension lessened, and the domestic situation was remedied. In another family of six children, the husband, part Italian and part some other nationality, was affectionate and irresponsible. Every time he walked in the door, wreathed in smiles, his wife greeted him with frowns and scowls. She threw dishes and pots at him. He thought she was crazy and asked to have her committed. A psychiatrist talked to her and found she was in deadly fear of being pregnant again. When we saw her, she really appeared to be demented. One forenoon, six months later, as I passed through the waiting room, the nurse at the desk tendered her usual, "'Good morning, Mrs. Sanger.' Immediately, a neat, trim woman came over to me. "'Look at me,' she beamed. "'You don't know me. "'I was the one who sat there, and they said I was crazy. "'I don't look crazy now, do I? "'And I wasn't crazy then, just worried to death.' "'For four years we went along in the clinic, working steadily, straightening mental tangles and relieving physical distress when we could. Then, early in the morning of April 15th, 1929, the telephone in my apartment rang, startling me. I was pretty nervous, having been up all night with Stuart, who had mastoiditis. His temperature was running high, and he was suffering with terrible, indescribable pain. I took off the receiver. Hello, this is Anna. The police are here at the clinic. Briefly, she related how they had descended without warning, 
stamped into the basement, and were at that moment tearing things to pieces. With this meager information pounding through my brain, I hastened to the street, hailed a taxi, and urged the driver to go as fast as he could to West 15th Street. The shade to the glass door was pulled down. The door itself was locked. I knocked, and a plainclothes man of the vice squad opened it. Well, who are you? I miss a Sanger, and I want to come in. My request was passed on to a superior, and I heard someone answer, Let her in. Inside, in a room more than ordinarily small, because partitions had sliced it up to make minute consultation booths, the patients were sitting quietly, some of them weeping. Detectives were hurrying aimlessly, here and there like chickens fluttering about a raided roost, calling to each other, and amid the confusion, demanding names and addresses. The three nurses were standing around. Dr. Elizabeth Pissort was practically in hysterics. Dr. Stone was aloof, utterly unmoved by the tumult and the noise. I've always admired her attitude. This was the first time in her life she had been arrested, yet she treated it so lightly. Isn't this fantastic, she remarked. Only a few moments ago, a visiting physician from the Middle West asked one of the nurses whether we ever had any police interference. Oh, no, the nurse cheerfully replied. Those days are over. Stocky Mrs. Mary Sullivan, head of the City Police Women's Bureau, was superintending the raid in person. Her round, thick-set face might have been genial when smiling, but was very terrifying when flushed with anger. She was giving orders to her minions in such rapid succession that it seemed impossible to keep pace with them. I tried to talk to her, asking why she had come and what it was all about. "'You'll see,' said Mrs. Sullivan, and went on directing the patrolmen, who were removing books from shelves, pictures and diagrams from walls, and sweeping out the contents of medical cabinets. In their zeal, I noticed they were seizing articles from the sterilizers, such as gloves and medicine droppers, having no sinister significance whatsoever. They were also gathering up the various strange, weird devices patients had brought us to inquire as to their efficacy, and which we exhibited as curios. Patrolwoman Anna McNamara, far less assured than her chief, was consulting a list in her hand and turning over the case histories in the files as swiftly as her fingers could move. Many of these contained the personal confessions of women, some of whom had entrusted us with the knowledge that their husbands had venereal disease or insanity. It ran through my mind that dire misfortune could follow in the way of being blackmailed by anyone obtaining the records. I requested Mrs. Sullivan to show me her search warrant, and saw it had been signed by Chief Magistrate McAdoo. Nevertheless, I cautioned her, You have no right to touch those files. Not even the nurses ever see them. They are the private property of the doctors, and if you take them, you'll get in trouble. Trouble, she snapped back. I get into trouble. What about the trouble you're in? I wouldn't change mine for yours. Well, this is my party. You keep out. One of the policemen scooped up all the name cards and stuffed them into a wastebasket to be carried off as evidence. This was a prime violation of medical ethics. Nothing was more sacred to a doctor than the confidences of his patients. Immediately, Anna telephoned Dr. Robert L. Dickinson at the Academy of Medicine that the police were confiscating the case histories of patients and asked him to recommend a lawyer. He suggested Morris L. Ernst, whom Anna then called. 
doctors, nurses, and evidence were being hustled into the street. The patrol wagon had arrived, but I summoned taxicabs in which we rode to the West 20th Street station. On the way, I heard part of the story, which accounted for my non-arrest. About three weeks earlier, a woman who had registered under the name of Mrs. Tierney had come for contraceptive advice and, on examination, was found by both doctors to have rectocele, cystocele, prolapsus of the uterus, erosions, and retroversion. Although not informed of her exact condition, she was instructed, because another pregnancy would be dangerous, and told to return for a checkup. She had now done so under her rightful name of McNamara, including in her entourage Mrs. Sullivan and a police squad. Dr. Stone, Dr. Pissort, and the three nurses were booked for violation of Section 1142, though I attempted to explain the clinic had been active for six years quite legally under the exception, Section 1145. At Jefferson Market Court, to which we next traveled, Magistrate Rosenbluth looked over the warrant and ordered a $300 bond for each. The succeeding morning, I sent Stuart to a hospital for treatment. I had to attend a meeting in Boston, and the day after that, go to Chicago for a series of lectures. Again, I was obliged to leave him and this time with even more misgivings. At Buffalo came a telegram saying a mastoid operation had been performed. At Chicago I telephoned the doctor and was reassured. The moment my duties were over, I hurried back to be with him, and incidentally to attend the hearings. I still had no idea of the fate of the case histories and had been very worried. Now I learned that the evening after the raid, Magistrate McAdoo had been dining with Dr. Carl Ryland, my husband's pastor. Dr. Ryland, much upset, had remarked upon its outrageousness. Justice McAdoo, aghast and horrified to find that, without reading it, he had signed this warrant, just one of the many laid on his desk, had called up the police station without delay, saying that all the twenty-four histories must be put in his safe and kept there until he arrived in the morning. He had perceived instantly that those doctors' records were going to be a serious embarrassment. One hundred and fifty cards, our sole memoranda of names and addresses, were never restored. Catholic patients, whose records had thus been purloined, received mysterious and anonymous telephone calls, warning them if they continued to go to the clinic, their private lives would be exposed. They came to us asking fearfully, Will I get in the papers? Immediately after the raid, various doctors volunteered to go on the stand and testify as to the medical principles involved. The New York County Medical Society was aroused and passed a resolution protesting against the seizure. Through Dr. Dickinson's foresightedness and energetic interest, the Academy of Medicine held a special meeting which resolved, We view with grave concern any action on the part of the authorities which contravenes the inviolability of the confidential relations which always have and should obtain between physicians and their patients. Police Commissioner Grover A. Whalen, then embroiled in a mortifying, futile investigation of the murder of Arnold Rothstein, the gambler, had termed the raid a routine matter. But when Dr. Lindsley Williams, director of the academy, wrote a letter of protest, he decided it might not have been so routine as it had appeared, and apologized. But what had caused the raid in the first place? I employed the Burns Detective Agency to sift the affair. 
approximately 50% of our cases were being sent by social workers on the lower east and west sides, a conglomerate of all peoples and classes, including Irish, Italians, and other Catholics. So many had benefited and told their neighbors that others also were asking of their agencies how to get to our clinic. Catholic social workers at a monthly meeting with officials of the church had sought guidance in replying to parishioners, and the ecclesiastics had been shocked to find that a clinic existed. Catholic policewomen had been summoned. Mary Sullivan had been chosen to wipe out the Clinical Research Bureau and Mrs. McNamara selected for the decoy. Morris Ernst, who had accepted our case, had already won a reputation for his espousal of liberal causes. It was most encouraging to discover a lawyer who was as convinced as we that the principle of the law was the important issue. Although he seemed very young, the moment I talked with him I recognized here was a person for us. He was a good psychologist as well as a good lawyer. He tried to bring everything out, but wanted the evidence correct and the minds of the witnesses straight as to what had happened. On April 21st, when Magistrate Rosenbluth called the case, the attitude in the courtroom was far different from anything exhibited at previous birth control hearings. Only one witness was heard that day, Mrs. McNamara. In spite of the hostility of Assistant District Attorney Hogan, which was to be expected, and in spite of the magistrate's prompting that she was a policewoman and not required to tell all, Mrs. McNamara was made to confess she had set out deliberately to deceive the clinic doctors. As she testified under Mr. Ernst's cross-examination what she had done, her stolid face turned from pink to purple. On her first visit, she had learned the routine, and on her second, being left alone, had copied down the number of every name card lying on Dr. Stone's desk. Murmurs rose among the spectators, a melodious sound to ears still echoing with the harsh and suspicious accents of a mere twelve years before. After forty minutes, Magistrate Rosenbluth adjourned the hearing over our protests. If the object had been to secure a quieter and less sympathetic audience the ensuing day, it failed. Now physicians took the stand. Dr. Dickinson, Dr. Frederick C. Holden, Dr. Foster Kennedy, the neurologist. The climax came when Mr. Hogan asked Dr. Lewis T. Harris, former Commissioner of Health of New York City, whether he had ever given any information to a patient regardless of marriage certificate. Dr. Harris answered, The birth control clinic is a public health work. Every woman desiring treatment is asked whether she is married. Don't they have to bring their marriage certificates with them? No. The magistrate leaned forward ponderously and heavily. Does not the clinic send out social workers to discover the truth of patients' statements? Mr. Ernst interpolated, Did you ever know of a situation where a doctor dispatched a detective to find out whether his patient were married? Loud laughter came from the listeners. Judge Rosenbluth pounded his gavel. Unless there is absolute silence, I shall clear the courtroom. Then, seeming to grow more angry, he added, On second thought, I shall clear it anyhow. Out you go. The joke was on him. It was the doctors who had laughed the loudest, and their presence as witnesses could not be dispensed with. Following a fifteen-minute recess, the audience was once again in the room, more partisan than ever. Young Mr. Hogan tried to be dramatic, but he failed before our attorney's cold, uncompromising logic. 
He took up one of the pessaries that had been appropriated in the raid and addressed Dr. Harris. You know that the laws of New York State are that contraception may be given only for the cure or prevention of disease. Do you dare to claim this article will cure tuberculosis, will it cure cancer, high blood pressure, heart disease, kidney disease? Again came mirth. No one assumed a pessary or any other form of contraceptive could affect a cure. But, replied Dr. Harris, in preventing conception, it may be said to cure because pregnancy can often be the cause of furthering the progress of a disease. A month later, the defendants were discharged, Magistrate Rosenbluth writing an admirably lucid, fair, and definite decision. Good faith in these circumstances is the belief of the physician that the prevention of conception is necessary for a patient's health and physical welfare. Mrs. Sullivan was temporarily demoted. She continued, however, to be paid the same salary as before and was eventually restored to rank. It was an ill wind that did not blow somebody good. After this, our calendars were filled three weeks in advance, and we had to add two evenings a week to the daily routine. To our amazement, among the many patients there appeared one afternoon Mrs. McNamara, who had first heard in court of her five ailments, every one of which legally entitled her to contraceptive information. She had come back to ask Dr. Stone whether she really had so many things the matter with her, and was assured the diagnosis was correct. The raid had been one of the worst errors committed by the opposition, because it had touched the doctors in a most sensitive spot, the sanctity of records, and they were obliged to stand by us, whether they wanted to or not. Even so, we were not yet certain that the question had been settled for all time. At any moment, our Irish landlord might receive orders from his bishop to eject us. To avoid any such contingency, and to take care of the increasing numbers, in 1930 we bought a house of our own at 17 West 16th Street. Our new building gave us not only more room for patients, but better opportunities for research. It was a sad commentary that though medicine had evolved into the preventive state where it was causing a revolution in sanitation and health education, contraceptive technique had been little advanced since the days of Mensinja. However, research was going on in various lands under the most diverse conditions. A modern clinic had started up again in the Netherlands, a memorial to Aletta Jacobs, and bearing her name. It was based on the old Rutgers standards, which had lapsed for so long. America and England, as the consequence of guiding the movement along professional lines and putting emphasis on the keeping of records, had made the greatest strides. But all accomplishments needed to be correlated, coordinated, unified in a scientific conference. Zurich was a central location for many countries, and in addition offered beautiful scenery in abundance. It was a pleasant place to be. September 1st, 1930, some 130 physicians and directors of clinics from different parts of the world began comparing notes and reporting progress. Only the present generation was behind the times. A representative from the Netherlands one day stood up, a rather youthful person, and said, I am glad to announce that at last we in the Netherlands have also a birth control clinic. This was extraordinary in view of the fact that the Netherlands had been the pioneer country and had inspired us all. Even more recently, I encountered a young matron, 
a member of the American Birth Control League and head of the state organization in New Jersey, who had again utterly disassociated herself from history. She urged, Mrs. Sanger, can't we convert you to the establishment of clinics? You know, they're going. They're being established all over the country. When were you born? was all I could gasp. These two women epitomized a day which had not studied what had gone before. If new to their minds, then it was new. In contrast to Geneva and its problems intact, Zurich was a dovecote. One slight incident alone disturbed the calm. I had gone to Berlin to secure delegates, and there, in a public theater, had seen a film which had traversed the length and breadth of Germany as propaganda for abortion under safe conditions. The scene opened with feet endlessly passing on the streets. You saw a kerchief drop. A masculine hand reached down to pick it up. The boy and girl at lunch, she looking up at him wide-eyed. Soon she was obliged to go to a femme savante in a filthy, narrow, old alley. You watched her ascend the rickety stairs, an ancient crone peeling potatoes, shoving wood in the stove with dirty hands, the agony in the girl's face. It was a succession of pictures such as this, straight out of life itself. I had borrowed the film and rented a theater in Geneva. To my great surprise, and no little amusement, when the Caesarean section appeared on the screen, several men and women in the audience began to faint. Among them our own workers, even Edith Howe Martin. One, a young scientist, had to be let out and given a drink to brace him up. Cars and taxis were commandeered to cart the squeamish back to their hotels. This conference must remain a milestone, because there all propaganda, all moral and ethical aspects of the subject were forgotten. The whole problem was lifted out of the troubled atmosphere of theory, where previously it had been battered by the winds of doctrine and the brutal gusts of prejudice, into the current of serene, impersonal, scientific abstraction. It was too early to tell what practical results might ensue, but at least we soon received the assurance that certain doctors would welcome efficient contraceptives. Individual physicians in New York had, since 1923, taken serious thought of the need for contraception. Mrs. Amos Pinchot had organized certain outstanding members of the Academy of Medicine into the Committee on Maternal Health. They had been fortunate enough to secure the well-known retired gynecologist, Dr. Dickinson, as secretary. He had trained many of the younger men and was able to bring into the movement doctors who would have paid slight attention to anyone less admired and honored. With the aid of various foundations, the Committee on Maternal Health had been doing a fine piece of work in publishing the findings of scientists in brochures and pamphlets. The Academy, after the Zurich Conference, formally declared that the public is entitled to expect counsel and information by the medical profession on the important and intimate matter of contraceptive advice. We had been attaining small victories, and little by little and bit by bit, the Protestant churches had begun to regard us favorably. In September 1925, the House of Bishops of the Protestant Episcopal Church, meeting at Portland, Oregon, had gone on record against birth control. Later, some of the wives of these same bishops had come to me in New York and asked my help in educating their husbands. A group of three had taken it upon themselves to see that every bishop was thoroughly enlightened. The consequence of the campaign was that at a subsequent meeting in 1934 they reversed 
their original stand. Even the Jews had on occasion been in opposition. Rabbi Mishkind of Tremont Temple had been rebuked by his board of trustees for having invited me to speak one Sunday morning. Rather than surrender, he had resigned and found another synagogue in which I could appear. Now the Central Conference of American Rabbis urged the recognition of birth control. The 170th Conference of the Methodist Church sanctioned it, and the American Unitarian Association did the same. A special commission appointed by the Presbyterian General Assembly to study the problems of divorce and remarriage admitted the desirability of restricting births under medical advice. And in March 1931, the Committee on Marriage and the home of the Federal Council of the Churches of Christ in America approved it. Due in large measure to Lord Dawson's eloquence, the bishops at Lambeth gave us one of our greatest triumphs by voting 193 to 67 in favor of birth control. Bernard Shaw believed the Church of England was making a belated attempt to see whether it could catch up with the 20th century. Ever since the outburst of religious intolerance at Town Hall, it had been apparent that in the United States the Catholic hierarchy and officialdom were going to be the principal enemies of birth control. From city to city you could feel this. At Albany we could not have a hall because the police commissioner was a Catholic. In Cincinnati the Knights of Columbus almost succeeded in barring us from the hotel. At Syracuse the mayor had to veto the ordinance of the Catholic Council before we could hold a conference there. When I was to give a lecture in Milwaukee, the Catholic Women's League came to protest the meeting to Socialist Mayor Hone. He had told them, however, if I prevent Mrs. Sanger from speaking because you protest, I shall also have to prevent you from speaking when others object to Catholic doctrine. Free speech must prevail in Milwaukee. Tactics aiming to bring about a reconciliation between the Anglicans and Rome had been rendered futile by the endorsement of the bishops. I suspected the demand for a clear statement from the Vatican on the question originated in the United States, where Catholic women were showing a gradual yet persistent spirit of independence. In spite of church canons, they were using contraceptives, and the church, in its wisdom, was obliged to change the law to keep its parishioners from breaking it. In December came the answer in the form of a papal encyclical. The world moved, but the pope sat still. He declared that he was looking with paternal eye as from a watchtower. But what? was he looking at? The Pope said over and over again that sexual intercourse, unless definitely designed to produce children, was against nature and a sin. He roundly condemned any contraceptive, and he affirmed that in the matter of limiting families, continence alone was permissible. Yet, in the selfsame document, he nullified his previous insistence that procreation was the sole justification of marital relations by countenancing them at times when pregnancy could not result. These times he made indefinite. They might refer to sterility, postmenopause, or the so-called safe period during the menstrual cycle. In fine, he was saying first, that you might not have intercourse unless you expected to have a child, and, in the same breath, that you might have intercourse when you could not possibly have a child. This Jesuitical inconsistency allowed a loophole for the issuance of the Latz Foundation booklet entitled The Rhythm of Sterility and Fertility in Women, published with ecclesiastical approval and recommended by Catholic societies. 
It had become part of my routine to answer every challenge to the cause, just as I tried to answer every question at a meeting. Here again was the hoary nature argument, which should have been in its grave long since. The contention that it was sin to interrupt nature in her processes was simple nonsense. The Pope frustrated her by shaving or having his hair cut. Whenever we caught a fish or shot a wolf or slaughtered a lamb, whenever we pulled a weed or pruned a fruit tree, we too frustrated nature. Disease germs were perfectly natural little fellows which had to be frustrated before we could get well. As for the alleged safe period which rhythm now set forth, what could be more unnatural than to restrict intercourse to the very time when nature had least intended it? But taking one consideration with another, it seemed to me then that the birth control idea was rolling merrily along. I could sympathize with an indignant old radical who left a birth control congress sniffing. This thing has got too darned safe for me. End of chapter 33「Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34, Part 1 Senators, Be Not Affrighted Should the federal laws be changed was the subject of my debate with Chief Justice Richard B. Russell of Georgia who had had eighteen children by two wives. I always welcomed a debate, although after the first few years it had been almost impossible to find anyone to defend the other side, and therefore I was pleased to be called to Atlanta in May 1931 for this one. The old judge, white-haired and with white eyebrows and mustache, his figure still erect, fixed me with a glance, sometimes satiric and sometimes flaming with the rage of an Old Testament prophet. He talked of the sacredness of motherhood, the home, and the state of Georgia. We don't need birth control in Georgia. We've had to give up two congressmen now because we don't have enough people. If New York wants to wipe out her population, she can. We need ours. I can take care of all the children God sent me. I believe God sent them to me because they have souls. Poodle dogs and jackasses don't have souls. I have obeyed the command of God to increase and multiply. His children and their wives and their relatives, occupying several rows of seats down front, applauded vigorously. On the train coming back, I bought a paper and noted with surprise that I had been awarded the American Women's Association Medal for Accomplishments on Behalf of Women, and was supposed to be receiving it that night in New York. I sent a telegram of thanks to Anne Morgan, saying that I had just learned about it and there was no way of my attending. It was nice to be handed a medal instead of a warrant. At the postponed dinner, organized by John A. Kingsbury, a director of the Millbank Fund, I sat there listening to the beautiful tributes and asked myself, is it really true? Am I awake or is it a dream? I never thought of the medal as being given to me as a person, but to the cause, the women I represented, and representing them— went through the act of accepting it. As I was trying to express this, a little woman who used to appear frequently on all sorts of occasions came up through the well-groomed audience, climbed to the platform, offered me a bouquet of flowers from the Brownsville mothers. "'You are our Abraham Lincoln,' she said, unconscious of the smiles, amused yet sympathetic of the audience." 
She left a kiss upon my brow and hurriedly went back to her place. To me, she embodied the spirit of Mrs. Sachs, who had died so long ago. All I was still working for, though through channels which had broadened immeasurably since then. In the beginning of the birth control movement, the main purpose had been the mitigation of women's suffering, Comstock law or no Comstock law. Its very genesis had been the conscious, deliberate, and public violation of this statute. Later, to change it became imperative, so that the millions who depended upon dispensaries and hospitals could be instructed by capable hands. In 1918, Mary Ware Dennett had dissolved the old National Birth Control League into the Voluntary Parenthood League, which had for its aim the repeal of the federal law. This seemed fine on the surface, but repeal would permit anyone to give and send contraceptive devices as well as information to anyone through the mails regardless of standards or quality. Mrs. Dennett still looked upon the movement as a free speech and free press issue, just as I had done before going to the Netherlands. Now I considered no one had sufficient knowledge of the possible consequences of some contraceptives to permit them to be manufactured or distributed without guidance or direction. They might kill the birth control movement as well as some of the women who use them. No sponsor could be found until in 1923 Senator Cummins had introduced her repeal, or so-called open bill, in which the lack of safeguards was severely criticized. Therefore, she had had it reintroduced in 1924 with a clause added that all literature containing contraceptive information must be certified by five physicians as not injurious to life or health. This bill, practically impossible of application, died in committee. Since we believed information should be disseminated only by doctors, we had kept very quiet and out of it during those years. But we had our own ideas of what sort of legislation we preferred. When Mrs. Dennett retired and her organization ceased its work, Mrs. Day, Anne Kennedy, and I, in January 1926, went down to Washington on a scouting expedition to take a survey of the mental attitude of congressmen and discover whether their reaction was more favorable towards a repeal bill or our proposal of an amended doctor's bill. We set up headquarters and began interviewing senators until we had satisfied ourselves that personal sentiment was more in favor of our policy. We thought it advisable also to sound out the Catholic stand. Getting together was the trend of the times. Eugenists, the Voluntary Parenthood League, the American Birth Control League, all were trying to meet each other people of tolerant opinions had always felt the Catholic Church was too clever to oppose a movement that inevitably it would some day have to sanction, and the tumult and interference was simply the result of local ignorance and bigotry. If we could reach the scholarly heads themselves, if we could all sit at a table and talk things over, we would find their ideals of humanitarianism were much like our own. Consequently, Anne had an interview with members of the Catholic Welfare Conference, including Monsignor John Ryan, John M. Cooper, Ph.D., Father Burke, and other prelates. We thought we would agree on the doctor's bill that they surely wanted the public safeguarded from the misuse of contraceptives. But they inequivocally set forth their objections. Not even a physician's indisputable right to save lives swayed them. 
they declared it was their office to see that no social or moral legislation passed Congress that did not conform to the tenets of Catholic doctrine. They would attempt to prevent any such bill from becoming a law. Anne wrote out a report of the interview, including this shocking statement, and showed it to them so that they might have an opportunity to correct it if they so desired. They left it essentially as written. Considering this a fundamental issue of liberty and life not affecting birth control alone, I took the presumptuous document to H. L. Mencken, supposedly the outstanding libertarian in America. He had the power to evoke a response from thinking minds, even though they were rock-bound in patriotic dogmas. He had knocked down a great many gods, chiefly along political and religious lines. Trusting that Mencken would make an effective protest in the American Mercury, I talked to him, explained the situation, predicting that if we let this go unnoticed, we should all have to endure the future consequences. He admitted the Catholic action was brazen, but mentioned the fact that he had too many friends of that faith in Baltimore for him to attack their church. I gained the impression he was out to slash and hit where the cause was obviously popular, but had no intention of leading a forlorn hope or playing the role of a pioneer for freedom. He never fulfilled the expectations I once had of him. He was not a tree-bearing fruit, but a spoon stirring around, very much of a yes, but, uh... He said, oh, yes, that is grand, but... On the other hand, there is this to be said for the other side. In our campaign of educating the public in the necessity for changing the federal statute, I began having regional conferences in the East, South, Middle West, West, and linking them all into an organization to support the bill. One of these was at Los Angeles. At first, most of the Westerners wanted an open bill, such as Mrs. Dennett's, and I stood rather alone on the doctor's amendment, which was only approved on the last night of the conference by a very narrow margin. As the people filed out, I saw at the end of the room a thin, almost emaciated woman with gray hair, somewhat shabby, but not unusually so. She held out a bony hand to clasp mine, saying practically nothing, just a word or two, and her name, Kaufman, came to me. I remembered it because Viola Kaufman had been one of the small subscribers to birth control in the past, and I was familiar with most of these names. I thought nothing further of it at the time. Wanting all the endorsement I could get for the doctor's bill, and particularly that of the American Medical Association, I made a special trip to Chicago to see Dr. Morris Fishbein, who was a power in that organization. I asked for help or advice, and offered to draw up a bill in any way which would suit them. Dr. Fishbein appeared sympathetic and turned me over to Dr. William C. Woodward, the legislative director. We had a pleasant conversation, and that was all. Though he made no comment as to its merits or demerits, I put the bill on record in their office. Tried and true friends, whose abilities and loyalties had been tested and proved, rallied round the National Committee on Federal Legislation for Birth Control, which established its headquarters in Washington in 1931. Francis Ackerman assisted my husband as treasurer. For vice president, we had Mrs. Walter Tim, who had left the League of Women Voters, a fine speaker, a clear-thinking crusader, a devoted ally of long standing. Tall, large-framed, broad-shouldered, 
She could harangue audiences in the strong, convincing, and forceful fashion of the early suffrage soapbox days. Nothing delicate or fragile. When she had an idea, it was an idea, and she stated it as an idea. More than once our bank account would have faded to a mere wraith had it not been for Ida Tim's money-raising talents. Mrs. Alexander C. Dick was secretary. She had the old-fashioned head of a daguerreotype, but was thoroughly modern in her verve and gay personality and her quick agility of mind. Since 1916, when I had first known her, she had been really interested in the research end of birth control and definitely had agreed with the then new war cry that it should be under medical supervision. It was mainly due to her and her late husband, Charles Brush of Cleveland, that Ohio had had from the beginning one of the best organized and conducted state leagues. Kate Hepburn was chairman. In her long public career, she had learned great efficiency and was so careful of minutia that she never let our witnesses run over their time. Just as we were swinging along briskly, she invariably tugged at a coat and passed over a little slip. Time up in one minute. Best of all our lobbyists was Mrs. Hazel Moore, our legislative secretary, who had left the Red Cross in the South to support us. Nothing could withstand her indefatigable enthusiasm, and it took a stout senator to harden his heart against her feminine ruses and winning manners. We now began to be initiated into the ABC of federal legislative procedure. After your bill had been drawn up, you had to find a congressman to introduce it. Sometimes he believed in it a hundred percent, Sometimes he believed in the individual a hundred percent. Sometimes he sponsored it only to be accommodating and agreeable, in which case it was called by request, a very weak way since you knew he was not going to fight for it. When introduced, the bill was read in the House or Senate and at once referred to a committee, those having to do with changing a law to the judiciary. Ours was difficult to manage at first because we were trying to alter several statutes simultaneously, not merely Section 211 and everything pertaining to males and common carriers, but also laws relating to imports. We had a general principle back of us, but we had to keep whacking off clauses so that it would not be thrown into the wrong committee. If you were fortunate enough to secure a Senate hearing for your bill, the chairman of your committee appointed a subcommittee of about three. In the House, the entire committee might attend the hearing. A day was set, and you began preparing your ammunition. The opposition was allowed an equal amount of time to the second. After the hearing, a vote was taken. If they were against it, they killed it then and there. If they recommended it, it came before the full committee, and, if then approved, went to the Senate or House for debate on the floor. To the frantic, worried, harassed, driven congressman of 1931, the announcement of a birth control bill was like a message from Mars, only less interesting and more remote. The mind of each senator resembled a telephone switchboard with his wary secretary as the operator. All the wires were tied up with foreign debts, unemployment relief, reparations, moratoriums, sales taxes, prohibition, budgets and bonuses, war and Manchuria, peace conferences, disarmament, and the tariff issues of vital concern to themselves for which they needed every vote, and their principal endeavor was not to cause conflict or get themselves disliked. What chance had we to plug in? When the vigilant secretary found we were not direct constituents, 
we were told the senator was busy, in conference, in committee, meeting an arriving delegation. Would we come back later, tomorrow, next week? Always we came back promptly and on the dot. For months it was almost impossible to see any of them. Often as many as forty calls were made, and if we succeeded in getting two interviews, we considered that a good day's work. When finally we did reach them, few of the younger, still fewer of the older senators, knew what we were talking about. When we were able to make this clear, young and old alike, just as in the state legislatures, were full of fears, fear of prejudices, fear of cloakroom joshings, mainly fear of Catholic opposition. Though Senator Norris had approved the repeal bill, he believed that ours had a better chance of passing because antagonism to the former was even greater than in 1926. He himself had muscle shoals and the lame duck amendment on his hands and several more pet projects to boot and suggested we get somebody to introduce the bill who would not be up for re-election. Our choice fell on Senator Frederick Huntington Gillette of Massachusetts, for years Speaker of the House, and now about to retire. He was a gentleman born, gray-haired, typically New England, without children or any particular philosophy regarding birth control. Our southern helpers, notably Mrs. J. B. Vanderveer, were persistent and determined. They would not be put off with polite, routine dismissals, but asked point-blank, Will you introduce this bill for us? Senator Gillette, recognizing their earnestness, agreed, but we heard no more of it. When I returned to the next session of the same Congress, someone remarked, Aren't you lucky to have had your bill introduced? What? I stared with wide-open eyes. Yes, Senator Gillette remembered it a few days before the session closed. I called on him at once. Where's our bill gone? It had gone nowhere. We'll just send it around to the Judiciary Committee, said the senator. Norris is chairman, and he's friendly. He'll pick out a good subcommittee for you. We gathered our witnesses together the night before the hearing, which was to be February 13th, and asked, What do you want to say? How long do you want in which to say it? We had eight people to testify in the space of two hours. Moments had to be carefully parceled out to each. We were permitted to deduct ten from our allotment the first day to be used the following one for a rebuttal. William E. Bora of Idaho and Sam G. Bratton of New Mexico had been assigned to us with Senator Gillette, but Bora did not appear. The audience, mostly women, crowded the committee room, imposing with marble pillars, glossy mahogany, gleaming windows. Dr. John Whitridge Williams, obstetrician-in-chief of Johns Hopkins, summed up the medical evidence for birth control. A doctor who has this information, prevention of conception, and does not give it, cannot help feeling he is taking a responsibility for the lives and welfare of large numbers of people. The Reverend Charles Francis Potter, founder of the Humanist Society of New York, discussed the moral phase. The bird of war is not the eagle, but the stork. Professor Roswell H. Johnson, then at the University of Pittsburgh, stressed eugenics. Most intelligent, well-informed people are so determined in this, spacing children, that no laws yet devised succeed in forcing a natural family, which is about 18 children, upon them. Rabbi Sidney Goldstein dealt with religious aspects. 
The population is not made up of those who are born, but is made up of those who survive. Professor of Sociology Henry Pratt Fairchild spoke from the economic point of view. We human individuals cannot break laws of nature. We can, however, choose which of her laws we see fit to obey. Mrs. Douglas Moffat announced that the 2,700 members of the New York City Junior League were overwhelmingly in favor of the bill. End of Chapter 34, Part 1「Chapter thirty four Part two of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty four Part two Senators be not affrighted. The next morning the opposition began by trying to prove that we who advocated birth control, a Russian innovation, were seeking to pull down motherhood and the family as had been done in russia the honorable mary t norton representative from new jersey made the astounding assertion that the happiest family was the big one and that a large percentage of the great men and women of this country were born poor this was a blessing since it fired them with ambition and she mentioned abraham lincoln whose birthday had been but two days before i was particularly outraged by hearing statements from other witnesses that the american federation of labor was against us that the american medical association was antagonistic and that the methodist and other churches were going to help defeat our bill speaker after speaker representing catholic organizations repeatedly hurled such dramatic tirades as i ask you gentlemen in the name of the twenty million catholic citizens of the country to whose deep religious convictions these vices are abhorrent and of all those to whom the virtue of a mother or a daughter is sacred to report unfavorably on this diabolical and damnable bill. It was difficult to gauge the impression that was being made. You could only sense that the response was one of feeling. These dogmatists, harking back to the Dark Ages, summoned to their aid the same arguments that had been used to hinder every advance in our civilization that it was against nature against god against the bible against the country's best interests and against morality even though you proved your case by statistics and reason and every known device of the human mind the opponents parroted the line of attack over and over again in the end you realized that the appeal to intelligence was futile on occasions like this the inward fury that possessed me warmed from coldness to white heat it did not produce oratory but it enabled me to move others the way to meet the opposition was to keep emotions in hand and at the same time without stumbling or fumbling to let them go every word i said was calculated and thought through not in advance, but as it came along. I did not react this way often, but I did that day. When my ten minutes for rebuttal came, I knew that emotional speed was required. Nevertheless, I first knocked down their false assertions, that the birth control movement had originated in this country during 1914, long before anyone had ever heard of Bolshevism, that the objections of the American Federation of Labor had referred to the repeal bill of 1925, quite different from the doctor's bill now under discussion, that the American Medical Association had taken no stand, but two of its most important branches, the neurological and women's medical, had gone on record in our favor 
that Dr. C. I. Wilson of the Methodist Board had denied his church was opposed, and in fact its ministers had worked unofficially for us. When someone says that the happiest families are the largest ones, and that the world's great leaders have been of large families, I would like to call to your attention that the great leader of Christianity, Jesus Christ himself, was said to be an only child. Here the Catholics crossed themselves and muttered, Blasphemy! These opponents have had the laws with them, the wealth, the press, and yet they have come today to say they are afraid of the morals of their people if they have knowledge, and they do not continue to be kept in fear and ignorance. Then I say their moral teachings are not very deep. Mr. Chairman, we say that we want children conceived in love, born of parents' conscious desire, and born into the world with sound bodies and sound minds. The two senators sat there in silence. The bill was killed, due to the adverse vote of Senator Bora, who had not attended the hearings. The next year, 1932, Senator Gillette was gone, and a substitute had to be found. Believing the first woman senator would be on the side of her sex, we asked Mrs. Hattie Carraway to introduce the bill. She said she herself was interested in the subject, but her secretary would not let her touch it. Ordinarily, congressmen paid little attention to abstract arguments, logic, or the humanitarian needs of outsiders, but they could be reached through their constituents. One way of doing this was to get women back home to help themselves directly by writing letters. This required money. We sought it from a foundation which donated $10,000 earmarked for this special purpose. To the still continuing stream of letters from mothers, requesting, as always, contraceptive advice, my reply went, I would gladly give you the information you ask for, if the law permitted. Your congressman now has the opportunity to vote on this bill. Send him a letter telling how many children you have living, how many babies dead, how many abortions, what wages your husband receives, everything you have told me. And I enclosed an envelope stamped and addressed to their respective congressmen. While walking one day through the tunnel which connected the House with the Senate, I stopped to ask a man my direction. He said, I'm going your way. Come along, I'll show you. We fell into conversation. He informed me he was a senator and asked what I was doing. I'm working on the birth control bill. That's funny. I've just had a letter from a woman five miles from where I've lived most of my life. Listen to this. And he took it out of his pocket and read the history of the woman's abortions and operations. I've never heard anything quite so awful. And at the bottom, she says, you can help me by getting this law changed, and Mrs. Sanger, who has the information, will send it to me if you get the law changed. These letters brought fine results. Through them, Senator Henry D. Hatfield of West Virginia was persuaded to introduce the bill. At the hearing, he described how, as physician and surgeon and governor of his state, he had seen the free mating of the unfit and had forced through a sterilization law. We produced our usual array of experts, and the opposition produced Dr. Howard Atwood Kelly, a famous gynecologist in his day at Johns Hopkins, but now Professor Emeritus and very old, who rambled discursively on morals. His was a state of mind, if not of reason. Dr. John A. Ryan, a member of the National Catholic Welfare Conference, chose economics for his discussion. Neither spoke on his own subject, 
but selected something on which he was not an authority. The bill was killed in committee, and the one introduced by Representative Frank Hancock of North Carolina in the House got into the wrong committee, so nothing happened. Before you had seen it, the Congress of the United States loomed impressively in your consciousness. You had a feeling, this is the greatest country in the world, this is its government, I helped to send these men here. Then you watched Congress at work, listened to it, and were disillusioned. A few years of sitting in the gallery and looking down gave you less respect for the quality of our representatives, less faith in legislative action, and you wondered whether those who had already abandoned hope of obtaining relief in this way and resorted to direct action had not perhaps the right idea. The same arguments went on from year to year. A certain amount of publicity was secured. A certain number were educated. Some of our followers, in face of the evidence to the contrary, were still confident that if the Catholics understood our bill, they would not obstruct it. They said Representative Arthur D. Healy of Massachusetts, a member of the Judiciary Committee, although a Catholic, was so liberal that if he could once be made to see the reasons back of it, he would cease being openly hostile, and it might even get out of committee. Accordingly, I went to his office. We talked at length, and again got nowhere. As I was leaving, this father of four said, in order to explain himself, You see, Mrs. Sanger, I'm just one of those unusual men who are very fond of children. I was inwardly convulsed at the thought that he considered himself unusual and that we were all a lot of Herods trying to do away with babies. At first it seemed that I was to have greater success as the result of my interview with Dr. Joseph J. Mundell, professor of obstetrics at Georgetown University who advised the Catholic Welfare Conference on all their medical legislation. In a private session, I conceded some things in the bill. Dr. Mundell gave up certain others. The compromise apparently suited everybody. In 1934, identical bills were introduced in Senate and House. The latter, by Representative Walter M. Pierce, Democrat, who as governor of Oregon had burned his political bridges by vetoing a bill which permitted parochial schools. Since he had nothing to lose, he did not have to play politics. Hatton W. Summers of Texas was chairman of the hearing. Our side led off, again specialists in each line covering the vital points. Rabbi Edward L. Israel of Baltimore made an impassioned plea. And I say, gentlemen, if this thing we are now advocating is not morally right, let us stop being hypocrites and in its place put a law on our statute books that will drive contraceptive devices out of your homes and mine. Here, John C. Lair of Michigan sitting back in his chair with thumbs hitched in his suspenders, declared pompously, As a member of this committee, I want to go on record there have never been any contraceptives used in my home. I have six children, too. Malcolm C. Tarver of Georgia interrupted, You don't mean any member of Congress has used anything of that kind, do you? His surprise was obviously genuine. The proponents of our bill, even elderly women, had stood while delivering their testimony. But when Father Charles E. Coughlin entered, cheeks very pink over his black collar, a chair was placed for him, because as a representative of the church he would not stand before a representative body of the state. He began talking at random. 
I have not heard one word of the testimony these ladies and gentlemen have produced, and my remarks are not addressed to them now, because I can easily handle them over the radio Sunday after Sunday. You, gentlemen, you are married men, all of you, and you know more about it than I will ever know. Here he arched his eyebrows into a leer. The chairman, I understand, is a bachelor like myself. We know how these contraceptives are bootlegged in the corner drug stores surrounding our high schools. Why are they around the high schools? To teach them how to fornicate and not get caught. All this bill means is how to commit adultery and not get caught. Some of our sympathizers walked out of the room. Two congressmen left the table, but we were a polite, well-behaved group that shrank from scenes, and though furious and indignant, we allowed him to conclude his half-hour of grossness. I could hardly believe my ears when Dr. Mundell, who shortly before had helped us formulate a bill which he said was satisfactory to him, rose and deliberately betrayed us by stating there was no need for legislation whatsoever because a recent scientific work, by which he meant rhythm, had shown that fertility in women could be reckoned with almost mathematical precision. In the rebuttal, Dr. Prentice Wilson testified that the theory of the cycle of sterility had no medical standing. Then came my turn. I had in my pocket a copy of Rhythm and quoted from it. Under the heading of procreation, it asked whether married people were obliged to bring into the world all the children they could, and then made answer, Far from being an obligation, such a course may be utterly indefensible. Broadly speaking, Married couples have not the right to bring into the world children whom they are unable to support, for they would thereby inflict a grievous damage upon society. I told the committee that apparently the only distinction in the pros and cons of the birth control question was that the method we advocated was a scientific one under the supervision of doctors. That of the Catholics had not been proved scientifically, and was open to any boy or girl who could read the English language. Nevertheless, the bill again died in committee. The Senate hearings on the bill, introduced by our old friend Daniel O. Hastings of Delaware, did not come until March. We presented our advocates— among them a miner's wife from West Virginia, the native state of two members of the committee, Hatfield and Neely. She was a perfect illustration of the type which most needed birth control. When she had finished, a Catholic woman asked her, Which of your nine children would you rather see dead? Oh, I don't want to see any of them dead. I love them all but I don't love those I haven't had. Her reply was just right. It could not have been better. Vito Seleccia, my former coal and ice vendor from 14th Street, also made his way to Washington and told his simple story. His wife had come to me when pregnant with her fourth child, and I had said I could do nothing for her until she had had her baby. Now, many years afterwards, she had no more than the four. Vito reasoned his case as a man. I am Catholic myself. The Catholics say we should have much children. I say different. I say it is not good to have too many children. You can't take care of them. He ended by describing the mother of six who lived next door to him. I told her, I will take you to a place. It is a wonderful place. She does not know the English language. Therefore, she has never come up to see Mrs. Sanger, but she will. 
but she will. For the first time, the Senate subcommittee reported out the bill, and it was put on the unanimous consent calendar. The last day of the session came, June 13th. Over 200 were ahead of it, but there was always hope. One after another, they were hurried through, and then, miracle of miracles, hours passed with no voice raised against it. The next one came up, was also converted into law, another up for discussion, tabled. Twenty minutes went by. Suddenly, Senator Pat McCarran from Reno, Nevada, famous divorce lawyer, though an outstanding Catholic, came rushing in from the cloakroom and asked for unanimous consent to recall our bill. As a matter of senatorial courtesy, Senator Hastings granted his request. Had he not done so, Senator McCarran would have objected to every bill he introduced thereafter. It was summarily referred back to the committee and there died. In 1935, we took the fatal step of having it voted on early in the session and it was promptly killed. The whole year's labor was lost. The following winter, when I was in India, Percy Gassaway of Oklahoma introduced a bill in the House, Royal S. Copeland of New York in the Senate, by request. Neither one reached a hearing. Another line of attack on the Comstock Law was to try for a liberal interpretation through the courts. Among the products shown at the Zurich Conference in 1930 had been a Japanese pessary. Pursuing the clinic policy of testing every new contraceptive that appeared, I ordered some of these from a Tokyo physician. When notified by the customs that they had been barred entrance and destroyed, we sent for another shipment addressed to Dr. Stone, in the hope that it would then be delivered to a physician. But this also was refused, and accordingly we brought suit in her name. After pending two years, the case finally came up for trial before Judge Grover Moskowitz of the Federal District Court of Southern New York. Morris Ernst conducted our claim brilliantly. On January 6, 1936, Judge Moskowitz decided in our favor. The wording of the statute seemed to forbid the importation of any article for preventing conception, but he believed that the statute should be construed more reasonably. The government at once appealed, and the case was argued in the Circuit Court of Appeals before Judges Augustus N. Hand, Learned Hand, and Thomas Swan, whose unanimous decisions were rarely reversed in the Supreme Court. In the fall of 1936, while I was in Washington getting the federal bill started again in advance of Congress's meeting, news came that the three judges had upheld the Moskowitz decision and had added that a doctor was entitled not only to bring articles into this country, but more important, to send them through the mails and finally to use them for the patient's general well-being which for twenty years had been the object of my earnest endeavor. The government still had the right to appeal inside of ninety days. Therefore, I was not unduly jubilant. We had had so many seeming victories that melted away afterwards. But long before the period of grace had expired, Attorney General Cummings announced to the press that the government would accept the decision as law and, with commendable consistency, the Secretary of the Treasury sent word to the Customs at once that our shipments should be admitted. It is really a relief to be able to say something good about the government. In the face of the court decision, there was little point at this time in continuing the federal campaign. The money for closing it up came through a most unexpected and affecting channel. 
about a year after I had seen Viola Kaufman at the California conference in 1931, I received a letter from her asking me please to write out the form in which I would like any money left so that she could designate it in her will. I took her clear, concise note to my attorney, who suggested that, since organizations were many and might go out of existence at any moment, it would be wiser to have the bequest in my name to be dispensed for any purpose within the movement I saw fit. I answered her to this effect, and she replied, I am now passing over to you in my will whatever I possess. I considered that the only courteous thing to do was to have Anna Lifshitz, who was living in Los Angeles, go to see Miss Kaufman. The address was in the Mexican district, in the poorest, most dilapidated, run-down section. In patched clothes, she came to the door of her house, in which there was hardly any furniture. She was formal and rather cold. Anna merely explained the reason for her call was that she knew Miss Kaufman as one of our subscribers. She wrote me, That poor creature hasn't money enough to keep body and soul together. Two years went by. I was in Washington, preparing to start for Boston for a meeting when a messenger boy delivered a telegram from the director of the General Hospital at Memphis, Tennessee, requesting me to come at once. Viola Kaufman was dangerously ill with pneumonia and asking for me. I looked up trains. It would take 48 hours, and so I put in a long-distance call to the director, who told me she had died during the night. What was she doing in Memphis? We don't know. The Salvation Army brought her into us. She has only a little cash tied up in a handkerchief. We can't do anything without you because you're the beneficiary. The undertaker also wanted an order from me, and since her executor, an officer of a bank in Los Angeles, had gone on a fishing trip, I arranged the details for her cremation. She had ordered that her remains be sent to me, and when they arrived, the clinic staff came up to Willow Lake, and we held a little memorial service of gratitude and respect, spreading the ashes over the rock garden. To everybody's astonishment, Viola Kaufman had about $30,000 in Los Angeles realty. But it took a year and a half to settle the estate, and by this time everything was at the lowest ebb of the Depression. We received approximately $12,000. I have never looked at the obituaries for the last 20 years without hoping to read that someone has willed a million dollars for birth control. But the only legacy ever bequeathed us was that saved from the meager earnings of this schoolteacher, Viola Kaufman, who herself lived in poverty. With this money, we wrote Fini to the federal legislation. Of the old organization, all that was left in Washington was a secretary to read the congressional record daily a watchdog to report any bills proposed which would make it necessary for us to jump into action to combat them. Six years of this work had cost $150,000. It had also meant strain and worry beyond anything I had ever attempted, never being able to detach myself from it, whether Congress was in session or not, always on the alert to discover any new person elected who might be favorably disposed. Now and again, it had been discouraging. You could exert yourself to the utmost with pleasure if it were a matter of convincing a person and watching his mind being pried open. But here, over and over again, you saw this same conviction, 
yet he reverted to the same fears and refrained from doing anything. However, the process of enlightening legislators had also unclosed the eyes of an enormous number of organizations. First to approve publicly had been the National Council of Jewish Women. Eventually, more than a thousand clubs, civic, political, religious, and social, including the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the YWCA, local junior leagues, in all representing between 12 and 13 million members, had given their endorsement. And, more important than anything else, the public had been educated persistently, consistently away from casual and precarious contraceptive advice into the qualified hands of the medical profession. Dr. Dickinson had been appearing regularly at American Medical Association meetings, keeping the question constantly alive. But not until Dr. Prentice Wilson had formed a national body of doctors in 1935 to carry on legislative work had there been any action. One had stirred up, the other organized. I was at Willow Lake one June morning of 1937 when I saw spread across the newspaper in double column the glad tidings. The Committee on Contraception of the American Medical Association had informed the convention that physicians had the legal right to give contraceptives, and it recommended that standards be investigated and technique be taught in medical schools. In my excitement, I actually fell downstairs. To me, this was really a greater victory than the Moskowitz decision. Here was the culmination of unremitting labor ever since my return from Europe in 1915, the gratification of seeing a dream come true. These specific achievements are significant because they open the way to a broader field of attainment and to research which can immeasurably improve methods now known making possible the spread of birth control into the forlorn, overpopulated places of the earth, and permitting science eventually to determine the potentialities of a posterity conceived and born of conscious love. End of Chapter 34, Part 2「Chapter thirty five part one of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty five part one A Past which is gone for ever. Parenthood remains unquestionably the most serious of all human relationships, the most far reaching in its power for good or for evil and withal the most delicately complex. I always tried to secure my son's confidence by being honest with them, treating them as though they had intelligence and expecting them to use it. For the sake of companionship, it was essential to be honest, no matter what the cost. Fortunately, the younger generation is not crumpled up when sharply confronted with the truth. They have cut through the regard to their feelings until they can say extraordinarily blunt things to each other and yet not be hurt. And with this they have invented a new language. They can take it. Many times I could have forced my opinion on the boys and saved Fern perhaps some bitter disappointments. Let me do it. I'll manage all this. Let me know when you need anything. But instead, I merely stated my attitude and said, Here are the two alternatives. You want this. I think the other is better. Neither of us can tell which is right. If you choose your own way, I'll help you, as long as you do it well. 
providing you stop as soon as you know it is wrong and go back and pick up the other. If experience teaches you a greater wisdom, you can call it square. At Petty Institute, Stuart was paying more attention to sports than studies. It was easy for him to be an athlete, but he also had a logical mind and a quick ability for coordinating hand and brain. When he was ready for college, he entered Sheffield Scientific School of Yale University. His imagination was soon captured by archaeology and medicine, but his course was already set. Meanwhile, Grant, who had been inclined to hero-worship his older brother, had also gone to Petty. His athletics left little opportunity for bringing out his artistic talents, and he agreed to take his last two years at Westminster School in Simsbury, Connecticut, where he was encouraged to develop along his own lines. In his sophomore year at Princeton, he still had no idea of what he wanted to do with his life. Although he had a leaning towards diplomacy, which would include training in law, I explained to him that, since the family had no political influence, it might lead to being a small politician. And so I made out a list of as many occupations known to man as I could think of, and sent them to him, telling him to mark off with a blue pencil those which he was perfectly sure did not appeal to him, and check with red those for which he felt some predilection. Out immediately went piano mover, waiter, floor walker, bank manager, bookkeeper, and some fifty others. Six months later, I returned him the red-checked list for further perusal. Now his preferences were much more definite. Research, journalism, editorial work, diplomacy were again read, but almost everything else marked headed him for a scientific career. The decision made, Grant began his pre-medical course. After Stewart graduated from Yale, he moved downtown to Wall Street and continued in a broker's office all during the Depression. But in this money-making atmosphere, his attitude was changing. He had concluded that serving humanity was a higher fulfillment than profiting at humanity's expense, and medicine seemed the career which he also liked best. Having found out, he had the courage to start back at the beginning to accomplish it. We made a compact for him to go as far as he could and test whether his interest kept up. First, he had to acquire sufficient chemistry and biology, going to Columbia University in the daytime for the former, to New York University in the evening for the latter, preparing his lessons until three in the morning. The next year, he passed his entrance examinations. Following the legislative near victory in the winter of 1934, I resolved to go to Russia to see for myself what was happening in the greatest social experiment of our age. With keen anticipation, I looked forward to discovering whether the Marxian philosophy dramatized and realized and based on an economic ideology, did not have to accept some of the philosophy of Malthus. Grant, then about to enter his final year at Cornell Medical School, was eager to investigate the progress of medicine in the Soviet Union and made up his mind to come along. I was taking also my secretary, Florence Rose, efficient, competent in any capacity, whether field organizing or in the office. Though but recently enlisted in the movement, she had come more with the attitude of the early days, not for what she could get out of it, but for what she could give to its furtherance. 
Her talents and enthusiasm, when added to her cheerfulness, made her a rare combination. Always gleeful and bubbling with fun, she carried out nearly everything in that spirit. Mrs. Ethel Clyde, an officer of the Federal Legislative Organization, was to be the fourth of our little group within a large group. When zeal for the new civilization in Russia had been at its height, she had relinquished her expensive Park Avenue apartment for a smaller one on a side street, and contributed the difference in rent to sundry leftist causes and birth control. At the last moment, it seemed we might not be able to go. For some years, Stuart had had a bad sinus condition, and hardly had he matriculated at Cornell in the fall of 1933 when he had been struck by a squash racket, fracturing the bone over his eye. That winter he had been operated on nine times. A week before I was due to sail, this doctor advised that he have an exploratory operation. I rushed up from Washington, where the legislative work for that session was just being wound up, and would have abandoned the Russian expedition had not the operation apparently been entirely successful. Stuart insisted that I go. Since he was in no danger, I continued with my plans. It was not feasible to travel in Russia except in a party under official guidance. Three people I knew who had gone by themselves described how train after train had passed them. Boat after boat had steamed down the Volga with no accommodations available. Therefore, we chose the nonpartisan Second Russian Seminar. Shortly prior to leaving, I spent an evening with Maurice Hindus, Will Durant, John Kingsbury, and doctors Hannah and Abraham Stone, all of whom had been to Russia the previous year. Maurice Hindus had returned impersonal and still unprejudiced, Will Durant utterly antagonistic, John Kingsbury full of fervor, and both Stones warmly disposed. They had all been in Moscow, practically at the same time, for approximately the same number of days, and all had received utterly dissimilar impressions. Even pictures that Will Durant had taken were not the same as those of John Kingsbury or Dr. Stone, snapped from almost identical places, thus showing me how wide might be the variety of responses depending on the individual bias. I expected to keep my eyes open, to think independently, to ask questions and compare. I was going to use as much sanity and fairness as I possessed, and not be swept emotionally into any current of opinion. Billy Barber was the manager of the seminar, and I did not envy him his job. There were many complaints and stupid remarks, and much fault-finding. Most of the party were going merely to be able to say those things were true, which they had previously said were true. I asked one woman, who went on every sightseeing expedition but never got out of the bus, Why did you come? Oh, just to wipe Russia off my list. Edward Allsworth Ross was among the leaders. He was the only person who had been there under the former regime some twenty years earlier, and had an authoritative basis of contrast between the old and the new. We all rather sat at his feet. He was a typical professor, wore enormously high, stiff collars, played checkers with anybody who would indulge him, and was upset when he failed to win. His personality was impressive, literally so, because wherever you looked, you spied him. 
One of the funniest sights was to see this Nordic giant, six feet four, walking with short, dark Florence Rose, five feet two, each jollying the other. We scooted through England across to Copenhagen, about which I recall very little. I was always trying to learn what advance the women's movement had made, but somebody was always trying to tell me how marvelous the city was. Remembering Ellen Key, I reached Scandinavia with great hopes for feminism. But the women who were considered the most intelligent were complacently resting on their laurels. The older ones still reigned supreme and believed that, because they had won their battles of twenty-five years ago, there was nothing left to fight for. The younger group found it hard to arise above the inertia of this overwhelming prestige. Since population was not a problem in Scandinavia, they were interested chiefly in eugenics and had almost forgotten the aspect of individual suffering. At Oslo, a number of us went on pilgrimage to the grave of Ibsen. As I stood there in silent tribute, I had the feeling he had understood women and the ties they had been loosening. To my mind, Nora never went back to the doll's house. Her evolution was too complete. Or, if she did return, she entered by another door. Mr. Barber had arranged to feed his hundred and six charges at the last Finnish railroad station. There was a particular exhilaration about the prospect of that meal, because it was to be our final one before crossing into famine-stricken Russia. We arrived at ten in the morning, all of us hungry. As we filed into the station, our eyes met the most gorgeous panorama. Long tables, beautifully laid out with delicious meats, fish, breads, compotes. While we paused, debating which of these delicacies to taste first, there came a stampede of fifty other Americans, a tourist group led by Sherwood Eddy. Never had I seen such an exhibition. The men, unshaven, hatless, coatless, pushed and shoved around, in front of and almost on top of the tables. The best we could do was find comfortable seats from which we could have a good view of the riot. The meal prepared by the railroad with such courtesy for our party was demolished by another. Barber and Eddie eventually discovered it was all a mistake. The train carrying the Eddieites had failed to stop at the town where their repast had been awaiting them, and naturally they supposed this breakfast was theirs. At Leningrad, we were met by buses and driven through streets that swarmed with imperturbable, peasant-like people. The upper parts of their Mongolian-shaped heads all looked exactly the same. I noticed how immaculate they were, Faces, necks, hands were white as white and displayed a cleanliness simply marvelous when you took into consideration the difficulty of securing soap and water. Very few were old. Many were children, apparently between the ages of two to twelve. But in the expressions of all, I glimpsed a sadness. The former capital was depressing and down at heels, shabby, and in need of painting. Yet it was beyond comparison in its spacious dignity. The architectural design of the houses could not be hidden. My high-ceilinged room at the Astoria was luxurious with alcove bed, bathroom, and large marble tub, which, although cracked and spotted with rust, Nevertheless, evidence the days of splendor, when the hotel had been frequented by the aristocracy of the old regime. From my window, I could see the cobbled square, 
It was eight o'clock, and the city was awakening. I watched the passing show. Heavy wagons were drawn by a single and often most decrepit horse, with what seemed a dark brown rainbow, arched and graceful, over his neck. Cues formed in front of little stands that served rations of beer or bottled soda water. Some women, the varying colors in their shawls making bright splotches, swept the car tracks with birch switches or pushed empty carts on their way to market. Others carried hods of cement up the ladders to the masons on the new buildings being erected everywhere. Usually the men were doing the skilled work, and women, hardy and robust, with strong legs, bare feet, sunburned faces, were kept at the laborious, monotonous, physical labor until such time as they could qualify as expert artisans. The communists' apartments were much better, lighter, airier, cleaner, more modern than those for non-party members. When we asked why, in an equalitarian state, one section should be thus privileged, we were answered, it was they who made all this possible. Why should they not have the best? What you bourgeois give to your capitalists, we give to our communists. We asked Tanya, our guide, if she were a communist, and she replied, Oh, no, that's too hard. Ordinary citizens might be excused for a mistake or even a crime, but party members could have no human frailties. They were exiled or perhaps shot for cheating, stealing, deceiving, exploiting, taking money under false pretenses, or many things which average people could do and be punished with fines alone. Although the cost of the trip itself was relatively low, whatever we bought in Russia was excessively high, owing to the peculiar situation of the ruble. In the first place, there was no ruble. It existed only in theory. Second, Every foreigner was supposed to deal exclusively with the Torgson stores through which the government had cleverly contrived to come by a hoard of foreign currency by charging 78 cents in our money for each ruble instead of its actual value of 5 cents. For example, the price of a stamp on a letter to the United States, which was two and a half rubles, amounted to $2. Mrs. Clyde, who leaned sympathetically towards communism, said to one of our young men, Let me get you a little present. Not here, he said. It will be too expensive. Oh, yes, she insisted. What would you like? Well, a bar of almond chocolate, then. She had to pay ten American dollars for that ten-cent bar of chocolate her communism melted slightly. Ultimately, we solved the ruble problem. One morning, a boy who had been loitering around the Astoria asked Grant, Would you like me to take you through the city? Grant prudently inquired, How much? It appeared that the boy merely desired an opportunity to perfect his English. He had plenty of rubles, which he was glad to dispose of at the rate of fifty for a dollar. Russians could obtain none but the cheapest commodities on their tickets. If they wanted luxuries such as good shirts, leather or rubber boots, and other articles sold only at Torgson, they were obliged to surrender some treasured gold piece or use foreign money. With an ample supply of rubles, I sent long, elaborate cables to Stuart to cheer him up. He must have thought an excessive maternal solicitude was getting the better of my economic judgment. But, as a matter of fact, one of twenty words was costing me less than twenty-five cents. Dr. Nadina Kavanicki, 
who had been interested in birth control in the United States, had given me a letter to her father, Dr. Reinstein, once a dentist in Rochester, New York, now in Stalin's close confidence. He came to see me about 11.30 one night, the Russian calling hour, and we talked until three in the morning. When he wanted to know my impressions of Russia, I said promptly, It seems to me your policy of overcharging us is a mistake. For the sake of a few dollars, you are creating ill will, just as the French have done. In our own seminar, we have twenty librarians, and perhaps double that number of school teachers and students, many of whom have gone without other vacations to come here. They have a unique opportunity to influence people. Everybody will ask them when they get back, did you like Russia? You are trying to build up a favorable public opinion abroad, and these people are the best mediums for that purpose. If they are pleased, they will fight for you and break down prejudice. But he was not convinced, and, evoking the specter of the Tsarist debt to America, he replied, We'll bleed you. We'll milk you. We'll get every dollar out of you we can. America demands her pound of flesh, and this is how we'll pay you. The occasions for receiving pleasant impressions were offered by vigorous tours to points of interest. We were given a choice of hard buses or harder ones, all, in my experience, springless and clattering noisily over the cobble-paved streets. After a few bumps, we usually hit the roof and came down with headaches. Our poor little guides had to screech with full lung power to be heard over the incessant rattling. One morning, when driving back from sightseeing, the motor gasped and collapsed on a slight hill. Passengers volunteered helpful suggestions. Put it in low. Put it in neutral. Push this. Pull that. The driver moved gears forward and backward and then looked around at us in perplexity. I did, but it won't work. We waited and waited and waited and waited. Somebody ran a mile to telephone that we were stranded and needed another bus. Meanwhile, everything we wanted to see was closing, and we had already learned that whatever you missed in Russia— was always the most worthwhile. In fact, it seemed they had visiting hours timed to end five minutes before you got there. Several other buses came along and stopped. Their drivers got out, poked their heads under the hood, began taking things apart, strewing bolts this way and nuts that. Then they, too, became discouraged and, leaving increased confusion, climbed on their chariots again, and went on. Finally, some bright young man discovered we were out of gas. As we crossed the huge square in front of the hotel, I saw directly ahead of us an enormous pile of bricks with wide spaces on both sides. Closer and closer we came. When will the driver turn? I asked myself. But he never did. We went right over the top, and the bricks slipped out from under. That was the Russian system. You could not go round an obstacle. You must go over it. End of Chapter 35, Part 1 Chapter 35, Part 2 of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 35, Part 2 A Past Which Is Gone Forever. Enlarged portraits of Lenin and Stalin were in all public buildings. Their statues were everywhere, in every square, on every corner. 
A major industry of Russia seemed to be to find new poses for Stalin, standing up, lying down, writing, reading. Often just his head, definitely recognizable in spite of the predominance of red, was designed in flower beds. One of the most delicate attentions was to give him a different colored necktie on different days. The plants were kept in pots to make this charming gesture possible. After the revolution when peace had come, connoisseurs from various countries had been invited to examine the recovered statues, rugs, tapestries, and objets d'art stolen from the palaces and churches. One by one the priceless paintings were displayed, specialists rendered their opinions, commercial dealers furnished appraisals, stenographers took down every word. The same was done with the lapis lazuli tables, the snuff boxes, the court jewels. The interesting part of the new arrangement was that the interpretation was entirely Marxian. Pictures, instead of being hung according to the orthodox history of art, were fitted into the Industrial Revolution. A certain Madonna was not admired for its qualities of color or form, or as a thing of beauty in itself. The guide explained to you that it was created at such and such a time when the church was trying to get a hold over the people, when artists were starving and had to look for their means of livelihood to the patronage of the church. Later, in the Kremlin at Moscow, we saw fantastic and incredible riches, jeweled saddles, a whole set of harness studded with turquoise, a huge casket cloth embroidered with thousands of pearls. In order to place the period of the latter, I asked Tanya where it had come from. She replied in her precise English, You see, it is for to cover the dead. You see, in Russia there was such a custom. When they died, they put them in the ground. It was such a custom, you see, to cover them with cloths. She spoke of the czarist regime as though it had been centuries ago. One of the pictures was a Christ removed from the cross and lying on the ground. Tanya said, People used to come here, and they even kissed it. This she uttered in the tone of scorn of a very youthful generation shocked and horrified at the ancient traditions. Our hope is in the young people, she said frequently. But how old are you? Oh, I'm thirty-two, as though she were doddering. Grant and I were once walking by a group of children when a small boy pointed at us and remarked, Ah, there go some of the dying race. To them, all Americanski were capitalists. The Marxian ideology had been applied to every phase of life. H.G., accompanied by Jip, his biologist son, had flown over from London. Since he wanted an opportunity to go around alone, he rather resented being so closely guarded and courteously guided. After talking with Stalin, he had come to the conclusion that the dictator had no understanding of economics. He was somewhat annoyed at the constant interpretation of everything in terms of politics and of having marks stuffed down his throat at every turn. At the schools, you might ask what kind of mathematics they taught. Marx. And what system of engineering? Marx. No matter what the question, the answer was Marx. The anti-religious museum, once a cathedral, was directly across from the Astoria, each half hour, little girls, who seemed hardly more than ten or twelve, their sleeves hanging down over their fingertips, 
with great dignity conducted excursions of peasants through. Their lecture started with the fundamental principle that the earth was round. A bas relief of the world was underneath the huge pendulum which hung from the dome. If you stood there long enough, you saw it swing from one point to a further one. They were trying to show that it was within man's power to make his own heaven. Here were kept the relics of the churches, the icons laden with silver and gold wrung from the poor peasants in the past. Actual concrete things were reduced to their simplest terms on large poster-type murals which depicted stories, unnecessary practice, since the muzzocks were so generally illiterate. In one, a kulak was coming to the priest with a sick child in his arms, asking for prayers to cure its illness. The priest, fat and clad in rich robes, shook his head, saying, You must bring money for the saint. The saint will not cure your child unless her arms are covered with silver. But the kulak had only his farm. Mortgage it and get the money, the priest ordered. Soon the kulak returned with silver, and the mural showed how now the saint's arm was almost hidden. But still the child remained sick. The saint's halo is bare, said the priest. At last the whole figure was silvered, but the baby died just the same. Opposite this mural was pictured the Soviet way. Their father carried the baby to the hospital, where nurses with gauze across their mouths took it preciously, bathed it carefully, laid it in bed. The entire sterilizing process was illustrated. The doctor in white gown and cap, scrubbing and washing each hand five minutes as marked by a clock. Finally, you saw the child, healthy and well, jumping into its mother's arms. The people stood there looking, their imaginations fired. They said, this is what is happening to us. Most particularly, I wanted to investigate what had been done for women and children in Russia, to learn whether they had been given the rights and liberties due them in any humanitarian civilization. Grant, Rose, as she was known to me, and I went to the Institute of Protection of Motherhood and Childhood, a vast establishment stretching over several miles, with model clinics, nurseries, milk centers, and educational laboratories. I was overwhelmed in contemplating the undertaking. There was no doubt that the government was exerting itself strenuously to teach the rudiments of hygiene to an enormous population that had previously known nothing of it. Russia was also aiming to free women from the two bonds that enslaved them most, the nursery and the kitchen. All over the country were creches connected with the places they worked. Children were the priceless possessions of Russia. Their time was planned for them from birth to the age of sixteen, when they were paid to go to college, if they so desired. No longer were they a drain or a burden to their families. Not only were teachers or parents forbidden to inflict corporal punishment, but children might even report their parents for being vindictive, ill-humored, disorderly, and in many cases they did so. In one divorce dispute as to custody of the offspring, the father argued that the mother was bad. The judge asked, Of what does her badness consist? She is nervous and loses her temper. The judge agreed she was not fit for motherhood. Furthermore, Russia was investing in future generations by building a healthy race. If there were any scarcity of milk, the children were supplied first, the hospitals second, members of the Communist Party third, 
industrial groups fourth, professional classes fifth, and old people over fifty had to scrape along on what they could get, unless they were parents of communists or closely associated with them. I was eager also to find out what had been done about the study carried on by Professor Tushnoff of the Institute for Experimental Medicine on so-called spermatoxin, a substance which, it had been rumored, produced temporary sterility in women. I made an appointment with him, but a shock awaited me. He had tried out his spermatoxin on thirty women, twenty-two of whom had been made immune for from four to five months, but now all laboratory workers had been taken from pure research and set at utilitarian tasks such as the practical effects of various vocations on women's health. Nothing concerning immunization to conception could be published in Soviet Russia. No information could be given out under penalty of arrest. And moreover, nothing could appear in a foreign paper which had not already been printed in Russia. In Tourist, the Government Tourist Bureau, and Vox, the All-Union Society for Cultural Relations with Foreign Countries, had asked me when I had first arrived whom I wished to see and where I wished to go, and had offered to call up people on my list and arrange for visits, a service which had saved me much trouble and expense. In spite of this cooperative attitude, I was suspicious that much was being hidden from us, before I had left America, I had heard I could see only what Russia presented for window dressing, and with this in mind, I was on the alert. Both Grant and I wondered how the hospitals built under the czars compared with recent ones. When I asked to be taken to a certain one, I was assured it was too far away, and anyhow, it was being renovated. There was nobody there. I said to myself, Aha, here is one of the forbidden sights. Whoever heard of a hospital equipped to handle thousands of patients being utterly empty? They are not going to let us see this because it might speak in favor of the old in contrast to the new. Politely but firmly, I insisted. Again, I was told there were so many other interesting things, it would be a pity to waste my time going to see it. I found it difficult to say anything further without giving offense. Then Grant encountered a young American nurse from the Presbyterian Hospital in New York who spoke Russian. She also wanted to visit hospitals. We engaged a car of our own and drove a good fifteen miles out of the city over horrible roads, winding and dusty and badly paved, and even pushing on as rapidly as we could, we did not get there until late in the afternoon. To our dismay, we discovered not a patient, doctor, or nurse in the place, only plasterers, painters, carpenters, and cleaners, pulling down and refurbishing. We had lost half a day and were a little ashamed of our lack of faith. The night came to take the train for Moscow. Nobody called all aboard in Russia. Trains went right off underneath you when you had one foot on the platform and one on the step. They just moved and moved fast. But we clambered on and soon the leather seats were made into our beds. They were so slippery that we kept falling out. Once at Moscow, we who were coming second class, according to Marxian procedure, received the worst rooms at the hotel. Those who traveled third had the best. I could not applaud the one selected for me. It was directly over the laundry, and the smells of cooking and suds floated through the window. I refused to stay, and was accommodated on the top floor, 
where the servants had once lived. Moscow was as different from Leningrad as New York City from a sleepy Pennsylvania town. The people walked more quickly and seemed to be going somewhere, not simply wandering listlessly. Bedlam existed at the hotels, but by now we were beginning to learn that the Russians were so concerned with their own efficiency that they had no time to do anything. To be in a hurry merely complicated matters. I could wait, but for the energetic Rose it was torture. To all specific requests they replied, It cannot be. It cannot be. She had her own methods of coping with this, saying she did not wish to hear the word impossible. She had no intention of asking the impossible. Then, when they procrastinated with a little later, she countered, In America, we say now. Her triumph over dilatoriness came on health day. Since health was almost a god in Russia, all activities ceased on that occasion, and the populace of Moscow came together on Red Square. The spectacle was to start at two in the afternoon, but before it was light, you could hear the songs of men, women, and children moving towards their appointed stations. Out of our party, only thirty were privileged to receive tickets, and their names were posted. Mrs. Clyde and I were on the list, but not Grant or Rose. The previous day the numbers were cut to twenty. That morning there were but sixteen, and feeling ran high. Why haven't I a ticket? Fortunately for me, I had been invited to lunch by Ambassador William C. Bullitt, who entertained lavishly and was helpful to traveling Americans. When I had met him back in New England, I had never thought of him as an ambassador, nor as a man skilled in dealing with the great problems that required strategy, diplomacy, political sagacity, and a prime knowledge of economics and history. I considered him rather as amusing, an excellent dinner host, and one to whom you could go when in difficulty, sure that he would get you out. Perhaps this was what Russia wanted at that time more than anything else. No doubt he was then somewhat disappointed at the turn relations between Russia and the United States had taken. Russians on the whole admired him. They had not forgotten that, although he was not counted a proletarian or in the category of Jack Reed, he had lifted the cudgels for them in the early days when friends were needed. The ambassador's little daughter, Anne, aged ten, officiated at the head of the table, apparently enjoying herself. The house in which they were living while the new embassy was being built had an architecture quite befitting what I imagined the style of Russia should be, a bit of the Kremlin, a bit of a mosque, and a bit of an Indian palace. On the way to the square after luncheon, a wave of people surged between the rest of the diplomatic party and myself. But I kept saying diplomatique, and was bowed through to the grandstand. Meanwhile, Rose had been devoting her whole attention to tickets, and there were no tickets. The lucky holders lined up and filed off under a leader. Rose, the ever-resourceful, donned a red bandana and said to the forgotten men in the party, "'We'll make our own battalion.' She handed out slips of paper about the size of the tickets and then started, Grant and the Harvard professors following her through the blare of music and the tramping troops and the pageantry of blue trunks and white shirts, orange trunks and cerise shirts. Whenever anyone stopped Rose, she pointed ahead and repeated my open sesame, diplomatique, and they let her by until she reached the last barrier. 
There the guard was suspicious of her password and challenged her. Then she spied another group coming up, dashed over to the leader, and exclaimed, Quick, please explain that our interpreter has gone on with our tickets. The woman looked unbelieving, but still others arrived at that moment, and the Russian system collapsed under pressure. In they all piled, and Rose turned to her unknown benefactress. You don't know how grateful I am to you for getting us in. The reply was, You don't know how grateful I am to you for getting us in. I am a tourist too, and we have no tickets either. Nobody seeing Moscow that day could have thought it a somber place. It was alive with song, happy faces, bright attire. The parade of a hundred thousand or more was one of the most marvelous spectacles for color, form, cadence, geometrical precision that I had ever seen human beings accomplish. Men and women were representing all sorts of games and sports, swimming, shooting, tennis, flying. There was nothing tawdry. Each company held aloft beautifully designed placards as it passed Stalin, who stood on top of Lenin's tomb. The dictator looked much like his pictures, with his heavy black mustache resembling the wings of a bird of prey. All day long and everywhere you heard the Internationale over and over and over again. Each band struck up as it approached the tomb and kept playing as it swung on. Always the stirring song from those coming up, those far away, overtones, undertones, thrilling, insistent, now loud in your ears, now dimly echoing in the distance, a rhythmic motif symbolizing the onward march of young Russia. End of chapter 35, part 2. Chapter 36 of Margaret Sanger by Margaret Sanger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 36. Faith is a Fine Invention. Quote, there is a great difference between traveling to see countries and to see people. Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Tovarish Blank wishes to see you, came a call from the hotel desk. For a moment I could not place the name and the face had changed so completely that I could but faintly trace a resemblance to the boy I had seen before. He reminded me I had known him in Seattle as one who had assisted in getting up birth control meetings. When the Wobblies were being arrested in the United States, he had hired out as a stoker on a boat and gradually made his way to Russia, where he thought he could help to usher in the new society. Here was one person who had not had the best of the bargain. He was shabbily dressed and looked dilapidated, evidently having seen hard times, and had a beaten expression in his eyes. Yet, disillusioned as he was, he had not come to complain. Since it was four in the afternoon, the lunch hour in Russia, I asked him to join me in the dining room, conducted like a large commons. The waiters seemed disgruntled, unhappy, inept, and knew very little about service. They glanced scornfully at the man who sat down beside me. The one lively note was the orchestra, which threw itself into marches and wild and spirited Caucasian or Slavic folk dances while we ate. My guest said this was the best meal he had had since leaving America. Why don't you come back? I asked. I couldn't get in. Would you, if you could? Just give me the chance. I suppose it was inevitable 
that in such a social upheaval many suffered. I called upon Dr. Peter Tutushkin, who had tried to attend our 1925 conference in New York, but had arrived too late. As was the case with most professional men of his years, he had been of the old aristocracy. He and his wife and two daughters, both physicians, had owned a beautiful home. Now the thousands of volumes of what had formerly comprised his fine medical and scientific library had been taken away, and he and his wife slept and ate in the room which had contained them. He was margined and rationed to the last degree, and I could feel his humiliation at having so little food that he could not offer us a cup of tea. While we were in Moscow, the Eddy party and the select six whom Louis Fisher was piloting crossed our path. Fisher, a Russian living in Moscow and writing for the nation, published in the United States, invited Grant and me to go along with them to meet the secretary of the Commissariat of Public Health, Dr. Kaminsky. We went up a wide open stairway, like that of a courthouse, and into a spacious room with high windows running from floor to ceiling in French fashion, and a huge banquet table laden with the invariable afternoon tea. Dr. Kaminsky addressed us. Our worst heritage from the old regime was in the field of medicine. The main task before us is to unite science and practice. Our medicine is a form of social insurance, our medical policy based on prevention. We are not interested in profit, only service. The Russians had been kind and had grasped very quickly any improvement suggested to them, even accepting criticism with great tolerance. Aware of this, when Dr. Kaminsky paused for questions, Grant inquired about doctors entering private practice. As Russia builds up public health work, was the answer, more doctors will be able to find room for private practice if they so desire. Sherwood Eddy slipped me a note. Here's your opportunity to bring up birth control. I took my cue. Has Russia a population policy? Has she formulated any program for the rate of increase of her people? The audience stirred as though I had hurled a grenade. The interpreter leapt to his feet and shrieked, Malthusianism! We will not have Malthusianism here. We do not need it. Do you think or imply that Soviet Russia has to advance Malthusian ideas? We can have all the children we want, and Russia can do with twice the population she now has. He went on and on. After waiting a few moments for the air to clear, I continued. I have asked Dr. Kaminsky a simple question, which I shall repeat. I said nothing about Malthusianism, but I should like to know whether Russia has a population policy. She has had five and even ten-year plans for agriculture and manufacture and everything she is making. But what has she done about the most important issue today, population, its growth and distribution? Fisher was whispering to Dr. Kaminsky, evidently telling him what I wanted to know. The doctor replied, If I understood correctly, you are asking if there is any policy from the biological or economic point of view. I am asking whether Russia, in planning her industries, has any plan also as to the eventual control of families. I know you have much freedom for women and a fine technique for abortions. To us, that is extremely significant because after a woman has been aborted, she returns to the same conditions and becomes pregnant again. 
400,000 abortions a year indicate women do not want to have so many children. In my opinion, it is a cruel method of dealing with the problem because abortion, no matter how well done, is a terrific nervous strain and an exhausting physical hardship. Dr. Kaminsky's answer was not encouraging. There is no question as to the increase of population. There is no policy as to the question of biological restrictions. On the contrary, there is a policy of increasing the population. For six years, we have had a great shortage, not only of skilled workers, but of labor in general. Obviously, I was not a particularly welcome visitor. By chance, I was fortunate enough to encounter again Dr. Marte Rubin Wolf, who with her husband and children had escaped from Nazi Germany and was then at the head of a Moscow abortorium. Because of her wide experience in Germany, where clinics had been under municipal guidance, she was one of the few communists who was sane on the subject of population. She very kindly helped me with some of my interviews. Any woman in Russia who requested it was entitled to abortion on application to a doctor. She was told of the dangers, warned it might result in sterility, charged about two dollars and a half. We talked to about 50 patients who had already been there three days. None had temperatures. They were very jolly and going home that afternoon to rest for another week or two. Then they would go back to work with no deduction in wages. Though some of these women had had five abortions in two years and one had had eight, they could not sing too highly the praises of their country for allowing the operations. When I asked whether they would not prefer to have some information as to how to avoid further ones by protecting themselves from pregnancy, each and all replied, We have no such thing. We hear of it, but we have nothing. Russia is too poor. We hope she will soon get it. In only one place did I see a clinic in the sense that we use the word here, and that was in Moscow, where Dr. Kabanova had sixty women the afternoon we viewed it. Great credit is also due Madame Lebedova, who organized the original establishment of the Institutes for the Protection of Motherhood and Childhood, laid down the principles to be followed, and persisted until they had been embodied in a definite program. Dr. Abram B. Jens, assistant director, was in charge of contraceptive supplies and the administration of birth control such as it was. He was antagonistic, disagreeable, unpleasant, shouting Malthusianism into my ears more times in one hour than I had heard it before in twenty years. The methods in the Moscow clinic were antiquated, and I suggested sending a physician to instruct them, but my proposal was not acceptable. I considered Russia's situation very serious. Her population was a matter of mathematics. It had increased some fifty million since the downfall of the empire. Unless she looked ahead and educated her people in the problems which arose out of population, within two generations she would find herself with the same differential birth rate than existing in England and the United States. It would, however, have much more tragic consequences, since it would lower the augmentation of the capable, skilled shock troops of industry the idealists and active, selfless workers, and would multiply from the bottom unskilled, ignorant, dull-witted workers, the superstitious element which even the greatest efforts of a Soviet dictatorship running at top speed could not pull up and out of their evolutional environment. I really began to see Russia under another guise after we stepped on the train from Moscow to Gorky 
the former Nizhny Novgorod. Around the big city hotels, vendors had been trying to dispose of soft, warm sables and gold-embroidered altar pieces, evidently reft from churches, asking good prices for them. But now the peasant woman offered tea cozies, wooden boxes, carved and painted, dolls, leather, brass, knick-knacks for the tourist, quite unlike anything obtainable elsewhere in Europe, and always, of course, Russian blouses. The side-wheel steamer Komunitska, small but comfortable, was waiting to carry us down the Volga to Stalingrad. Our party occupied practically all available cabins, but hundreds of Russians were jammed on the decks. At some points, the river was a mile wide as it slid between flat landscapes, limitless as far as the eye could reach. Often we overtook rafts of logs, some at least a quarter of a mile long, each bearing a diminutive house where the captain and his family lived. You could see the children scampering back and forth and the crew pushing it leisurely into the current. We were four days in transit, passing many villages and a few towns, Kazan, Samara, and Saratov. I do not remember the cities clearly. Some places are indelible in your mind. Others amount to very little. If you are searching for something and do not find it, the scene vanishes. At every stop, Men and women accompanied by children and baskets of belongings were collected in hundreds. They had come a week or more early to make sure of catching the boat, spending the nights on the ground, subsisting on a loaf of bread, a tomato, or a cucumber. Their children were taken care of in the station creche, bathed, dressed in fresh clothing, taught, directed in play, delivered to the parents just before the Komuniska landed. Then came the mad scramble. It was like the old days on Ellis Island when the peasants from Europe arrived, thousands of them carrying huge bundles on their head, shoving and rushing and jabbering in strange tongues, attempting to squeeze in. You wondered how so many people could ever get on board. They had no comforts, no room to sleep such as we. They appeared stark and hungry, while we had marvelous food, in fact, too much of it. Any American planning to lose weight in Russia was badly disappointed. Stalingrad, near the mouth of the Volga, was Russia's greatest industrial city. Here I saw a hotel which was going up in front and falling down behind with about equal rapidity. The building material was lying in the streets. In the one in which we lodged, we had to dodge spigots. Plumbing had been laid on all over the country, but the stream from any tap never by any chance landed where it was intended to. You approached cautiously not knowing whether it would get you in the eye, in the nose, or shoot over your shoulder and hit your suitcase. The bathroom had no lock, and the attendant insisted it was his job to help patrons take a bath. I pushed on one side of the door, he on the other. I won. At Stalingrad, as everywhere I had been before, I was looking for Russian contraceptive methods but having been discouraged both by Dr. Kaminsky and Dr. Jens, I went at it rather carefully. When I visited the impressive new hospital, I asked the superintendent, who was a gynecologist and spoke good English, whether he gave contraceptive advice. I do not, but we have a department of consultation. May I see it? I had already surveyed about fifteen such, where I had found nothing save exhibits on the wall. It's just across the road. Will you go with me? I asked. Elsewhere, it's been hard to get information. He agreed readily. 
As we entered, an attendant was displaying lengthy diagrams to some tourists being shepherded through, and telling them birth control was taught in hospitals throughout Russia. Someone I knew came up to me. This is wonderful, Mrs. Sanger. The people are being taught birth control by the government. The posters were there to prove this, but the consultation room itself was locked. Who is in charge here? demanded the superintendent. I've been sending patients over. Who takes care of them? I do sometimes, a woman assistant volunteered. She led us into the room. There were the same cases I had seen everywhere, probably untouched since 1925, the articles within moldy and cracked. What do you use? I asked. We have nothing. We've asked and asked Moscow, but we get nothing. The superintendent was much embarrassed. He inquired how long it had been since supplies had come. Two years. Why? We don't know. Well, what about the patients I send over here? We just tell them to go home and wait. We have nothing for them. From Stalingrad, we took the train to Ordzanikitsa, the beginning of the Georgian military highway through the Caucasus to Tiflis. After the usual breakfast of Russian tea, black bread, and fresh caviar, which I found delicious, we climbed into four open-topped sharabanks, filling them to capacity. Enormous trucks came behind with our luggage. For about two hours we rolled along by the side of the river Terek, which was running dark and going so fast that the only thing I could think of was the streams from Swiss glaciers. But instead of being ice green, this was muddy, splashing up on the road. The guides told us there had been a two-day torrential rain, the worst the Caucasus had ever known. About ten, we stopped to stretch our legs at a village. Groups of lusty mountaineers stared at us, grinning good-humoredly, as though we were as odd as any freaks in a circus. They gave us cheese and bread. Some of us bought wine and tea, not knowing when we might leave. After three hours, we were still at the village, and finally men with great high hats and military-looking, astrakhan capes rode up on horseback and spoke to our guides who not being georgian had difficulty divining what they were trying to say our cars could not pass we thought it was just like the russians to fuss about a few little obstacles and said there must be some way to get through off we went and our drivers were magnificent with the stubbornness of tractors, we plunged across streams and over rocks. When trees blocked the road, they lifted the trunks, branches and all. We drove on and on, slowly, and at last, towards five o'clock, came to a spot where there was nothing before us, nothing but the mountainside sheer to the swirling water. Out clambered the eighty tourists, youthful and aged, tall and short, thin and fat. We could see the road begin about a quarter of a mile beyond, a sultry sun smiling on the peaks of the mountains. The river was still rising. One of our guides waded in to test whether we could ford it, and was soon practically up to his middle in the turbid flood. Grant began ferrying old ladies over the deep places, and a couple of boys carried the 210-pound Professor Ross. The current was terrific, and people kept falling. After nearly three hours, everybody was across. Our leader found a horse, galloped off to secure new buses, which arrived and took us to the town where we were supposed to have lunch but it was now dark, and lunch became supper. More conversations, more consultations, more delay, more mystery. Why did we not start? 
The answer was that three strange men were sitting in one of our cars, Russians, who wanted to get to Typhlus. They were going to have their rights. When pleading, arguing, reasoning could not move them, the GPU had to be invoked. Still, no results. Not until they had been promised that a bus would leave immediately did they descend and make room for the three of our group whose seats they had usurped. We rattled off again, only to be turned back. Another long halt and more conversation. Ultimately, since buses had been dispatched from Typhlus to meet us and were waiting about six miles away, it was decided to push on. Then began the real drive through Godar Pass, up and over rocks and embankments, roots of trees, sand and water, precarious detours in a night as jet as any I have ever seen. The militia had been ordered by Moscow to keep the route open. Green skyrockets for us to come ahead, red ones to stop, and swinging lanterns in front of the worst danger spots, great drops down into ravines. At last we reached the end and mounted a new set of buses, but only three of them. Grant was among those who stayed behind. We arrived at Typhlus at two in the morning. Dinner was ready as well as clean beds, and we slept until the humid sun stirred us out for breakfast just as the rest came straggling in. It was Sunday morning. Lining the steps of the old Georgian cathedral were beggar women, lame, blind, filthy. Never had I seen any others in Russia. Children were curiously looking on at the mass, but we were told parents were forbidden to make them go to church. The few elderly women attending were carrying flowers, and had twined them also around the frames of the saints' pictures. We tourists presented an incongruous contrast to the priests with their long beards and splendid robes. Typhlus had slipped the yoke of Moscow. Here, among the mosques and the camels and the bazaars, which gave it a definitely oriental tinge, we finally saw signs of private enterprise. Back in the mountains were tribes the Soviet were trying to civilize, warlike, uncultured, barbaric. Stalin, sentimental for the country of his origin, perhaps, was choosing as many Georgians as he could for high places and sending in teachers and moving pictures to educate the others, but the task was Herculean. It was hot, torrid noon, when we arrived at Batum on the Black Sea. The sun was pouring down. We wanted to go swimming to cool off, and were directed to a stony beach. The water was darkened by the heavy, rich deposit which coated the bottom, and the sand of the same color was strewn with masses of people just like Coney Island, thousands of them on the seaweed-covered rocks. It did not look pleasant, and we walked further. A partition of slats, through which there was perfect visibility, was supposed to divide the women from the men. But despite having heard so much about the nude bathing there, we discovered everyone had on suits, astounding old-fashioned garments. Mrs. Clyde declined to go in, but sat watching in her hat and glasses. Tanya kept on pink panties and a brassiere. The rest of us determined to throw off our inhibitions. Once you did this, you were freed from them for the time being. It was the doing that was so hard. Most surprising were the New England schoolteachers, who had certainly never before removed their clothes in public. They dashed their long, lean bodies boldly into the water as though to say, Russia, here we come. The steamer on which we left Batum was dirty, loaded with passengers who had to be stepped over as they slept on deck. 
If you left your stateroom, even a few moments, somebody grabbed it and took your bed. But the scenery of the Russian Riviera was very lovely. The spurs of the Caucasus along the coast glittered with marble palaces. I shall always remember the mighty sable cypress trees, slender columns silhouetted against the creamy white walls. They were not funereal to me, but more like sentinels. Only the chosen of the chosen, the executives and the intelligentsia, could stay at Yalta for holidays. Many individuals, Agnes Smedley for one, had reason to be grateful to the Soviet for their rest periods. Although not a communist, she had written sympathetic articles, and the Russian Health Department, hearing she was ill in China, had sent her an invitation to come and recuperate, and here she had stayed a year without cost, recovering from a strained heart. I spent a day in the majestic Byzantine summer palace of Nicholas II at nearby Lavadia. It was perfectly landscaped with statues, fountains, terraces. As we drove up, multitudinous shaved heads popped out open windows. In the marvelous ballroom were a hundred and fifty enamel cots, side by side, the sleeping quarters of the men on vacation. We saw the room belonging to the former Tsarina, with fragile, brocaded walls and delicate panels. In the center of the parquet floor, bare of any covering, stood a deal table with checked gingham cloth. Now and then you caught a glimpse of people in the palace, but mostly they were reclining in the gardens. As we wandered round and round, we came upon a cluster of twenty-five asleep, pale, and not too well fed. They did not twitch an eyelid as we approached. I asked Tanya, who are these? Touching one of them on the shoulder, she said, Tovarish. These Tovarishes want to know who you are. At that, not only he, but all of them jumped to their feet as though at military drill. One after the other gave his name, each with a vich or a ski on the end of it, stating also his occupation. As he finished, he turned his head to the next, who took up the recital. The little women with bobbed black hair and a curious bodice of blue proudly said she wore the cross of Lenin on her dress because with him she had fought for Russia. This was the highest honor any woman in Russia could be paid. Only a hundred had it. Then the first man bowed politely to Tanya and with dignity said something to her. She interpreted to us, they want to know who you are. Tell them we're Americans. North Americans? With great enthusiasm. Yes. Then question after question spattered like a machine gun. Are you from Seattle? Portland? How did you get here? What way did you come? How long did it take you? How much did it cost? What has happened to Dillinger? What's the latest news of the seamen strike on the Pacific coast? How soon comes the revolution? We were rather dazed at the degree of current information they had gleaned, chiefly from posters in the parks. Their bombardment continued. Do women in America have as much freedom as men? We all disagreed on that. Can married women work for the government? Can they teach school? Some of us answered, no, others, yes. On every inquiry of theirs we were divided, but on whatever we asked them, they were united. Who is your favorite American author? I answered, I like Sinclair Lewis. The woman looked at me accusingly. Not Theodore Dreiser? Oh, yes, I agreed. He's good. A man suggested, not Upton Sinclair? 
they were apparently sadly disappointed in us. At last one of them, making a sweeping gesture, said to me, Your American government has never built anything like this for its workers, has it? No, I replied. We never had a czar, which was very tactless of me. He answered something to the effect, You people have opinions, but no convictions. We have been to prison for hours. Tanya volunteered, pointing to me. This lady has been to prison eight times for hers. Astonishment was registered, and one man spoke hurriedly to Tanya, who translated, He wants to know who you are. Shall I tell him? She then explained I was advocating birth control. Well, we have that. Haven't you visited any of our hospitals? Thousands of women have it. No, that's abortion. We don't want that. Birth control is different. The conversation had shifted to something concrete and real. We had struck up an entente that was very cordial. The group gathered closer. Come on, come on, this is important. They had never heard of contraception. How could anyone have put me in jail for that? What a crazy government, worse than they had thought. The woman said, We need you over here. Come and work with us. Don't waste your life in America. From the impatient bus came horns, whistles, bells, summoning us away. The whole twenty-five followed us to the share banks, waving farewell. Tanya was a most discerning little person, ordinarily impassive, but springing up animatedly the moment music started. One of our party invited her, Come on to America. You'll have pretty clothes, and for anyone who can dance like you, fame is waiting. Pretty clothes? I have two dresses, which answer their purpose. And as for fame, this is my people. I enjoy dancing, and they enjoy me. Why should I go to America? Before I left, I wanted to do something for her, give her some sort of gift in return for her many services. She was going to be married, and because her mother was old-fashioned, have a registered ceremony, call in all her friends, and even don special raiment. I had some new stockings with me and presented them to her. She looked at them, handled them as though treasuring some lovely thing she longed for but could not possess. I wouldn't dare wear them. I would be ashamed because my friends could not have the same. Tanya was willing to go without until silk stockings were to be had by all. It was necessary to grasp this attitude to understand Sovietism. It gave you slight personal freedom, and you had to ask yourself honestly whether exploitation by government or by individual was basically different. But what you did have was security for your old age and the hope that when the rewards came, you would have your share. The Russians were a mass of contradictions. One moment I was irritated enough to tear them limb from limb, the next prostrate before their sincerity and zeal. The more than 150 races and 45 languages made for problems that challenged man's intelligence. Perhaps no other nation had had a lower order of serfdom to arouse from lethargy and put to work on a new civilization. Nothing but admiration could be accorded their attempts and achievements but most of the time they were entranced by their own drug of idealism. They had swallowed so much of it that they were self-hypnotized and bumped into reality without understanding it. Like the Spanish, it was enough for them to say, it will be, without taking sufficient thought as to how to bring it about. At Odessa, we boarded what then seemed to us, by contrast, the most beautiful ship in the world, the Italian liner Campidoglio, 
entering into another domain. A neat white cloth was spread for you, yourself. No longer did you have a soiled napkin folded for indefinite use. Spotless coats adorned the waiters. Our chairs were pulled out. Everybody had a proper bed and cabin. It was only a simple ship, but it signified Western refinement, and I must say I welcomed it. No matter how much proletarian sympathy you might have, you appreciated clean tables, dishes, sheets, towels, and a bathroom that worked. In order to hurry back to school, Grant separated from me in Romania, and my husband joined me in Naples to go to Mariambad. I had barely reached there when Grant cabled that Stuart was ill again. I left for home the same day. On arrival, I found the doctors contemplating a radical operation, but I refused to let him have another. As an alternative, Tucson, Arizona was suggested for its dry, warm climate. His wound was still unhealed when we started. Being stowed away in Stuart's small Ford coupe, for days on end, gave us the best possible opportunity to catch up in our talks and experiences and place trivial and unimportant events in the pockets of memory where they belonged. The joy of thus familiarizing myself with my grown-up son made me envy mothers who had leisure to grow along with their children, or at least to watch them develop. But it is possible we are all the better friends in adult life. At least we adhere to the rights of individuality for ourselves and for each other. It was nearing the close of October when one bright morning we left El Paso and came across miles and miles of brown and yellow desert up to the hills and mountains. Through the heat waves we saw mirages. We were positive they were lakes. Arizona was so unlike any place I had ever been before. You either had to be enthralled by it or hate and dread it. Not being quick to come to conclusions, I was not at first sure. But I knew there was a delight in the cool nights and the translucent sunny days with a lovely tang in the air. In the beginning, it was the people who won me particularly Mrs. Robert P. Bass, daughter of Mrs. Charles Sumner Bird, one of our early pioneers. We stayed with her for a short time and then took a pink adobe house out where the desert met the foothills. Stuart grew better. In the spring, we packed our bags once more in the little car and drove away looking back regretfully at the indescribable Catalinas on which light and clouds played in never-ending change of pattern. End of chapter 36